What's up guys Chaos Shinobi here. This is what if Naruto has 7 godly bloodlines. Summary, Orochimaru kidnaps Naruto shortly after he's born and puts him into a bloodline experiment program? What if, in an attempt to make a perfect soldier and future body with a near indestructible body, amazing sensory abilities, and mastery over all 5 elements he manages to give Naruto 7 different bloodlines. Chapter 1, Hiruzen Sarutobi, the son Daime, 3rd, Hokage of Konoha was absolutely disgusted by what he had seen so far today. Just one hour ago he and two contingents of Anbu began a raid of what was supposedly an illegal lab of one of his former students, Orochimaru of the Sanin, supposedly because the info had been given to him by Donzo, who he no longer fully trusted. At first he hadn't wanted to believe that his former student was once again doing something as atrocious as kidnapping civilians of Konoha and experimenting on them. But just the first 10 minutes of searching through this hellhole called a lab was enough to ruin those hopes. So far they had seen people who had been tortured, mutilated, and experimented on in the most horrible ways. Some have been cut to pieces on lab tables, obviously having been dissected for reasons they have not yet looked into. Others were still alive but were mangled beyond recognition and either pleaded for the release death would give them or were so mentally unstable they had to be killed for their own good and for the safety of others. So far the only living and sane people they'd run across had been the doctors and lab workers who did the research in the lab, if you could call people who willingly experimented on others sane, and they had been either captured or killed depending on their threat level. They had also seen body parts of both people and animals floating in jars, torture devices running with both fresh and dried blood, and mutilated dead animals. There was no way Hiruzen could or would justify the horrors and atrocities committed here by the hand and direction of his former student, he couldn't believe how far down the dark path Orochimaru had walked, and admittedly some small part of him still didn't want to. He stopped in front of yet another cell door and picked up the folder sitting in front of it, he had quickly learned to read whatever notes there were in front of each person's, experiment slash prisoners, door in order to get an understanding of their mental stability. To his surprise there were two folders this time, which meant two subjects in the same room. Hopefully that also meant they were stable enough to be saved, since unfortunately they hadn't found anyone like that yet. Opening the first file he was shocked to see that this subject's file was written mostly by Orochimaru's hand himself rather than one of his people's. The file was simply titled Subject Number 23, with the date stating when something was done to him and what was done, he began to read it aloud for the benefit of the Anbu with him. October 12th. 701. The subject has been injected with the Shikatsumyaku bloodline limit I obtained from a two-year-old, the first to show signs of this rare bloodline limit in years, I wanted to kidnap the child but he was too well guarded and I barely managed to obtain his genes, I will keep an eye on him just in case though. If the subject survives then when it combines with the regenerative abilities and high stamina levels of the Uzumaki bloodline the subject naturally has he will have a near indestructible body. All I can do now is wait and see if said regenerative powers are enough to keep the subject alive through the process. October 16th, 701. The subject shows signs of skeletal pain and muscles tears, but the damage recovers almost as soon as it appears, then repeats, causing subject extreme pain and distress, his regenerative abilities are even more astounding than I thought. October 24th, 701. The subject has finally completely stabilized and already shows signs of the experiment having been a success in the fact that the subject's skin has paled to the point of almost being bone white, a common trait in people bearing this bloodline. Will be given three days to fully recover and will then be injected with the Jintan bloodline obtained by capturing a user of this bloodline. I originally planned on killing him after obtaining his genes, but I have now decided to keep him if subject survives. I will force him to train number 23 when he is old enough after telling him exactly how the boy came about having this bloodline, the hot-headedness he has shown since his capture so far will most likely cause him to have an amusing reaction to this news. November 9th, 701. The subject continues to have random and painful muscle spasms and slight retinal problems despite it being nearly two weeks since injected with bloodline, but other than that no problems worth mentioning. November 11th, 701. The subject seems to be having no more problems, whether this one was a success or not will have to wait until the subject is old enough to begin training, so either 3 or 4 years of age. The subject will now be injected with the Hyotan bloodline obtained by capturing a Yuki. Once again I will keep her only if subject survives and she will be forced to train him after telling her exactly how he came about having this bloodline, her expression will most likely be most pleasing. November 17th? 701. The subject has now had fever-like signs for four days in a row, he is displaying all signs of fever yet his skin is cool, almost cold to the touch, it is unknown if subject will survive this without permanent damage even with his extreme regenerative abilities. November 30th, 701. Subject has finally fully recovered from chronic problems, luckily with no permanent damage. 
he shows no physical sign of having developed the bloodline unlike when given the Kaguya bloodline, but doctors sometimes find liquids frosted over slightly while around the subject so it is most likely a success. He will now be injected with the Yotan bloodline. I was unable to capture the person I got the genes from but I have many scrolls on the bloodline so number 23 will just have to learn it on his own. December 10th, 701. The subject shows signs of extreme fever with skin so hot it almost burns when touched. He has also lost all hair and is coughing as though he has lung troubles, definitely the most violent reaction to an introduced bloodline yet, it will be most annoying as he dies now after all the recourses I have already put into him, but that's where all the signs are leading. Jan 5, 702. The subject has thankfully fully recovered from all signs of illness, including his hair growing back, though even I was surprised when it grew back not as just the bright blonde it was originally but is now blonde with red mixed in, almost alternating in which hair is which color. This leads me to believe that the experiment was a success since the girl I got the genes from had red hair. He will now be injected with the Makutan bloodline using the Shah Dimes genes. Hopefully he will do better than the 60 I gave it to all those years ago that died. At that part one of the Anbu present, a male with the mask of a cat with markings, twitched slightly. An if you know who that is already, good on you. Jan 15, 702. The subject is showing no signs whatsoever of negative or positive reactions to this gene. Is his body rejecting it or does being a distant cousin of the Senju clan somehow make it easier for him to gain this bloodline? I will have different plants set up around him and see if there is any kind of change to or reaction from the plants as I make number 23 go through different positive and negative emotions. Gen 16, 702. Success, after putting the subject through extreme emotional distress the plants began moving as though searching for the source of his distress. I will now inject him with a Rantan bloodline giving him bloodlines that allow him to have affinities for all five elements, making him an invaluable tool and possible vessel once I perfect that jutsu. I was unfortunately unable to risk capturing a user of this bloodline as Kumo is very protective of their village's few bloodlines. Luckily they are nowhere near as protective of their bloodline scrolls and I was able to copy down everything related to this bloodline. Jan 31, 703 The subject has fully recovered from all problems caused by developing this bloodline. Once again with no physical changes, I will have to wait and see whether he has developed this bloodline or not. This will most likely be the last bloodline I give him seeing as he now has a strong body and control over all five elements. All I need to do now is hand him over to the head scientist for the next two or three years before his training and education can begin under the tutelage of my two prisoners and various other people. After that for a year and a half was nothing more than basic checkups of his health and development in another handwriting, most likely by this mentioned head doctor. So Hiruzen decided to skip over those and read only the comments made by Orochimaru himself. June 10th, 703. I noticed in my routine checkup of subject number 23 that he has become rebellious and resentful over the regular tests run on him so I terrified him into obedience, and gave orders for my men to do the same to him if he starts acting up again. October 10th, 704. The subject is now 3 years old so I have taught him cage bunshine no jutsu, which he is already able to produce 70 of with little strain in order to make his training faster and easier. I now have people tutoring him in tactics, logic, history, stealth, politics, practical things, how to cook, nutrition, how to clean, reading, obviously, writing, math, a slash n stuff you learn in kindergarten through the end of high school, and many other things and he is showing amazing progress, absorbing everything taught to him like a sponge. I will now have him taught how to meditate. When he turns 4 I will have him taught basic and advanced chakra control along with lessons on human and animal anatomy, basic weapons and physical training on top of everything else he was started being taught at the age of 3. The only complaint I have is that the subject continues to show signs of extreme rebellion and practically has to be forced or scared into doing or learning anything other than the basic necessities needed to take care of himself. October 10th, 706. The subject is now 5 years old and is certifiably a genius. He has reached Joni level in chakra control despite his already high reserves and can hit any target he's told to hit no matter how far or close or weirdly angled with perfect accuracy, and has memorized everything else taught to him. I will now add lessons on it about his bloodline limits, along with the basics of Nin, Tai, Buki, Gen, Fun, Chakra Flow, Bunshine, Ken, Irio, Medic, and Shuriken Jutus, as well as lessons and use of basic to advanced elemental manipulation starting with the five basic elements and then with his sub-elements. To do that I have introduced him to my two prisoners and their reactions were as amusing and pleasing as expected, hopefully from now on threats to his teachers will help encourage him to keep working since I do not want to physically punish him and waste time waiting for him to recover. I will once again leave him to the head doctor to watch in order to check on the progress of my other bases. Sept 4, 
707. The Kaguya I'd been keeping an eye on has now become the last of his people and my loyal servant in the same day. At age 9 the child already shows great talent in the use of his bloodline and while I am having him study it further I am at the same time having him teach number 23 everything he knows and can do with it. Number 23 does not seem to like Kimimaro as much as he likes my prisoners, despite the fact they are in the same boat. Kimimaro doesn't seem to like number 23 much either, but as long they tolerate each other and Kimimaro teaches him well I do not care. October 10th, 708. At just 7 years old the subject is at least mid tuning level in everything except Genjutsu, which he has no talent in whatsoever, despite his near perfect chakra control. Number 23 still shows signs of rebellion but not as openly due to threat to his two teachers, same could be said for the two teachers. When it comes to his bloodline limits he is excelling in Shikatsu Myaku, Hyotan, and Jintan and is only doing relatively well in the rest, which is understandable since he is teachers for the first three and only scrolls for the others. Gen 2, 709 I have made an amazing discovery. A one-year-old child that shows signs of having the supposedly extinct Dojutsu Mamagan. I had planned on taking the child for myself since he was born to some lowly civilians but then learned he had an extremely weak body so I took his genes instead, and after month of researching it I have not only confirmed the fact he has an unknown dojutsu but also isolated and eliminated the gene that caused the weak body. The momigan is rumored to be a penetrating vision, disrupting eye-based bloodline limit, with a unique chakra particle extension. The user has the ability to use their vision abilities to penetrate walls and perform genjutsu that can fool even the byakugan. This ability does not appear to have the range of the Byakugan, but it actually has the ability to counter that Huga trait. The user's vision also lets them locate and track others by sensing chakra, picking up chakra from long distances, and noticing changes in an individual's chakra. It is also able to sense how many individuals are present. The user's vision has heightened perception and analytical powers not unlike the Sharingan meaning they can comprehend any details they see to predict the opponent's next move. One can also see one's life force and even transfer part of one's own life force to another, at the cost of said person's life force. These may all be rumors and speculation but if even part of these rumors are true I must have someone with it, and if I cannot kidnap the child myself I will give it to subject number 23 to make him a perfect human being as the only weaknesses he has now are genjutsu and a lack of sensory abilities. I just hope that I do not kill such a valuable resource by giving him another bloodline limit at this age. March 1st, 709. The subject took a little under two months to fully recover from being giving the mom again, though he did have a couple of very near-death experiences as his body adapted to the new bloodline. I am already testing all of the rumored abilities except the one about giving one's own life forces I do not know whether or not it gives all of the person's life force or whether they choose how much life force to give, and I do not wish to lose such a valuable asset for such a useless ability. I also discovered that when one is using this dojutsu one's eyes glows red, which was not in any of the books, mostly pointless knowledge, but still interesting. October 10th, 709. The subject is now 8 years old and has slowed in improvement in all categories, which is understandable since all people are limited in growth until they hit puberty, so until he does I will continue his lessons at the level they are now and have my head scientists see whether we can put number 23's genes into unborn animals to change their chakra coils closer to that of a human's. December 13, 709. Subject has made little progress in anything but few in jutsu, which he seems to be very good at but continues to be rebellious, I'm guessing my prisoners made that worse by telling him he'd most likely been kidnapped away from a loving home and brought here to be experimented on, which I didn't, since he was an orphan, not that it really matters to me either way, and that they were being held here against their will. On another note, the head doctor's progress with trying to put number 23's genes into unborn animals has shown no progress. This time we will try dogs and use the sperm of an Inusuka hound we managed to temporarily separate from its partner and knock out. Hopefully using the genes of an animal that is regularly exposed to and sometimes uses chakra will make the difference we need for success, as this will be the last attempt we make either way. March 21, 710. Success. The mother died from a weakened body one week after giving birth to her pups but she did give birth to three healthy, so far, pups, two males and a female. Since his genes are in them and the bitch is dead we gave them to number 23 to raise them with more than enough books to study so he knows what to do. He's even already given them names, despite the fact that I personally told him they have a low chance of surviving. Foolish boy. He named the female Kimi, Noble, one of the males June, Obedient, and the final one Ryu, meaning Dragon, not the other meaning which is Imperial. They seem to connect on an almost instinctual level, perhaps they smell him in their own sense? I will need to observe this further before deciding. 
From now on I will keep a separate file for observations on the dogs and their interactions with number 23. Hiruzen paused for a second to look at the other file and say well, I guess that means we only have one person in there to save, one human anyway. He then went back to reading the parts of the file written by Orochimar out loud. July 18th, 710. All three of the pups somehow survived their first four months intact, and already show signs of having different chakra signatures from other hounds, even Inusuka hounds, if only slightly. My observation about them having some sort of unusual connection with number 23 also seems to have be right, but I cannot figure out what it is and the child doesn't explain it well, almost as though he doesn't understand it himself, or is trying to keep it from me, but I think I scared him enough that he wasn't lying to me. August 23rd, 710. Kimi Maro has begun to show signs of an unknown, blood-related disease. I must personally take him to a more medic-friendly base to be cared for, as he is my most loyal servant and is likely to be my first or second vessel after I perfect that jutsu. I am having the head medic perform a complete blood test on number 23 in hopes that he did not get this disease when I gave him Kimi Maro's genes. It is at times like these I wish I had a medic at the level of my former teammate Tsunade Senju, I have some who were close but none who show even the potential of being as good. It will take me at least four months before I return and when I do I better have a positive yes or no about whether or not number 23 has the same disease or not, or heads will roll. All notes after that are once again most likely by the head doctor, the last one mentioning that this mysterious number 23 definitely did not have even a chance of contracting the same disease. Putting number 23's file down and picking up the pups he quickly read through what little there was about them himself and once finished said aloud the pups are stable too and only show signs of aggression to the head scientist and Orochimaru himself, but at the same time only show loyalty to this number 23 and to a lesser extent these mysterious two prisoners. Hiruzen stepped forward in order to open the door only to be intercepted by one of his Anbu. This particular Anbu had the mask of a dog and gravity-defying silver hair that showed despite the fact he was wearing his hood. Hokage-sama please allow me to enter first since I'm usually good with hounds, Inu said. Ah Inu, that is most likely a good idea. Stable or not one can never be too careful, go ahead. At Hiruzen's words Zenu nodded and turned to open the door. He opened it cautiously to make sure no traps were set, and after checking to make sure looked inside just as cautiously. Having not been attacked Inu looked at Hiruzen, who nodded permission to his unvoiced question, and after having received permission turned on the room's lights to see better, despite the fact it would likely wake the room's occupants. As the Hokage and Anbu filed into the room there was one irritated grunt and three whines from the only bed in the room. Waiting for them to wake up the people who just entered looked around the room, not that there was much to see. The room was basically a prison cell since it was both a bedroom and bathroom in one, and the only furniture aside from the bed, toilet, and sink was a small dresser for clothes and a bookshelf filled with books, and clothes hampers for dirty clothes if you can count those as furniture. Just as they finished their observation of the room there was movement at the bed, drawing their attention back to it just as a young dog burrowed its way out of the blanket it was buried in. It was soon followed by two more. As soon as all three hounds pulled themselves out, their attention was instantly drawn to the other people in the room, who carried a strong scent of fresh blood, making them growl fiercely at the strangers. Said growling had the room's last occupant popping out of bed so fast he actually threw the pups off it. He quickly and carefully looked around the room searching for the source of his companion's growls, eyes quickly locking onto the large group of people in the room, some of which were covered in blood and widened in fear. His were not the only eyes in the room that widened, though not for the same reason as the boy. Having their first good look at the mysterious subject number 23 everyone in the room, save the dogs, looked him over, and were shocked by what they saw. If you want to know what he dresses like imagine Kimi Maro's outfit, then turn the cloth black and switch the rope belt with an orange sash, bone white skin, they already expected that, spiky hair that was almost as red as it was blonde, check baby blue eyes that practically popped out of his face due to his pale skin, new, height of about 3 feet 6 inches, tall for his age but not by much, 3 whisker-like marks on his cheeks. Wait a minute, 3 whisker-like marks on his cheeks, now where did they remember seeing that before? They put all of his appearance together, pale skin, not familiar, tall for his age, check, spiky blonde and red hair, check, baby blue eyes, check, 3 whisker-like marks on each cheek, che. It came to them, the boy standing in front of them looking terrified was none other than Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze, son of their late Yondaime Hokage, Minato Namikaze, and the red hot blooded habanero, Kushina Uzumaki, that mysteriously went missing the day after his birth with no trail to follow other than the body of the Anbu had been assigned to watch over him found dead slightly outside the Anbu headquarters they'd been keeping him. 
He also happened to be the Jin Shuriki of the Kyubi no Yoko, leading to rather mixed feelings about his disappearance to say the least. Yet now, here he was, standing in front of them looking perfectly healthy, if pale, and also looking terrified out of his mind about having a bunch of people, most of which were wearing masks, some of which covered in blood, standing in his little room that was more like a prison cell. The first one to break out of his shock and fear-induced paralysis was none other than Naruto himself, who are you, and what do you want with me, Naruto tried to demand, but it came out sounding like a fearful question instead, despite the fact his hounds had picked themselves up and added their growls at the end of his sentence. The question and growls did have the affect of breaking three of the other group's members out of their shock but none replied to it right away as they got caught up in their own thoughts right afterwards. Minato-kun, it seems like I didn't fail you quite as horribly as I thought, though Naruto is probably traumatized from everything that has been done to him in this place, it is still better than being dead or one of Donzo's mindless weapons, I promise I will do my best to help him from now on. I also have to make sure to send a message to Jiraiya telling him he can finally stop his search for the boy, were Hiruzen's first thoughts on the matter. Minato-sensei, it seems that miracles do happen. Your son, who I thought dead, is alive, although likely traumatized, he's alive, and any other problem can be fixed with time and care, and I promise to dedicate as much of both as I can as a member of Anbu, thought one Kakashi Hitake. The boy who apparently has the same ability as me is none other than Yondame Sama's son and the Jinchuriki of the Kyubi. I hope Hokage Sama gives me permission to teach him, thought one Tenzo, or Yamato as we all know him. Well, asked the boy again this time with louder growls from his companions. Once again the sound of his voice broke them out of their thoughts and this time one of them did speak, just not what Naruto wanted them to say. Naruto, Hiruzen asked, trying to keep the hope out of his voice and not entirely succeeding. How do you know my name? Almost nobody knows my name and the only people who actually call me by it are Sahyoji-san and Yuyo boss san asked the now wary Naruto meanwhile adding and of course Kimi, Jun, Ryu, and Kurama, but nobody needs to know that part other than me in his head. I'm guessing those two are the prisoners mentioned in Orochimaru's notes? Getting a nod from Naruto, Hiruzen told him well the reason we know your name and call you by it is because we knew you as a baby before you were kidnapped, this news caused Naruto to stiffen. So you must be from Konoha then, if you really are then I might be able to trust you, but there's still an issue of why and how you knew me, and what you're going to do with me now that you've found me, Naruto said. Well to answer the first two questions I know you because I was friends with your parents before they passed away the day you were born, and as for what we're going to do with you the answer is obvious, we're going to take you back to Konoha of course, Hiruzen said in a calm manner. There's a high chance that I won't be welcomed or well received in Konoha though, Naruto said as though stating a fact, causing Hiruzen and the Anbu to stiffen once more. So you know about the Kyubi then, he stated rather than asked. Of course I know. Even if I hadn't been told as soon as I was old enough to understand it all the near-death experiences I've had are more than enough to force me have met him at least once, Naruto said with a snort, causing the group to stiffen even further at what he said. You've met it, Hiruzen said, sounding shocked. Of course I have, a Jinchuriki usually meets their tenant for the first time in a near-death experience, or through meditation, and I've had more than enough of Tbath for it to have happened, Naruto once again said with a snort, this time at their reactions. Snapping out of his shock Hiruzen told him. I'll be honest with you in the fact that you may have a problem with some of the civilians, but I more than made sure that my forces have a solid understanding of the difference between a kunai and the scroll it's sealed inside, so you should have no problem with them. What about Asahioji-san, Yuio Basan, Kimi, Jun, and Ryu? Naruto wanted to make sure the ones he considered his family were with him and treated well as well. Of course I'm more than willing to take them in and even add them to my forces if that's what they want. Why on earth is the Hokage himself leading this raid if you don't mind me asking, Naruto asked, having put two and two together from the way Hiruzen was speaking. Orochimaru was a student of mine before he began walking down the dark path he now is, and when I had a chance to end him I didn't take it, so I feel personally responsible for the fact that he is doing the things he is, Hiruzen admitted, hoping that showing honesty to the boy would help convince him to trust them. Hmm was all Naruto said, and after a couple of minutes he decided that the only way he was going to decide whether he trusted them or not was to use his dojutsu to see from their chakra what emotions they were feeling while talking to them. He noticed them jump a little when he activated it and his eyes started glowing red, but other than a subtle tensing they didn't do anything else, so he started examining them. Sarutobi's chakra was giving up sensations happiness and excitement, the dog masked Anbu's was pretty much the same, and the tiger masked Anbu's, while not as strong, were also the same. The other Anbu in the room were neutral, 
not really feeling any strong emotion toward him one way or another. After determining the emotions of the people in the room and deciding that the Hokage was being completely honest with him he relaxed and turned his dojutsu off. The pups, noticing this, relaxed as well. Alright then I'm guessing since you're going door to door that you've already raided the rest of the lab, he asked, getting a nod from Sarutobi, well I can tell you right now the only sane ones left in this place are the four of us, Asahi Oji-san, and Uyoba-san, so I might as well guide you straight to their cells and leave you to decide what to do with everyone else. And with that he jumped off his bed and walked up to them. I'm guessing that means you've accepted my offer, Hiruzen asked with a raised brow. As long as Asahi Oji-san and Uyoba-san accept I'll accept was all Naruto said in reply before, with the pups at heel, leaving the room and walking a short ways down one of the corridors they had yet to go down before stopping and waiting for them. Are, you coming, he asked somewhat impatiently, we want to get out of this hellhole, and I'm sure Asahi Oji-san and Yui Obasan want that just as much. At that Sarutobi and the Yanbu began following the boy who obviously knew where he was going, they went down three corridors before finally stopping in front of two doors that were side by side. Naruto then went on to knock hard on both doors while calling out Asahi Oji-san, Yui Obasan, it's Naruto, people from Konoha, including the Hokage himself, raided the lab and are willing to save us, they say we can join Konoha if we want so don't attack, okay. There was complete silence after Naruto finished pounding on the doors while they waited for the two to reply. Finally, after what seemed like hours but was really only a few minutes, a reply came from an obviously male voice Naruto this better not be some kind of trick or you will regret it, you hear me. I would never play a trick on either of you, especially not one of this kind, you know that, Naruto said, sounding hurt. Forgive him Naruto-kun, it's just that we've both been here for so long rescue sounds more like a dream than a reality, said a soft feminine voice from the other door. Yeah, kid, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have snapped at you like that, but it's exactly what Yui said, the male's voice, when not angry sounded gruff, but soft, an interesting combo, so are you going to let us out or what? Hiruzen looked at Inu and nodded, so Inu walked up to the doors and quickly unlocked both of them, letting them swing open on silent hinges. The two people that walked out looked at the group and observed them just as they were being observed. The man was tall, about 6 feet 1 inch, he had brown hair so light it was almost blonde, light brown eyes, naturally dark skin, though it was somewhat pale due to being without the sun for so long all in all a pretty average looking man. The woman, on the other hand, was a beauty, with long dark brown hair, dark brown eyes, and distinctly feminine features, though her breasts could be a little bigger, was the thought of all the men in the room except Asahi, who was stupid enough to say it rather than think it when he first met her and suffered from minor frostbite in all sorts of places for weeks afterward because of it. And Naruto, who was too young. So it looks like we're saved, so what now? Asahi asked. Now, I invite you all to join Konoha as ether ninjas, ninjas in training, or civilians, if you want to, Hiruzen told them. Asahi and Yui exchanged looks, then both looked down at Naruto, who, understanding the silent question, replied Kimi, Where you, June, and I go where you guys go, unless you split up, and then I don't know what I'd do, he finished a little sadly. The two once again exchanged looks, then nodded, having come to a decision. Yui kneeled down next to Naruto and hugged him while saying of course we're going to stay together, we're family now, there's no way we'd want to depart from you, or each other, even if Asahi and I argue sometimes, she told him in a gentle, compassionate voice, easing his worries away. Asahi stepped toward Sarutobi and held out his hand saying none of us has anywhere to go, so if you're offering us a home where we can live together and a choice of being ninja or not, we'd be more than happy to accept, on the condition that none of us, including the pups, are ever put under the CRA, Clan Restoration Act, look it up, or try to force us into similar decisions we don't want to make. Hiruzen smiled warmly at him and said I can promise that, he reached out and shook the man's hand and added, if you don't mind waiting here while we finish our raid on the lab, I'll be more than happy to personally escort you to Konoha. Of course we don't mind, we've been here for years already, what's an hour or so more of waiting going to do, Asahi said, then admitted and besides neither Yui nor I know how to get to Konoha, and Naruto while knowing geography and where it is, has never been outside of this place before, so both he and the pups would probably be a bit too overwhelmed to guide us there. Chapter 2, Return The raid of the rest of the lab actually took the rest of the night, between taking care of the rest of the experiments and prisoners, which, sadly, were all too insane or messed up to save, collecting all the files about all the prisoners, including Yui's and Asahi's, and all the experiments, including Naruto's and the pups and making their way through the security in the CPUs took much longer than they originally thought it would. 
The only thing they didn't take in that lab were some of the bodies, they burned the ones they didn't recognize and kept the ones they knew were from the village in special storage scrolls so they could be taken back and mourned, and the books and scrolls in Naruto's room, which he personally put into a storage scroll of his own, and then stored the scroll in a storage seal on his sash, saying that they were the only objects of importance he didn't want to lose. The only other thing they did in the lab was that Hiruzen and the Anbu took turns asking the group various questions both about the lab and the people and also about what they plan on doing and becoming when they went to the village. They were finally ready to leave the lab, walking out into dawn's light, though they forgot something important that was mentioned earlier until it was too late. It's too bright, it hurts my eyes, Naruto shouted in shock and pain the second the morning rays of light hit his face as he left the lab. The pups were also whimpering in shock and pain as they were hit by the rays at almost the same time Naruto was. Even Asahi and Yui were having a bad reaction to it, though to a lesser extent. Not good. If they're having this bad of a reaction to sunlight we will have to go very slow for at least the first half of the trip back to Konoha, and while the lab is only a four day run for shinobis, it's a nearly two week trip at a civilian's pace. While I would love to escort them back to Konoha myself, I cannot afford to be away for much longer. Ever since Minato died and I was reinstated, the civilian council has been trying to steal power and control over things that only the Hokage should have. I managed to stop them from doing so, and for a while it seemed like they had given up. But then the Uchiha clan massacre happened they have started up again. I guess I have no choice than to leave them with some of my Anbu as guides and take the rest as an escort home, sighing Hiruzen turned to the group and explained the parts in his thoughts that directly related to them. It's fine, it's understandable that the leader of the village must return to the village as soon as possible, and we have to agree to the fact that it will take us a while to adjust to being outside, Yui said in a calm voice despite the fact she was still blinking rapidly and slightly cringing from the sunlight. Could we have the group with Inu and Tora, they seemed like me and I'd kinda like to know why, Naruto added in a slightly strained voice, making Sedanbu twitch wondering how he knew that until they remembered his dojutsu. Hiruzen chuckled and raised his brow at the aforementioned Anbu, getting a nod from both in response he replied certainly, I will leave Inu, Tora, Tori, and Kuma to escort you where you need to go. I also give Inu and Tora permission to take off their masks and talk to you personally if they wish. That part shocked the Anbu present until they stopped to think for a minute about both Anbu's relationship with the boy, if you could consider knowing his father and having the same thing done to you, to a lesser extent, as was done to him a relationship, then I suppose we should head off now, Inu, Tora, Tori, Kuma, make sure they make it to Konoha safely, and take all the time you need to get there, as there's no reason to push them, receiving nods as confirmation to his orders. Hiruzen turned and began tree hopping toward Konoha at a rapid pace, his Anbu forming a loose protective circle around him. At least this gives me a chance to set the groundwork of setting them up a shinobi of Konoha with the council without them there and without the need to admit that number 23 is actually Naruto. I should also notify and call in Jiraiya as I'm sure he'll want to meet the godson he's been desperately searching for since his disappearance. Back with Naruto's group the Anbu left all looked to Inu for orders as he was the highest ranking person there and therefore the leader of the group. Sighing and looking at the still cringing and whining former prisoners he knew that there was really only one thing they could do, we'll get at least a short distance away from the lab and then we'll settle down and wait until these guys adjust to being in the light. After that we'll walk or jog to Konoha and give Naruto and the pups a chance to get used to be outside as everything will probably be overwhelming to them for a while. Nodding the group each grabbed one of the former prisoners shoulders while the odd one out picked up the pups, and, leading them away from the lab, started walking in the direction Konoha at a slow pace to make sure they didn't trip over anything. They hoped that at least the two who had been outside before would recover soon as they could tell that neither Naruto nor the pups liked being touched by strangers, not that they were offended since they figured the only times they'd been touched by someone other than Yui and Asahi were probably not pleasant experiences. And no, I am not implying rape, I hate rape scenes, even as a flashback, it is one of the most disgusting things one human can do to another in my opinion. They walked for three hours straight with little progress because, despite their best efforts, the practically blinded prisoners tripped over rocks and roots along the not really existent path. This is what happens when they try to walk with basically blind people in the middle of nowhere with no signs of anything having been so much as touched by humans for at least another couple of hours walk at this pace. At least Asahi and Yui had mostly recovered by now and were walking without help or tripping. Naruto and the pups, on the other hand, were understandably overwhelmed. There's a huge difference between reading about and sometimes seeing pictures in books about something, and seeing, hearing and smelling the thing for themselves for the first time. Naruto was looking around at everything with his mouth open so wide Asahi had more than once teased him about trying to catch flies with it, 
not that he heard the man. The pups were constantly sniffing the air and then sneezing in an attempt to clear their noses of the overwhelming combination of new smells, plant rot and decay, animals of different types and sizes, pollen and the flowers it comes from, fruit, and so much more practically assaulted their sensitive noses that were so used to smelling death, fear, misery, unwashed humans, and so many other unpleasant scents they quickly learned to do their best to ignore. Not to mention all the sounds most took for granted, the chirping of birds, the rustle of grass and bushes, the wind blowing through the trees, all things most people naturally tune out after a short while that Naruto and the pups had no experience dealing with. All in all they were making very little progress now not due to the fact that some of their group were sunblinded but because of the fact that some of them were going through sensory overload as their brains tried to comprehend the extremely long list of new things they were seeing and experiencing for the first time. They were so busy craning their necks trying to take in as much as they could that they would have walked into things multiple times if it weren't for the fact someone steered them clear of the thing in time though they were sorely becoming tempted to let them do it in the hopes that they would pay at least a little more attention to where they were going. Honestly enough if they weren't still too close to the lab for Inu's comfort, they would have just stopped and given them a chance to calm down and process everything, but as it was Inu wanted to be as far away from the place as they could be before they had to settle down for the night. Which was another cause for concern, as Anbu, they were trained to be able to go days without sleep if necessary while on a mission, either to be able to stay in enemy territory without risk of being caught unaware or, for cases such as this, where they need to get as far away from an enemy encampment as soon as they possibly can. But they had two prisoners who, while better taken care of than some of the others that weren't so lucky, were obviously not in the best of shape. On top of that they had a child and three recently born pups to take into consideration. They could not go without sleep like them, which meant that, despite the fact that his instinct screamed in protest, they would have to stop and camp for the night and make sure their charges got the proper amount of food and sleep or they would be slowed even further as their charges weakened. Which meant they'd also have to hunt and gather since all they carried with them was the standard Anbu rations, which is something even a hardened Anbu has trouble eating, while it did have all the necessary nutrients, he did not want to imagine the reaction a young child would have to it, not to mention the fact the pups wouldn't be able to eat it. This mission was getting, as a certain clan would phrase it, troublesome. Don't get him wrong, Kakashi, and I will call him Inu when he's thinking like an Anbu, Kakashi in general and will add the proper suffix to one or the other depending on the person addressing him and what persona he's in at the time, was sincerely looking forward to talking to the son of his sensei, whom he had thought was dead until just a few hours ago. But the fact of the matter was that Kakashi was a naturally lazy, laid-back person, unless in a serious fight or scolding someone he thought was in the wrong, and that includes Anbu or Shinobi in his charge that makes a mistake. So he was just now coming to realize that he'd agreed to pick the harder of two assignments a basically over-glorified yet at the same time extremely dangerous babysitting mission. Over-glorified because they were Anbu and because their charges, while still somewhat overwhelmed, would most likely be able to protect themselves from any bandits they'd encounter in the two-week walk to Konoha. Extremely dangerous because if any of Orochimaru's more powerful people, or even Orochimaru himself, returned to the lab and discovered the state of it and the loss of their most important experiments and prisoners, of that lab, without any sign of their bodies, they'd naturally realize someone saved them, come to realize it was most likely Konoha, and come after them in an attempt to recapture their charges. Which would be an extremely deadly situation if they weren't at or at least close to Konoha by the time that happened, and it most certainly would happen, eventually. Inu sighed slightly as he once again stopped Naruto from nearly walking into a tree, catching the bay's attention. Is something wrong Inu-san? The boy asked with slight curiosity in his voice. A slash N, again. Most of you are probably thinking Naruto will be at least somewhat emotionally crippled and socially awkward, and that will be true for the most part. But he had Yui and Asahi, and later the pups, there to not only help him out in the emotions department by treating him like family, but Yui, as you will notice later in the story, has a somewhat high-class personality and practically beat manners and proper treatment of others, except their wardens, into Naruto's head. So while he'll come off as somewhat cool and withdrawn to people he doesn't know or like, he won't be another sigh. That and the fact he's pretty much suffering from sensory overload and is happy he and his family are free and going to get a home, can you really blame him for being so open? Kakashi looked down at Naruto with an eye smile. Which he can't see because of the mask, right? No I didn't forget, it just slipped my mind for a second dot and now I'm trying to justify myself to my own mind, the stress this mission is going to cause is already getting to me it seems, and now I really need to stop this. Luckily for Kakashi and his wandering stress related thoughts. Naruto's concern at not being replied to right away had him say Inu-san, in a questioning tone, 
breaking Kakashi out of his maddening talking to himself thoughts. Silently thanking the boy for breaking him out of his seemingly messed up thought process Kakashi finally replied nothing you need to worry about Naruto, I'm just planning out the trip back to Konoha. Oh, Naruto was silent for a few seconds and seemed to be deep in thought about something, he then asked can you tell me some about what Konoha is like, I read all about its history and laws, but know next to nothing about what it's actually like. Hmm. Well I suppose what you'd think of Konoha depends on what role you take there, Kakashi said in a thoughtful tone. What do you mean Inu-san? Naruto asked in slight confusion. Well, what I mean is that why you're at the village and what you do as a part of the village helps you decide what you feel about the village, Kakashi explained. So what does it mean for each person of the village then Inu-san? Naruto asked. Well, let's see here. For the regular citizens, it means safety, protection, and prosperity as they feel they are, and are safe within the walls of one of the five great shinobi villages. For the merchants it means a prosperous place to trade and sell their wares as they make their stop there. For the shinobi, it is their most important thing to protect, the place they swear their loyalty to and will give their lives for if necessary. Ina's voice started of light and jovial, but by the end of his explanation it was hard and serious, conveying the importance and gravity of his words. But what about the Hokage? Naruto asked curiously. Wondering why Inu hadn't said anything about their village's most important person. Ah, that is a good question. The Hokage, as you probably already know, is the most important person in our village. But what you might not realize is that he is also the most burdened at the same time, Inu said. Most burden? Naruto asked curiously, little did they notice that they now had the attention of the rest of the former prisoners. The rest of the Anbu, of course, kept their attention to their surroundings. Yes Naruto, most burden, the Hokage as the village's leader, must make all the hard decisions. He must choose what missions to take and what to ignore, what shinobi to send on what mission, and as such he takes part of the blame if a mission goes awry and shinobis, clients, or civilians' lives are lost. He must also find ways to settle political problems both internally and with other villages and people. He must also be willing to give his life to protect the village and its people if necessary, as the Hokage is a shinobi as well. The Hokage's job is without a doubt the most important one. But it is also one of the most dangerous and stressful jobs as well, Inu explained in a serious, solemn tone. Cages, not just the Hokage but all cages, must be very strong-willed people to bear such a burden, Naruto murmured in a hushed tone. Yes, yes they are, Kakashi said with a slight chuckle. He was glad Naruto had taken an interest in the village that would soon become his home, and even more glad that this distracted him from gawking at the scenery enough that he started paying attention to where he was going. The pups seemed to follow Naruto's lead. So they, too, were now paying attention to where they were going. Realizing this was a good opportunity to speed up their pace a bit and get further away from the lab before they had to camp for the night Inu said, let's up our pace some, I want to be as far away from the lab as we can before we have to camp for the night. Getting a chorus of highs, Inu increased the group's pace to a speedy jog. Four hours later the Anbu were honestly surprised that their charges were only just starting to get tired. Yes, the folder said they trained regularly, but there's a big difference between training in a cool, probably only somewhat large room, and jogging at a fast pace in the heat of the sun while dogging and jumping over all sorts of obstacles, little did they know or think to ask that all three of them, and even the pups, all had gravity seals on to make up for the lack of space in their training. Noticing a river nearby, Inu called out all right, let's take a short break, once again getting a series of highs in response. As soon as the group stopped, Yui and Asahi sat down, panting slightly, but Naruto and the pups seemed to still have energy to burn. So Kakashi decided to take advantage of that fact and said to Naruto, Naruto, since you and your pups seem to still have energy to spare, why don't I escort you to the river and you can give them what seems like it would be their first bath in a long time. No shampoo though. Naruto looked down at his hounds and thought, it's true, it's been a long time since I've been allowed to clean these guys, ever since they were weaned in fact. They're so dirt encrusted that I actually can't tell what color they really are anymore, everyone probably thinks they're just brown. But that's actually not true. And besides, he's probably also using this as an excuse to talk to me in private, which I'm interested in doing. Having finished his thoughts and come to a decision he replied, I would appreciate that Inu-san. Inu nodded to Naruto and looked over to the Anbu under his command and ordered, Keep your eyes and ears peeled. You never know when our raid will be discovered, so it's best to keep our guard up. Eat if you have to, and share some of your rations with Asahi-san and Yui-san if they're hungry. We want to keep everyone's energy up after all. Once again getting a chorus of highs from the group, Kakashi nodded to Naruto and began heading to the river, which took only about 10 minutes of walking to reach. So may I ask who you are and why you seem to be happy to see me now, Inu-san? 
Naruto asked as he began washing Kimi to the best of his abilities without any soap. In reply Kakashi removed his mask to show, another mask. The man's face was covered from the top of his nose down in a navy blue mask. His left eye was covered by his Konoha Hitai 8, so all Naruto really saw of him was his right eye, which was entirely black without even a pupil, his ears, since he also pulled down his hood, and his already seen gravity-defying silver hair. Okay, so, that doesn't really answer my question you know, Naruto said, glad that the river water was warm so he didn't have to worry about his teeth chattering. First off, let me answer a question with a question, do you know who your parents were, your answer will decide how much I tell you. Kakashi answered in a serious tone. I know my mother was Kushina Uzumaki, the red hot habanero to Konoha, and the red death to her enemies, I also know all about our clan and the fact it was wiped out at the start of the third shinobi world war. I know that my father was the Yondame Hokage, Minato Namikaze, but other than that and the fact that they're both dead I know nothing about them. The people at the lab, Orochimaru especially, tried to tell me all sorts of lies about them, but I knew that that's what they were, Naruto said barely pausing to take a breath. Having done the best he could for Kimi, he switched her out with June. Well, then I guess I can tell you I was a student and member of your father's Janan squad, and a close friend of both him and your mother. That and my name is Kakashi Hitake, Kakashi told him. Naruto heard the sad melancholy in Kakashi's voice, but decided he wasn't close enough with the man to comment on it. I know that you probably want to learn more about me, but I'm not quite ready for that yet, so would you maybe tell me everything you're willing to about my parents? Naruto asked hesitantly. Seeing the hesitance, hope, and most of all fear of being reprimanded in Naruto's eyes Kakashi sighed and nodded to him, well then let's start first with your father, shall we? Minato-sensei was a great man, he. For the rest of the time Naruto spent washing the dogs, letting them dry, all the while keeping Ryu from rolling around in the dirt and making himself dirty all over again, and even for some time afterwards, they stayed there, one listening to and absorbing everything the other told him three just trying to dry themselves off by licking themselves, only succeeding in making themselves cleaner, and wetter. They spent an hour total by the river, and by the time the hour was over Kakashi had told Naruto everything he knew and thought about his parents, which was quite a bit, and Naruto seemed to have warmed up to him a bit. But he would have to save that fact for another time, as their break had lasted more than long enough. So he got up, put his Inu mask back on, and told Naruto, it's time to return to the group and start moving again. To which he got a high in response. When they returned to the rest of their group, everyone's eyes, except Kakashi's and Naruto's, were drawn to the pups, as though they were just now seeing them for the first time, which in a way they were. Without the dirt covering them they were all very different colors, which came as quite a surprise, even Kakashi was surprised by how much of a change a wash could cause. Kimi has deep green eyes, and her fur is almost entirely white, with black front paws, a black tail and rump, and the top half of her ear is a startling red. June has hazel slash gold eyes, and his fur is almost all black, with his right forepaw and left hind paw being red, the top half of his tail was red as well, and his left ear was entirely white with a spot of white surrounding it. Ryu was the biggest surprise of all, he was almost entirely red, with black paws, all four of them, white on the tips of his ears, and the tip of his tail also white, all of which made his still blue eyes all the more startling. All three had stick up ears and puffy fur and tails. Imagine Akamaru only with stick-up ears instead of droopy. Jun was slightly smaller than both Kimi and Ryu, who were the same size as each other. They didn't think dogs could be red, let alone the almost crimson red these three had. An I'd like to ask someone who's good at art to please send me an image of these three as I just described them. It doesn't matter to me if you want to add Naruto to the image or not, as long as you use my Naruto. You can even make Naruto as he'd be at 13, as he'll look and dress almost the same, except taller, 5 feet 2 inches. Also, if you make him 13, put his hit I ate around his neck with a black cloth. Since Inuzuka hounds grow at a much slower pace than a normal hound since they have a human's lifespan, and my hounds are half Inuzuka, if you do make him 13, make Kimi and Ryu only slightly bigger than Akamaru at that point, and Jun at the same size as Akamaru, at that time period, I'd really appreciate it. Wow, I figured you guys would be surprised by how they really look, but I didn't think you'd be this surprised, if I had known that, I would have warned you. Naruto's slightly sheepish voice broke them out of their shock. Well Naruto, while you were bottle feeding them we didn't see you, and by the time we did see you again the pups were already dirty, and the lighting wasn't exactly the best in the first place. I honestly didn't think dogs could be red, especially not that shade of red Yui admitted in a slightly shocked tone of voice. Well, they actually can't in most cases dogs with red in their coats is a sign of illness, but these guys were naturally born with it, 
and all tests state that they're perfectly healthy, so I think the only explanation I can give is that it's probably cause of me, he admitted in a low tone while looking down at the ground and pointing at the unruly mop of strawberry blonde that was his hair. That got a round of blinks, they had all honestly forgotten about the fact that the pups had Naruto's genes in them. They acted so much like normal pups and, until they'd been washed, looked so much like ordinary pups that it was an easy thing to forget. But now that they'd seen their natural fur color it was easy to see the physical sign of his genes influence on them. Noticing his beginning depression Asahi walked over and lightly hit Naruto on the head saying, it's not your fault they did that to them and you know it, so don't go blaming yourself over anything out of the ordinary about them, blame those sick bastards instead. Language, Yui snapped. You know as well as I do that those jerks never watch their tongues around him, he's hurt and said far worse. So long as he isn't foolish enough to say anything in an important conversation or to an important person, I see no reason to worry about it, Asahi replied. That's how it always is with you, you never consider the fact that if we let it become a habit with him then it most likely will cause problems at some point, Yui shot back. And so the two began bickering back and forth over all sorts of things, starting from differences of opinion over how to raise him and ending up at how they felt about how they treated other people in general. As the confrontation escalated, Naruto looked up from the ground with a smile, it was a small smile, but a genuine one all the same, the first the Anbu, other than Kakashi, had seen him make. Suddenly that smile turned into a mischievous grin and, in a slightly amused tone, he said to them, why don't the two of you just confess your love for each other and get married already, you guys act like an old married couple anyway, so you might as well. This statement had the automatic effect of turning them both as red as a tomato and spitting and stuttering out attempted counters and denials getting a laugh from Naruto and amused yips from the pups. Even the Anbu present were having trouble holding in their amusement at the duo's reaction. In a desperate attempt at changing the subject Yui turned to Inu and said we're all rested and ready to go whenever you are, getting emphatic nods of agreement from Asahi. This time Inu was unable to completely hold back and he let out a small chuckle at their expense before saying, alright then, we're going to go at a faster pace than before and we're not stopping until we camp for the night, and make sure to keep your guards up understood? Once again getting a series of highs or nods from those present he said of it meant to hide non speeds towards the village, though they didn't tree hop yet since Naruto and the hounds would need to be taught how. They continued this pattern of starting out slow and gradually speeding up through the day with the only break being a one hour lunch break all the way until they camped for the night. The hounds and Naruto proved to be excellent foragers and hunters, and regularly helped the Anbu get the food needed to feed everyone at night. While at the same time being taught how to tree hop, already knowing the wall walking exercise helped. During the lunch breaks and sometimes while Naruto was out forging he and Kakashi would often talk about one another, and quickly grew an almost brotherly attitude towards one another when Kakashi was not in his Inu persona, as Naruto liked the calming, yet sad where Kakashi gave off, and Kakashi liked the kind, if withdrawn, or a Naruto gave off. All in all, they were making a pretty good pace, and if the pattern continued as it had so far they'd be at the village in just over a week which was four days faster than estimated. This pattern, however, was broken slightly the lunch break of the fourth day. When Kakashi, with his Inu mask on, tilted his head toward Naruto in an invite to take a walk together, as per usual, Naruto instead said, Actually, I think it should be Tora's turn now, don't you? Kakashi sighed, he'd come to like the private time he'd spent getting to know Naruto, but understood where he was coming from, so even though he wasn't entirely happy about it. He turned to Tora and simply said go ahead, getting a nod from the man in response. And so Naruto and Tora walked off into the forest. After getting a reasonable distance away from the group they came across a small clearing with large rocks scattered about, and decided to settle there to talk. So did you know my parents do, or did you have another reason for wanting to get to know me? Naruto asked the man curiously. Just like Kakashi, Tora first removed his mask and hood, revealing what he looked like to Naruto. I'm not going to bother explaining. Just imagine what he looks like in canon, only younger, should be 19 to 20 right now, and in Anbu gear rather than standard Jonin gear, it would have to be the second reason I'm talking to you, Naruto. You see, we happen to share a similar burden, I was taken and experimented on by Orochimaru at a young age. I was one of his original attempts at giving the Makutan to children, babies really, the only one to survive the experiment, and as for my name, simply keep calling me Tora, Tora said in a solemn tone. His explanation to Naruto as to why he wanted to get to know him left the boy staring at him wide-eyed for what seemed to be a long moment, before finally saying so I guess that means in a way we're related then, huh, well that's a shock, with a bittersweet smile on his face. Bitter at the thought of someone else having already gone through a little of what he did, but sweet at the thought of having yet another extended family member. Tora, as though understanding the thoughts behind the smile said, 
I hope we get to know each other well, and, with Hokage-sama's permission, that I get to teach you everything I know about our shared bloodline, if you're okay with that, of course. All Naruto could do in reply was smile and nod, and so they spent the rest of the break simply talking about whatever they were willing to talk about with one another until it was time for them to return to the rest of the group. The rest of their trip back to Konoha followed the same pattern as before, only now Naruto switched between spending time with Kakashi, Tora, both, or simply staying with Yui, Asahi, and the hounds for their break. All in all it took the group a little over a week and a half to reach the rather impressive looking gates of Konoha, much to the relief of some, and the anxiety of others. Konoha, five days after raid on lab, afternoon. Hiruzen and his Anbu escort, after days of near non-stop travel, were finally back at Konoha, much to their relief. But, before he could head to the Hokage Tower and begin not only the probably large stack of paperwork on his desk, but also on building the groundwork for Naruto's return and the others' welcome. He had one more thing to do. Turning to the Anbu present he ordered get the bodies we stored away to the morgue, take the people we captured and put in containment seals to Iviki at D&I, take all data we managed to obtain to the intelligence department to go through, and finally keep all news of our soon-to-be new citizens a secret. You are not to say so much as a peep about any of them, not even about their existence. I will handle all things about them, including their files, personally, do you understand me? He began leaking out killing intent, key. To make his point clear, getting a chorus of highs from his Anbu, and assured that no one was going to learn anything about them without him telling the person himself, Hiruzu nodded and said good, feel free to take a week long break after completing what I've told you to do, dismissed. Getting a chorus of high Hokage Samas and thank you Hokage Samas, the Anbu shunshine to the locations they were told to go in order to drop the stuff off and begin their break. Sighing and looking around his village for a second, detecting his normal Anbu guard take their accustomed positions. Hiruzen soon shunshine to his office, knowing he was going to have a monstrously big pile of all cages bane, paperwork. Appearing in his office in a puff of smoke and looking at his desk, Hiruzen nearly started crying and banging his head against the nearest hard surface, which just so happened to be the wall, at the sheer amount of paperwork sitting there waiting for him on his desk. Deciding that there were more immediately important things to do than go through the terror of a pile, Hiruzen sat at his desk and cleared enough space on it to write a letter to his wayward student. Jiraiya of the Sanin, Naruto's godfather. Luckily due to a recent report from him that was conveniently at the top of the pile of paperwork, he knew the area in which to send the letter that simply stated a certain someone he'd been searching for had been found and that he would be told more once he got back to the village, since Hiruzen didn't want to risk sensitive information getting around if the messenger hawk was intercepted. Finishing that, he sent out a small pulse of his chakra to summon one of his hidden guards to stand in front of him. Swan. Please tell the members of the Shinobi Council to be present for an important council meeting in one hour. Just them, not the civilian council, and not my advisors, if any of them try to get in, you and the other Anbu have my permission to escort them out of the tower, understood? An Swan in Japanese is pronounced almost the same as in English, for those of you who may be wondering why I used English for Anbu all of a sudden. Getting a high, Hokage-sama in response. The Anbu shined away in a swirl of leaves in order to begin sending out the summons to the various clan leaders that made up the Shinobi Council. Sighing once more he looked down at the paperwork, which somehow seemed to have grown since he came in and muttered to himself might as well get started, with anime tears running down his face. One hour later, council chamber. Hiruzen calmly looked around the table at the other members participating in this council meeting, Tsume Inuzuka, head of the Inuzuka clan, Chozo Akimichi, head of the Akimichi clan, Inoiki Yamanaka head of the Yamanaka clan, Shikaku Nara, head of the Nara clan, Hyashi Hyudga, head of the Hyuga clan, Shibi Aburame, head of the Aburame clan. The Senju clan seat was empty, and has been empty since Tsunade left the village. The Uchiha clan seat was empty since the only loyal Uchiha left was not of an age to take it yet. The Uzumaki clan special seat granted to them as close allies of Konoha, which most counselors have forgotten exists, is empty for the same reason as the Uchiha, not that they know that yet and the Sarutobi clan seat and vote was his as was the Hokaye's, no duh. All in all the most powerful clan's leaders were the members of the esteemed Shinobi Council. Finishing his examination of each individual person, who were all showing their curiosity at being called into a council meeting just an hour after their Hokage went on a mission personally was enough to get even the normally lazy Nara and stoic Hyuga and Aburame to show their curiosity in their own ways. Deciding that he delayed long enough, Hiruzen took out a silent seal the most powerful and airtight Jiraiya could make, set it on the table, and activated it, then activated the silent seals already present in the room as an added precaution. Looking straight at the members of the council Haruzin said to them, 
Everything that is about to be discussed here today is to be considered an S-rank secret. Discussing this with anyone outside of this room without my express permission is grounds for immediate execution. Your clan head status will not save you. Am I understood? He received a chorus of high Hokage Samas. They knew better than to argue with him when he used that tone. This must be a very important topic if you're taking this many precautions to make sure it stays secret Hokage Sama, said the ever stoic Shibi. That is correct, Shibi san. As it involves my former student Orochimaru, Hiruzen's statement got gasps and murmurs of surprise and concern from various members of the council. If one listened closely, you'd also hear Shikaku's murmur of troublesome, mixed in. What has that slimy snake done now? Sume growled out. Inuzuka's valued loyalty and pack above all else, so a traitor like Orochimaru really gets on their nerves. You all are probably aware of the recent string of kidnappings of civilian children and orphans that's been happening in the village the past couple of years. Receiving nods of confirmation from them, he continued, Well, I received information from a reliable source stating that Orochimaru was up to his old tricks again, and giving the location of the place he was doing them in. Unfortunately, it was right. Silence filled the room in his statement, they all remembered the last meeting that was called after their Hokage performed a raid on one of Orochimaru's labs. The horrors and atrocities they heard about and saw pictures of was enough to turn even Shibi green. The only good thing they got out of it was Denzo who has an invaluable ability that was lost until then. They felt sorry for the child, but they couldn't deny his usefulness, and he was now an excellent shinobi and member of the village. They were hoping this raid was not as bad as the last, but knew that it likely was. Is it all bad, or did we manage to save at least one of them like last time? Inoiki asked curiously. It was defiantly as bad as, if not worse than the last one. But yes, we did manage to save someone. Several someones in fact. That is what we are here to discuss today what was done to them, who they are, and what their possible status in the village might be. I warn you, these ones that were saved are much older than Denzo was when we found him, and therefore have an actual choice in whether or not they join this village or not, so don't try to push them into something they don't want when they get here. Hiruzen told them sternly, this is also the reason why only you are here, as the others will try to twist things to satisfy their own desires. Noticing Shikaku was about to ask a question Hiruzen replied to it before he could get it out they were in no condition to come to the village at the pace I needed to return, so I left them with an Anbu escort so they can get here at their own pace. This answer satisfied him. The rest of it got a round of nods from all present, they knew that the elder advisors, Donzo especially, would love to sink their claws into them. I will now pass around copies of all of their files, as you will probably be able to tell from reading through them that they will probably need to go through at least a couple of sessions with Inoiki-san before making any final decisions about them. As he finished saying this, the members of the council opened the top file and began reading, the order goes Asahi, Yui, Naruto, the pups. After reading through Asahi's folder, the question started, is he as hot-headed as explained in the file, that came from Inoiki? Yes, but seemingly only for good reasons, he was actually pleasant and respectful towards me and the Anbu, replied Hiruzen. What are his plans in the village? asked Hiyashi. He expressed an interest in becoming a shinobi, but only on the conditions that he is never put on the CRA and that all of them are not separated, as they are like family to each other, and of course we should put him through a few sessions with Inoiki to confirm his mental stability, Hiruzen replied. The members of the council murmured to one another before Hiyashi finally spoke to Hiruzen directly, I can accept that. Shall we vote now about the decision to accept Asahi as a ninja on the condition he passes Inoiki's psych evaluation? while accepting the conditions he himself set before us, or shall we wait until they arrive?" he asked them. While waiting for them to make their decision, he was secretly hoping they'd choose to vote now, as there was a chance Donzo might find a way to influence this if they waited. He was just glad that the Hokage's advisors did not need to be present for the vote on whether or not to accept foreigners as shinobi or not, the only ones that needed to present were the Hokage himself and the shinobi council or things would be much harder right now. Once again acting as the group's spokesperson Hyashi said we'll vote now. Giving an internal sigh of relief Hiruzen said, very well, all in favor of allowing Asahi to become a shinobi graded he pass our condition and we pass his, stand now. Everyone in the room stood, good, as of the moment he becomes a shinobi, as I am confident he will, Asahi will be immune to the CRA. Realizing they were done with this man, at least until he actually got here. They moved on to the next file. After getting through Yui's file Tsume couldn't help but chuckle and say, I like this woman, freezing off the balls of anyone who tried to rape her despite the punishments she got for it. Please tell me she wants to be a Kunoichi as well, Hokage-sama. Yes she does, but she wants to be kept off the active duty list for a couple years at least since the person in the next file is a child she's taken to raising, and she wants to be there for him until he's older, 
so she doesn't want to risk herself on missions. She also has the condition she never gets put into any sort of breeding program, which I'm sure you'll all agree to since all of us think those things are disgusting. And of course she'll have to go through a mental evaluation as well, Hiru's instated, and settled back to once again let them discuss this with one another. This time it was Tsume who spoke for them all, we'll do the vote on all of this now, since we figured that will be your next question. Getting a nod from Hiru's and he said the same thing he said for Asahi, once again everyone voted yes. Seeing this he said very well, Yui, if she passes her psyche test, will become an official Kunoichi of Konoha but will not be put on the active duty list until the child is older, she will also be immune to being put into any breeding programs as well. Once again they moved on to the next file, and were horrified by what they read, especially Tsume who questioned, Hokage-sama, the pups, are completely and totally loyal to the boy, and will not be separated from him. However, if you wish to bring Kuromaru to see if he can smell their father in them, and, with their approval, if you want to train them, you are free too. They are also the last file on the table as you might have already guessed, Hiruzen told her. She nodded and said, I believe I will do just that Hokage-sama, and I hope they and the boy will be willing to train under me and let the hounds learn of their roots. What of the boy himself, he seems to be very powerful, and while I'm already assuming he's not to be put under the CRA, what else will be done with him, as he's a bit young to be a Chunin? Especially after what the others we made tuning at this age became like, Shikaku asked in his typical lazy manner. The boy also wishes to become a shinobi, however I agree with you on the fact he is a bit young to become one. So what I will do is apprentice him to both Asahi and Tenzo, making him an up-and-coming shinobi to be, and therefore under my direct jurisdiction despite not being a full shinobi. I will also be putting him in the academy alongside his age group so that he can to learn how to better react to and interact with others. After putting him through the same mental evaluation as the others, of course, Hiruzen said, telling them of his plan for him. This time they did not even take the time to discuss, they simply looked at each other, nodded, and let Shikaku say, we all cast our vote in a yes to all of that and the fact that he is immune to the CRA. Just out of curiosity, who is the boy, Choza asked curiously, voicing everyone else's question for them. Hiruzen sighed, he knew this was coming. He was just glad that they had nothing against the boy and were smart enough to see his heritage despite the fact he was a newborn at the time, but this would still be an explosive reaction. Mostly because many of them, having recognized his heritage, had wanted to adopt him, and all of them were devastated when they learned that the last link to their precious Ion Daime was most likely dead or permanently out of their grasp. He took a moment to pack his pipe with tobacco and light it with a minor fire jutsu knowing he would need its soothing quality soon enough. Once it was lit he took a breath in and out of it and said, he is someone we all know very well and thought was lost to us, causing most the people in the room to tense, not knowing who he meant, and Shikaku to stare at him with wide eyes, being able to make a guess just from that putting that statement together with what little physical description he had of the boy, he is Naruto Uzumaki Nami Kaze, he finished simply. They all stared at him, frozen, for a long minute, and then chaos descended. Voices rose in shouts, offers to adopt him were put forth, and the general insanity that happens when people are told something stunning ensued. He gave them all five minutes to let them get the worst of it out of their systems, and then shouted enough, while leaking out enough key to instantly shut them up. He, as you already know, has people to take care of him, and therefore doesn't need to be adopted. As for a place for them to live, I will be giving them the deed to the Namikaze estate, as it is Nardo's birthright, as well as the Uzumaki clan funds for the same reason so he will not need what you are offering. As for telling the rest of the populace of his heritage, we will wait until he becomes a Jonin as originally decided so that his parents' enemies do not make him a target before he is strong enough to deal with them. I believe he will comply with only using the Uzumaki part of his name until then. As for your concerns about him being discovered by living in his parents' house, remember the fact that they built it in the forest, on top of the Hokage monument, and the only people who really knew about it were us, Samanbu and their closest friends. Not even the elder advisors knew where they lived, and no one who did will break their trust in them by blabbing about it just because they're dead. Not to mention the security seals are so complex the only ones with access to the place was them, Kakashi, Jiraiya, and me, and if that wasn't enough it's out of the way enough that no one goes there unless they know about the place, so there's no need to worry. His words calmed them as they knew they were true. But there was one last issue they needed covered before he dismissed them for the day. What about the civilians' reactions to the matter? You know one of the civilian council members leaked the fact he was a Jin Shuriki to them. 
your law about the fact being an S rank secret where if anyone other than you or him tells someone not already in the know is automatically executed being enforced despite his disappearance might give him a chance with the younger generations. That and there will be no problem whatsoever on the shinobi side due to your strict teachings to everyone on exactly what a Jin Churiki is, even adding a lecture on them and the Bijou to the academy, has more than enforced the fact that the container is not the beast to them, but grudges can last a long time, and not everyone has let go. Tsume said in concern. At that Iruzen let out a weary sigh and admitted, I don't honestly know. Chapter 3, Homecoming, Sort of. Konoha Village Entrance, with Naruto. As soon as the group announced their presence to the gate guards, a group of Anbu appeared. The one with a swan mask stepped forward and said, You are to take our new guests straight to Hokage-sama's office by his orders. Inu, Tori, Tora, and Kuma nodded and grabbed their charges in order to shunshine them to their Hokage's office. Arriving at the office, they saw their Hokage sitting behind his usual desk, but what surprised them was the fact that Inoiki Yamanaka was standing near him. Ah good, you guys are here, earlier than planned as well. Inu, Tora, please stay, Tori, Kuma, you are dismissed, feel free to take a week-long break before taking your next missions, but you are under no circumstances to tell anyone about our new citizens, understood? Getting a chorus of highs. The dismissed Hanbu left while the other two remained where they were. Hiruzen looked at the three former prisoners and said I spoke with the council and they all agree to your wishes to become shinobi while following your conditions, if you agree to some conditions of our own. And what kind of conditions are these Hokage-sama? Asahi asked with a hint of suspicion. First, let me ask you if you know of the Yamanaka clan and their clan's abilities. Getting a round of nods he continued, good. The first condition you must accept is to let Inoiki hear mind while call three of you in order to confirm your mental stability. I assure you that anything he sees in your mind will not go further than the people in this room, and even that will be kept strictly to things we need to know. The three exchanged glances, nodded, and let Yui say, we accept this condition Hokage-sama. Hiruzen nodded and said good, Inoiki will do this as soon as I finish listing the other conditions. The second condition is for Naruto only, getting a curious look from the boy he continued, Naruto, while I'm sure you're at least Shinon level both knowledge and skill wise, I am worried about your lack of interaction with people who aren't your family or people who mean you harm. That and your lack of experience leads me to putting you in the academy. Seeing the boy's worried look he was quick to assure, don't worry I'm going to put you under an apprenticeship, mostly under Asahi, and, if he agrees, Tora, but also under anyone else willing to teach you that I and Yui-san approve of. So you will be under my jurisdiction. Also, if she wants to. She will become your legal guardian by adoption, on the condition she takes your name. I accept these conditions Hokage same, I am curious, however, over whether you mean my full name, or just the Uzumaki part of my name, as I don't think I'm ready to handle my father's enemies yet, Naruto said. Ah yes, I would prefer it if the both of you simply went by Uzumaki until you are ready, I had meant to address that latter, but seeing as how you brought it up, and have pretty much already agreed to it, from now until you are at Dokubutsu Jonin. You will only go by the Uzumaki part of your name, Hiruzen stated. Understood, Hokage-sama, can we please pause in the conditions for a minute to let Yui Obasan sign the adoption papers if she wants to, Naruto asked, getting an of course I want to, silly, from Yuyan reply. Nodding, Hiruzen took out the already prepared document, as an already signed and stamped by him as well as already filled out, and put it on the desk for her to sign. After she finished signing the document he said somewhat cheerfully, very well then. From now on you are Yui Uzumaki, I hope you continue to take as good care of Naruto as you already have been. After getting a nod of confirmation from Yui, he added, I too have something I need to do before giving you the final condition. He reached for a secret storage seal under his desk and added chakra to it, causing a scroll slightly longer and thicker than his arm, two letters, and three documents to come out of it. Looking straight into Naruto's eyes as he put them on the desk he told the boy Naruto. What I have here is your inheritance from both of your parents. The scroll is locked by a blood seal only you can open, and contains both the Namikaze and Uzumaki Kenjutsu styles, all of their Taijutsu styles, all of their sealing styles, and their signature techniques, among other things, go through it later at your leisure. The two letters are letters your parents wrote in their final moments, just before they went off to fight the QB. And finally the three documents, two of them are your parents' bank account, which also happens to be the clan funds for their respective clans. You are not allowed to use your father's until you start using his name, but you are free to your mother's. The final document is the deed to the Namikaze estate, which you will all be living at, you don't need to worry about anyone discovering your heritage by living there, 
as few people know of it. I have to warn you that because of that and the security seals which prevent anyone other than a select few from entering it that it and the property around it will have most likely fallen into a state of disrepair. Don't worry Hokage-sama, I know enough about carpentry to perform any repairs, and I'm able to make more than enough shadow clones to make cleaning and repairs a simple task as long as I have the tools necessary for it, Naruto told him. Alright then, if you say so, Hiruzen stated, anyway, the final condition is that you stay at the house until the council meeting tomorrow to meet the council, as they wish to meet you, and then to once again to stay at the house until the mayhem that will be caused by the announcement of Naruto's return to the village, which I will be making shortly after the council meeting, calms down. Don't worry about food and supplies as I will assign Inu and Tora to watch over you during the day and bring you any food or supplies you need as long as you supply the funds, as you will find more than enough money to pay for whatever you need in the house itself. Once again they exchanged looks and nods and this time it was Asahi that said we accept all three conditions Hokage-sama. Nodding, Hiruzen looked to Inoiki, who nodded and walked over to the three. Deciding to start with Asahi, he asked permission, and, after receiving it, put his hands on the man's head and began his technique. After a couple of minutes he removed his hands from the now unconscious man's head and said, he's stable, but does have a bit of a temper issue that makes me recommend not making him a jonin, regardless of what the test he will take to determine his rank says. Getting a nod of understanding from Hiruzen, he moved on to Yui and did the same thing. Removing his hands from the now unconscious woman he said other than a habit of giving minor frostbite to those who insult her looks and perverts, she is completely stable and as there are plenty of kunoichi who assault those who insult their looks and perverts, I find no problem in her getting whatever rank she deserves. Getting yet another nod of understanding from Hiruzen, he moved on to Naruto, once again doing the same thing. After a couple minutes he paled and removed his hands from the now unconscious child and said in a slightly shaky voice, the things they did to the child to get him to obey them are simply horrible. They almost never physically abused him. But the things they did to terrify him are simply horrible and I am shocked that I didn't find any permanent mental scaring or rational or irrational fears from it, don't get me wrong he is scared, but he has a high chance of recovering from it, and he does have fears, they're just not directly caused by it. He's completely stable, but your idea to have him go to the academy first is a good one, as he deserves to have at least a semi-normal rest of his childhood before becoming a ninja. Getting another nod from Haruzun he was then told, very good. Please remember that everything you saw in their minds is completely confidential. You are dismissed. Inoiki nodded and Shun shined away in a poof of smoke. Taking the couple of minutes it would take for the three to wake back up, Hiruzen took out two Konoha Hitai 8s. When they did wake up a couple of seconds later and realized Inoiki was gone, they looked at Hiruzen questioningly. Noticing this Hiruzen tossed Yui and Asahi the headbands on the desk and said, Congratulations, all three of you pass, Asahi, Yui. You will be tested for what rank you will be given after everything calms down. Afterwards, Asahi will be put on the active duty list while Yui, as requested, will be put on reserve until Naruto is older. The two of them nodded and put on their headbands, Yui tied hers around her waist like a belt and Asahi put his around his left bicep. A and second image request, if no one wants to do the hounds alone then could you do the whole family, Asahi, Yui, Naruto, and the hounds all together. Yui likes to wear kimonos and yukatas designed for battle and Asahi likes to wear black hanbu pants with a black or navy blue shirt. Once again if you want to make them older look at what I said about what Naruto and the hounds will look like by the time they graduate. I'd actually prefer to see them older than at this age. To anyone that's good at heart, or at least better than me, who can't even make a circle round or make a stick figure without it looking crippled tt, that's reading this story I would really love to see this or my other requested image. Puppy dog eyes no jutsu please. Thinking for a second and realizing he had nothing more to tell them right this instant, he said now that that's all over, Inu, as you know where the compound is please make enough clones to shunshine everyone to the front gate of their new home. Naruto, in order to enter the house draw a little blood and put it on the Uzumaki swirl on the gate, then push a little of your chakra in it. Getting a couple of highs, Inu quickly made enough cage bunshines to shunshine everyone to the compound, which grabbed them and did so. Arriving there himself he found Naruto already opening the gates and the group walking in, so he quickly joined them. As soon as the last person was through, the gate slammed shut behind them, sealing shut once more. The group looked around in awe at the compound and property. Despite being overrun with weeds the yard was both beautiful and huge, with flower and what seemed to be herb gardens, three different kinds of training grounds, one with lots of trees, one with a large pond with a clear area around it and one that seemed to be an extremely rocky terrain. There was even a meditation garden with a small pond that had what seemed to be koi in it and a small artificial waterfall. The house itself was also beautiful, it was a three-story, 
4. If you count the basement they don't know about yet, country-style wood house and a home a light yellow color with a tiled roof, but they could see the state of disrepair it had fallen into, ivy grew over almost the entire house, covering the windows, and the porch swing was off its hinges, and that's just what they could see from this angle. They could also see a reasonably large tool shed not too far off in the distance, also in a state of disrepair. Looks like you guys have your work cut out for you, Kakashi said in a lazy tone. Not really, or were you not paying attention when I said I could just spam enough cage bunshine to do all the work in no time, right after saying that he made 200 seal less, but not smokeless, cage bunshines. Noticing the small amount of smoke he frowned and added, looks like I still need to do some work on it though. The two Anbu were glad that their masks hid their shock. For a kid to effortlessly produce so many clones at such a young age showed a frightening amount of chakra, which really shouldn't be that shocking seeing as how he had a giant entity made entirely of chakra sealed into him slowly leaking and mixing its chakra with his. Turning to his shadow clones he began issuing out orders, alright, 60 of you head to the tool shed and get what you need to take care of the land, cut the grass, repair or replace the training posts, clean out the ponds, weed out the flower and herb gardens. For those of you who do the last two chores after you finish weeding each bed out go back through and label all the flowers and herbs, the order will be name, uses, if they have any, and dangers, if there are any. After getting a series of yes, boss from 60 of the clones, which automatically went to start their tasks, he moved on. Five of you will also go to the tool shed and get the necessary supplies to clean up and repair the shed itself, once again getting a reply. Five clones also automatically went to start their assigned tasks. Pausing a minute to make sure his clones were really doing what he told them to do he continued, 10 of you start working on fixing up the outside of the house, don't get rid of all the ivy though, keep enough of it for decorative purposes, also keep your eyes peeled for any seals that might be present and document them, the order goes, the condition they're in, what they do, whether they're active or not, and where they are, when you're done, bring the finished list to me, same reply same action after i open the house in the same way i open the gates i want 10 clones each cleaning all three floors with an extra five working on the kitchen as i'm sure you don't want to smell rotting food and i don't want the memory of the smell make sure you use your masks same reply and after he opened the door same action next i want 10 clones each to find the library armory and study respectively and organize sort and list every single thing we have you know how detailed i want it and who to return the finished lists to also look for, but don't try to open, the safe that's probably hidden in one of those three rooms, one of you come out and tell me when you do, before you go I want the group going to the library to come to me and grab the scroll that is all the books and scrolls we brought from the lab, as I want them added to it, oh, and try not to get in the way of the cleaners, same replies, similar actions only one group walked up to Naruto and collected the scroll he mentioned before walking off, next I want groups of five per floor going over the walls and floors of the house thoroughly, once again searching for and thoroughly documenting any seals you find, you know the order and what to do with them. Same reply, same action. There were now 50 clones left. Just as he was about to continue, one of the first floor clones came out and said, Boss, seems like there's a basement, a really big one too. I just wanted to tell you that and I will get back to my own work now. Alright then, I want 30 of you to go down to the basement, 10 to clean, 10 to go through and organize and document whatever is down there and tend to go through it looking for any seals that have been placed around it, same organization, and once again, give the finished lists to me when you're done, same reply, same action. The rest of you will be going over the fence around the property, tend to clean and repair it, tend to look for and document any seals on it, you know what to do with the list, yet again, same reply, same action. Looking at the two on Naruto politely asked could one of the two of you please go out and get enough food, toiletries, toothbrushes, toothpaste, shampoo, soap, toilet paper, act, and, after you get our sizes and preferences, close to last us two weeks, as we will probably be here for at least that long without being able to leave and we should probably be wearing clean clothes when we meet the council. I'm sure I'll have found and opened the safe by the time you get back so we can pay for it all. I'll do it, Tora volunteered, as he knew Kakashi never would, and, after getting each person's sizes and preferences, left to buy the requested items. Looking around at his various cage bunshines Naruto decided to go and help out the ones working on the meditation garden as that would be a nice place to sit and wait for his clones to do what they were tasked to do. After looking at each other and shrugging, Asahi and Yui went to help a group of clones with what they felt like helping with. Inu simply went over to a tree, jumped up to a branch, sat on it, and took out a certain little orange book that we all know well. Half an hour later Naruto and the clones were done cleaning and fixing the meditation garden and, 
While the clones moved on to work on other areas, Naruto sat down and decided to read the letters his parents left him. So he unsealed them from one of the many storage seals, among others, he kept on his sash. These storage seals are, one for weapons, one for medical supplies, one for poisons, one for important documents, where he had the deeds and inheritance still, one for weapons laced with paralyzing and disorienting poisons, it had six sections to it where all you had to do was add chakra to the section you wanted and you'd get either a senbone, kunai, or shuriken with one or the other kind of poison depending on which section he put chakra into, one with weapons laced with deadly poisons, same as the other laced weapons with only three sections this time, one with antidotes for said poisons, except the instant kills, one with a large amount of high quality sealing material, one for other things of importance such as food, water, firewood, a lighter, act, and one that had been empty that he was now going to use for money, and once he got one, the wallet he'd used to hold it in, which he had asked Tora to get one shaped like a dog if possible, and finally one for miscellaneous items. A and hey, he's still a kid, so sue me for wanting to give him a cute wallet. The last two he had added during the trip to Konoha, all in all he could store everything he needed in his sash and get rid of the need to carry items around. Along the inside of the belt was a seal to make it fireproof, a seal that made it as hard as diamond while staying as flexible as cloth, a seal that allowed the sash to grow with him so he didn't need to worry about replacing it as he got older. A seal that kept it clean and free from all forms of filth, so that he wouldn't have to hand it over to be washed and possibly never see it again, a seal that made it so that all the seals are hidden from all forms of detection even when they were in use, a seal that made it so that all the seals would only recognize and activate to slash for his chakra, and, most importantly, three self-repairing seals that, if someone managed to get through all the other seals and damage it, would not only repair the sash but also all the seals on the sash. And with three of the seals in three different places around his belt he had backups just in case one or even two of them were damaged. Opening the first letter, one that had sun on it in an obviously feminine hand, he began to read. To my dear son Naruto, in case you haven't realized this yet this letter is from your mother Kushina Uzumaki, me. I'm afraid that after having the QB ripped out of me by a mysterious masked man that I don't have much time left in this world. Know that I love you. I know that your father is going to seal the QB in you and I know that because of that you're most likely going to lead a hard life, as people can be cruel and stupid about things they're ignorant about, but try not to let it get to you too strongly. Find friends and people you can see as family who are smart enough to see you as you, not as the QB. Know that no matter what happens or what you choose to do in life that I will always be proud of you and love you, my son, and now I must go and help your father seal the QB. Take care and be safe my lovely little boy. Love. Kushina Iteben. Naruto was on the verge of crying by the time he finished the letter, he was ecstatic to know that his mother truly did love him. Taking a couple of minutes to compose himself he then opened his father's letter. Naruto, if you're reading this then Hiruzen decided it was time to tell you about your mother and I, if this is coming pretty late in your life, please don't blame the man for keeping it from you, as I requested he did so until you were at least tuning level and strength. I wanted you strong and mature enough to know about your heritage and about the contents of this letter. If you are reading this it also means that I died sealing the QB into you. I hope you can forgive me for it, but no matter how much it pains me I am a Hokage before I am a father, and what kind of cage can ask his people to do what he himself can't. I wish I could be there for you, but hopefully you've been raised with love even without me and your mother there. Now I have something very important that I need to tell you, so pay close attention. On the day of your birth, Shortly after your birth when your mother's seal was at its weakest, a mysterious orange masked man claiming to be Madara Uchiha appeared and took you hostage, demanding your mother in return for you. An the story of what happened goes the same as in canon, so if you want to know the rest look it up, I'm sure that the masked man will return, and he'll be after you as the new Jinchuriki of the QB. So please be careful, get strong, and stay safe. Know that I love you and will always be proud of you, even if you hate me for sealing the QB into you. Your father. Minato, P.S. I hope you didn't inherit your mother's verbal tick, as she was praying you wouldn't the entire time she was pregnant with you. Once again on the verge of tears, Naruto quickly closed his eyes and took deep breaths to calm himself down. After a couple minutes he was once again calm, and reopening his eyes to see Tora return, he made several more clones that grabbed the stuff from him and put them in their proper places and one to grab some of the money from the safe he had paused in cleaning the meditation garden to open a little over 15 minutes ago so he could pay him back. Shortly after that the clones that he had made to check the inside and outside of the house, the ones charged with the gate, and the ones who went through the basement for seals, came to him and, handing him the lists, dispelled themselves, giving him a memory of the lists without the need to read them. He had the lists made so that if he felt like he was forgetting one later he could go over them, 
he then made 60 new clones and charged them with repairing all the seals that needed maintenance, as they would need the chakra levels of fresh clones to repair them all. He was shocked by the sheer amount of seals on and in the house, not to mention the ones on the gate. Protection seals of all kinds, trap seals for thieves, and assassins, repelling seals to deflect chakra-related attacks, and even maintenance seals, which had been overwhelmed and broken without humans there to help and maintain them. The biggest surprise came from the seals in the basement. There were seals meant to make the giant basement, which he quickly realized was a training area, able to sustain the apocalypse without problems. It was obviously the place where his parents practiced their most dangerous and secret jutsus, and he was happy to know almost all those seals were still in excellent condition as some of them were beyond his level still. All in all no one was getting into their property or house without their permission. Having finished going over all the facts in his head he made two clones. One he handed the lists and told it to go to the study and put them where other seal-related scrolls were. The other he ordered to get a sample of blood from Yui and Asahi and then add both of them to the seals on the house and gate so they could enter at will. Over the next three hours his clones gradually dispelled giving him their memories. He now knew the house had five bedrooms, the master, which would be his and his hounds, Yui and Asahi insisted on it, was large with a king-sized bed, two end tables with lamps on them, a chest at the foot of the bed, a vanity probably his mom's, a desk, and a walk-in closet. Naruto took all his parents' clothes and stored them in a storage scroll, and then put it in a drawer in the desk, the whole thing was completely empty some reason, because he wanted to keep them for sentimental reasons. The only other items in the room were his mother's jewelry and journal, and some photos, which he kept right where they were. It also had a joint bathroom with an enormous shower and equally a huge bath. This bedroom and two other large ones, if not as large, that also had large, but not as large, connected bathrooms made up the entire third floor. Asahi and Yui would be taking these bedrooms, once they replaced the nursery with furniture that matched the other room, the sight of that made the clones that saw it almost go into hysterics. In the nursery the only things Naruto would be keeping would be the stuffed toad, fox, and dog that had been in his crib, and the photo of his parents, with his mother showing to be far along in her pregnancy on the table next to it, the closest thing he will ever have to a family photo which he had already moved into his room. The rest he already had clones removed from the room, store into scrolls, and hand to Tora so that he could sell them and then use the scrolls again to buy furniture that matched the other room. Yui insisted on it, saying having one room with different furniture from every other room in the house would mess up the elegance of the house, they could always personalize it with decorations and such later. The other room had a queen-sized bed, a nightstand with a lamp on it, a good-sized dresser, and a desk. When Yui said that she liked the view she got from the room's window, Asahi said she could have it. Naruto then insisted on giving her the vanity that was in his room, which she happily accepted. Soon enough, with the exception of Asahi's room, for which they were still waiting on the furniture for, Naruto had a complete map of the rest of the house and its contents in his head. The second floor had two guest bedrooms and a bathroom on one side, and the study and armory took up the other side. The study was obviously his father's, it had all his notes on Fu and Jutsu his special Hiroshin kunai, a large amount of cage-related paperwork that one of the Naruto clones took the obligation of storing it all in a storage scroll and taking it to Ina to deliver to the Hokage without feeling the need to ask the original before returning to work. It also had his father's journal and a whole shelf full of books and scrolls on few and jutsu, various daijutsu and kenjutsu styles, and other things of interest. It had been disorganized when the clones started going through it, but it was now extremely well organized, and Asahi and Yui both said they had no interest in it. So Naruto took it as his own. The armory had a mind-boggling amount of shuriken, kunai, senbon, fuma shuriken, and ninja wire all stored in their own personal labeled storage scrolls, telling them how much of what was in each. Just to make sure the weapon stayed maintained while in the scrolls the clones unsealed each scroll one by one and confirmed their contents were still in perfect condition. There were also two swords which were obviously the Namikaze and Uzumaki clan swords respectively. He added a new seal to the last open space in his belt and put them into it but told himself he wouldn't use them until he learned both clans kenjutsu styles. A N new request, I know almost nothing about weapons, so if you guys could give me descriptions of what you want both of Naruto's new clan swords to look like, I'll take the ones I like the most for both and describe them in later chapters. For other weapons, there were also two tantas made of chakra conductive metal, which he gave to Asahi when asked as the man was amazing at kenjutsu and specialized in a double short sword style. He had only been allowed to use bokens since his capture, but if his warm-up with his new swords was any indication it hadn't dulled his skills much. One chakra conductive bostaff, which he gave to Yui as she had always wanted to learn how to use a weapon and it seemed to suit her perfectly. And finally an assortment of different kinds of daggers and knives which seemed to be a collection of some sort, 
since they knew there was no way some of them could be used in actual combat. There were also various oils, polishing cloths, and whetstones needed to maintain the weapons, more than enough to last years, if not longer. As for books and scrolls, there was at least the basics of five different styles each for each weapon present. Yui quickly started reading one of the ones for Bojustu, and an amazing amount for at least the basics of over 20 different Daijutsu styles, and up to the advanced styles of 10 of them. The first floor was composed of the kitchen, a descent-sized dining room, a large living room, the library, another bathroom, without a tub or shower, a pantry, and a reasonably sized closet for cleaning supplies and such. The library was filled with books about everything previously mentioned and more, including many of the things Naruto learned while in Orochimaru's lab with more on each subject. As for the flower and herb gardens, they were chock full of useful, and often expensive, flowers and herbs that could be used to make medicines, salves, and poisons, some of which are extremely valuable as they are incredibly potent. Just as Naruto finished giving everyone a tour of the property, I already covered the basement, Tora showed up with the new furniture, and, after being paid what they still owed despite the stuff he sold first, they all moved the furniture into Asahi's room. After they finished putting their new clothes away in their respective rooms, except for one pair each, they all went to their bathrooms to wash. Naruto, of course, washed his hounds first, using the puppy shampoo Tora got from the Inuzuka's pet store. Tora also got special puppy chow, three dog bowls, dog treats, special fur-friendly doggy towels, new collars, no name tags, and chew toys for them. He thoroughly washed all three in the bathtub with warm water as he'd already decided he'd only be using the shower anyway. After all three hounds were clean and dried off with the doggy towels, he put their new collars on them. After putting new flea and tick repellent and gravity seals on them and setting them to the level they were at, they can deactivate and activate them themselves by removing or adding chakra to them, but not set the levels they're at. The colors of the collars match the main color of their fur respectively, and therefore were hard to notice as they had no metal on them in order to prevent them from flashing in sources of light. After Naruto finished taking a shower of his own and dressing in his new clothes, minus the sash, that, since he wasn't planning of doing any training for the day as it was already time to prepare dinner, and he didn't feel like training at night yet, wasn't his standard robe as Asahi called it. With that thought in mind he was wearing one of the few non-robes he had asked for, other than some comfortable pajamas, he got three all-black tops, and two pairs of black shinobi pants, he decided to go barefoot but he normally wore black shinobi saddles, and didn't have Tora get him anything other than another couple of new pairs. And of course he tied his sash over the pants. He headed down, poured his hounds their food, and, after asking Tora and Inu if they'd join in and getting no's in response, they'd be going home since they were only told to be there during the day, less as guards and more as errand boys, he started cooking enough yakisoba for three. Soon after he finished Yui and Asahi came down, Asahi normally dressed exactly like Naruto was right now, and this time was no different, Yui, on the other hand, was dressed in a blue kimono with falling snowflakes all over it, she usually went with more battle-oriented ones with shorts under them when training or something like that. They all sat down at the dining room table and began eating, pausing occasionally to talk some, Asahi about accustoming himself to his swords, Yui about a bow just as style that would work perfectly with her bloodline, and Naruto simply listening to them and occasionally commenting. Once dinner was finished Naruto decided he had something he needed to do so he said, I'm going to meditate at the garden, please don't disturb me unless it's important. Sure thing, kiddo, just don't stay out there too late or you'll have Yui after you, Asahi said. And what, exactly, do you mean by that? Yui asked in a slightly peeved tone. Exactly what I said, of course Asahi said bluntly, and thus another old married couple argument started, which prompted Naruto to leave, and the hounds to go to their new room. Walking over to the meditation pond, Naruto sat down and began to meditate, soon entering his mindscape. His mindscape, when he had first entered it, had looked like a sewer, a dank, leaky, dark, sewer. After a little mental work however, his mindscape now looked like what he had always imagined a forest would look like, with mountains not far off and the sound of a waterfall leading into a river coming from them. As he looked around he realized that while the land was highly accurate, the sky was way too blue and the sun a bit too dull, and the scents were off too, so he closed his eyes and focused, and when he opened them again things were as they should be. Nodding in satisfaction. Naruto headed for the nearby mountain range, and soon reached a giant cage that reached halfway up the mountain it was on and was nearly as wide. Looking through the bars one could see that the entire mountain was hollow on the inside, and that it looked like a really comfortable den with a huge bed of grass, a small waterfall feeding water into a large pool, and no sharp rocks or stalagmites to deal with. This was the residence of the Kubi no Yoko, or, as Naruto knew him, 
Karama, soon enough said Demon Fox walked up from a deeper part of the cave to the gate itself. He truly was an enormous beast, easily the size of the Hokage Monument, with teeth and claws the length and size of Naruto himself and orange red fur. After what seemed like an hour-long staring contest one of them spoke. So, miracle of miracles, we're finally out of that hellhole, Karama said in a deep, resounding voice. Yes, yes we are, and now that we are I can convert that seal of yours into a collar or anklet so you can run around freely without the risk of Snake Face noticing something different with the seal, Naruto replied. Ah yes, and I will finally give you the next ability you receive as my host after an even more rapid healing ability than your Uzumaki blood gives you which is negative emotion sensing, Karama said in satisfaction at the thought of being able to run through the forest that was his host's mind. I'd appreciate it, not everyone in this village can be categorized as enemy or not like at the lab, and I can't exactly go running around with my dojutsu active all the time to read people or they'd look at me funny, Naruto replied. He then added, and technically you already gave me a gift when you helped me save the pups. Flashback no jutsu. Naruto was bored. Usually when they wanted to take his blood for yet another one of their tests they'd just do it, but now they left him all alone in the lab just sitting there waiting for them. So he decided to go to the room they'd stepped into and see if he could listen in without getting caught, as they'd left the door slightly ajar. Getting close enough to listen and he heard the head doctor say, this time we will be injecting number 23's genes into a freshly seated female hound, using the sperm of an Inusuka hound to help chances of survival. As all animals we have attempted this on died from some complication or another before the fetuses had a chance to fully develop, this will be our last attempt one way or another. As soon as I finish preparing her, I will go get a fresh sample from number 23 to use. Backing away with wide eyes, Naruto quickly went back to the chair he was supposed to be sitting in and desperately mentally said Karama is there anything we can do, having given the fox access to his senses shortly after meeting him the fox heard exactly what Naruto did. Thinking for what seemed to be a very long time Karama finally said, there is one way kit, but it's highly risky and not guaranteed to work. What is it? Naruto asked. While taking your blood sample we inject as much of our chakra as possible into it and with our chakra mixed with the natural healing abilities of your blood it will likely save the pups. The mother will still die but the pups won't, Karama said. Okay, so the risks are that it won't be enough and that the head doctor might notice, though I doubt it as he isn't the least bit chakra sensitive. Any others? Naruto asked. No, but there will be benefits, if the pups survive, they will have no more of our chakra left in their systems, as they will have used it all up to survive, but due to having our chakra in their systems while in the womb they will be smarter than even an Inuzuka hound, will live as long as an Inuzuka hound, will quite possibly be stronger and faster than even an Inuzuka hound, and there might be other things we can't even imagine from it, Kurama replied. The head doctor stepped out of the room and approached Naruto with a needle in hand, making Naruto have to make a split-second decision. Let's do it, he thought, getting a grunt in the affirmative from Kurama, they did just that. Four months later it worked, with all expected results, and more, though they kept it all a secret of course, Naruto was happy he at least managed to save the pups, if not their mother. Flashback no jutsu end. Anklet please, is all Kurama said in reply, feeling embarrassed Naruto said all that to him. At which Naruto once again closed his eyes and focused. Soon enough the gate that held Kurama caged in his den turned into sparkly golden lights that swirled around Kurama's right forehand paw, and soon turned into a simple leather band that had the seal on it. Walking out of the now gateless cave Kurama took a deep breath of forest air and said, Well it's not true freedom, but I'll take what I can get. Thanks Kit. No problem, Kurama, if it weren't for your healing and advice over the years I'd be dead right now, it's too bad I can't start working on mastering your chakra yet. Not only is the seal still not loose enough for you to send much more than what was needed to heal me safely, there's also the fact that if I started using it before I at least hit puberty, it could cause permanent damage to my chakra coils, Naruto said in reply. True Kit, I'm glad I decided to give you that chance when you asked for my friendship when you showed up in front of me in a near-death state three years ago. You are the best host I could ask for. If I was asking for a host rather than true freedom anyway. You always ask rather than take, you believed me when I said I actually prefer peace over blood and death unless threatened, despite the fact I do hate humans in general, and that I never chose to attack your village either time, but was actually forced to by those damned Uchiha. You even changed my cage to be as comfortable as possible until you could let me out of it more completely, showing your trust in me at the same time. Kurama's voice sounded gruff, but Naruto could see all sorts of emotions swimming through his eyes. So all he did was nod in reply. Alright then enough mushy stuff, now I start training you in the use of the new ability I'm about to give you, it will sting since I'll be sending some of my chakra into you to give it to you. Getting a nod in reply, Kurama pushed a small amount of his chakra into Naruto, 
who hissed out his breath in pain but otherwise seemed unaffected. After a couple of minutes it was over and Kurama said, So, let's begin, shall we? Chapter 4, Reception Village Gate, Next Day, Early Morning Izumo and Kotetsu, commonly known and referred to as the Eternal Gate Guards, were, as usual, playing a game of cards and barley paying attention to their duty. Also as usual, Kotetsu was complaining about their job. Despite the fact that 9 times out of 10 he chooses this job to be with his best friend. Man, nothing ever happens while doing this job, so boring, he said, drawing out the O and boring for a time. What do you mean nothing ever happens? Just a little over 2 weeks ago the Hokage himself came with a contingent of Anbu, how can you call that nothing? And even if that wasn't true you should take your duties more seriously, Izuma scolded, you never know when something might happen. Just then, as though he had tempted fate. A large man came charging up towards the gate at high speeds, to the point he was almost a blur. Noticing this and exchanging wary glances, Izumo and Kotetsu stood up and called out a challenge to the blur. Halt, stop running at those speeds and state your business, they called out together, hoping to get strength from one another. The man, realizing that despite his status he would get in trouble if he ignored the gate guard's hails, slowed down and came to a stop in front of them no matter how much he wanted to just continue on. As soon as he did they were gaping and thinking, I think Izumo slash I might have tempted fate, at the same time. They were doing this because the man standing in front of them was none other than Jiraiya, the legendary Toad Sage. Yo, sorry about worrying you like that, I'm just in a rush to meet Sarutobi Sensei, so can we maybe do the sign in real quick, please, Jiraiya said, showing his impatience. Izumo and Kotetsu could do nothing but nod, walk back the booth, check is it, and let Izumo say in a kind of dazed voice, you're all good, go ahead and enter. Jiraiya nodded, and, as soon as the gate was open, entered and sunshine to the window of his sensei's office. Despite the seriousness of the topic he wanted to discuss with the man, old habits die hard, and the annoyance the old man showed whenever he entered this way was too fun to pass up. So, after getting an annoyed enter from his sensei, he came in through the window. As soon as he entered he stood in front of his sensei's desk and asked at a rapid pace, is it true you found him? Where was he? How is he? Before I say anything I need you to calm down. I was excited to have found him too, but we are trying to keep the information secret until after the Shinobi Council meets him and the others we saved later today," Hiruzen said strictly, then added, after that we will have no choice but to announce it before the Civilian Council catches wind of it and spreads lies and rumors to fan the flames of hatred in those who've forgotten it. So if you want to talk calm down and put up your strongest silencing seal, Jiraiya. Realizing the fact his sensei was dead serious, took deep breaths to calm himself and then took out an already prepared silence seal. He looked at his sensei, who signaled for his Anbu to leave them alone in the office. Putting it on the wall, he activated it and watched as a blue glow filled the room and especially the seams and cracks for the windows and door. Alright Sarutobi sensei, could you please tell me about my godson now, Jiraiya said, he was much calmer now but obviously still impatient. We found him, it turns out it was Orochimaru that took him. At Jiraiya's curse Hiruzen nodded, it is most likely as bad as you are imagining, he had been experimented on practically from the moment my former student got his fangs in him. Luckily he shows no loyalty and actually quite a bit of hatred for the man, so we were able to save him and some of the other people Orochimaru had at the lab and bring them to Konoha. They actually just arrived yesterday. You mentioned they were meeting the Shinobi Council today and then you would announce his presence right, getting a nod from Hiruzen, he continued, then I guess I'll wait to meet him personally after the meeting. Where is he staying and what is his relationship with the others you mentioned? His relationship with them is that they all consider him and he considers them family. I'll give you these copies of all their profiles so you can know how to handle meeting them. Burn them after you memorize them though, we don't want that information getting into the wrong hands. Oh, and make sure to be especially careful with Yui San as she has no tolerance for perverts and is known to use her bloodline to give them minor frostbite in very uncomfortable areas, seeing Jiraiya pale slightly and hold his hands protectively over his groin at that information. Hiruzen continued, as for where they're staying, as he was told of his family I gave him the deed to the Namikaze compound since it isn't very well known and he knows not to go around telling people about his parents or whose house it was before him. Jiraiya nodded in understanding at that, there really was no point in denying him his inheritance if he already knows and he's responsible enough not to go around telling people, though he did have one question what about this family of his? If you're asking if they know this well, they do, if you're asking if they'll keep it secret, of course they will. Yui looks at Naruto like a son and Asahi like a little brother, despite being old enough to be his father, if only just barely. They would never endanger his life like that, Hiruzen replied. Since I don't really find this important to the storyline I realized I never bothered to mention either of their ages. 
Yui is 31 years old and Asahi is 28. Jiraiya nodded his understanding and asked, Should I be present at the council meeting while hidden or can you handle things on your own? I think I can handle things on my own. But you should be there as his godfather just in case things gets too rough for him. Hiruzen replied, Alright then, until then I guess I'll stick to reading these guys' files, Jiraiya replied, and sat down on one of the chairs in the office to do just that. Naruto's house, one hour later, 30 minutes before the council meeting, Naruto yawned. Despite the fact that he had gone to bed at a reasonable time to everyone else he had actually stayed awake in his mindscape almost the entire night training in his new sensory abilities, with only a small amount of progress. And while his physical body got plenty of rest as it was asleep, he was now mentally tired from lack of rest in that department. Not without good reason and some results, of course. He was now able to accurately sense the negative emotions of people in the same room as him, with no need to actually focus on the ability. But that wasn't nearly good enough. According to Kurama, Uzumaki Mito, his first Jin Chiriki, was able to accurately sense people throughout a quarter of the entire village when she wanted to, and a little over 12 feet of area without thinking about it or focusing on it. She was even able to sense positive emotions to a much weaker extent and lesser range. A and accurately as in they're able to tell whose emotions they're sensing, individual people rather than just a general sense of a uniformed entity, of course they might have no idea as to who the person is personally. Just because they can sense an individual person doesn't mean that they recognize who the person is, and that is an entirely made-up range for Mito, as far as I know anyway. At least now he'll be able to tell if the people at the council or in the area around him had bad intentions for him or his family. And besides, he had an advantage over Mito in the fact that she naturally gained the ability from Kurama just by being his Jin Chiriki, and had to learn and train in it all on her own. Naruto, on the other hand, was on good terms with Kurama and is therefore receiving training in his ability from the fox. Yawning once more Naruto finished the last of the breakfast Yui cooked, as she was a decent cook, not as good at Naruto, who usually cooked their meals for them ever since they met in the lab, but good enough to make a simple breakfast and save a tired Naruto from the risk of burning it or himself. Finishing his breakfast and realizing he still had about 20 minutes before they were summoned to the council room, Naruto took his mother's journal out of the important document seal on his sash, opened it to where he bookmarked it, and began reading. Fifteen minutes later on the dot Inu and Tora appeared from where they'd been watching the house and told them it was time to go, and, since they knew where they were going this time, they all shunshine there themselves. An question about that. Can the Inuzuka hounds use jutsu other than fang over fang and their collaboration jutsu with their partners or can they not? I'm going to make mine able to use shunshine and kawarimi, since those can be taught and used without hand seals, it's just harder, and I'm not going to change that. But if the others can't then I'll make it a special condition from the experiment done on them. Appearing in front of the Hokage Tower, they allowed the two Anbu to lead them to the council meeting room, and, once they got there, waited outside as Inu went in to announce their presence. A couple minutes later Inu stuck his head out the door and nodded to them, so they headed in. Yui and Asahi looked at the occupants of the room nervously, Naruto hid his nervousness behind a seemingly cold mask. After all, these were the people who had very strong say in their fate. At the same time as he was looking them over, Naruto was also examining the emotions of the people in the room, including the hidden ones. The Hyuga seemed to feel slightly hostile towards them, but from what Kurama and he could put together the hostility was more like a worry over whether he was a threat rather than anything personal. The Aburame held no negative emotions toward him. The Inuzuka seemed to be feeling nervous and somewhat frustrated by something. The Yamanaka seemed to feel guilt toward him probably from what he got from Naruto's mind the day before. The Akimichi also held no negative emotions toward him. And the Nara was currently half asleep if his expression was anything to go by, and therefore hard to read. And finally Hiruzen was nervous and worried, probably about how the others were going to react. As for the hidden people of the room most of them were Anbu and therefore just as stoic as the Aburame with their emotions. But there seemed to be one more signature in the room that was standing right behind Hiruzen hidden that was giving off an enormous amount of guilt directed at Naruto and anger that seemed to be directed at no one in the room. He stared at the spot that signature was coming from for a while getting a surprised look from Hiruzen. He looked at the man silently asking with his eyes if he should ignore the signature and got an almost imperceptible nod in return, so he returned to examining the visible people in the room. While they looked at the council the council looked at them. They only gave cursory glances over Yui and Asahi and then focused on Naruto and his hounds. Practically as soon as their scent had entered the room, Kuramaru had stiffened, he recognized who their father was alright. Stiffly walking up to the pups he gave them each a thorough sniffing over while they returned the courtesy. Um, excuse me, but is there a problem? Naruto asked, looking at the hound that was sniffing his warily. No, 
we all heard what happened to you and Kuramaru is trying to see by scent whether or not he knows their father, Tsume tried to reassure the boy, but was actually making Naruto's worry worse. And what happens if he does, you're not going to take them away are you, Naruto asked, concerned, and, hearing this, his hounds either whined worriedly or growled defiantly depending on their personalities. No, I can tell that the pups are bonded to you, it would be cruel to separate you now. I would, however, like to offer to train all of you, basically teaching you everything an Inusuka learns that you can do. You're a little old to be starting, and the pups need to be at least a couple months older to start soldier pill and other chakra necessary training, but we could at least start with the basics, Tsume told him. Naruto looked down at his hounds, they had already grown bored of Kuramaru sniffing them and were now ignoring him, so they looked up and met Naruto's eyes. He met each of their eyes and, after a couple minutes of deliberation said, we would be honored Inuzuka-sama. Sume-san or Tsume-sensei's fine, Gaki. Shortly after Tsume got a nod of acknowledgement from Naruto, Kuramaru growled in anger, though it was obvious to everyone in the room that the anger was not directed at any of them. So she asked, what's wrong Kuramaru, is it something about who their father is? Yeah it's about that, their father is me, Kuramaru said in a growl. What, huh, how, oh yeah. We did get separated temporarily around that time where I later found you unconscious for seemingly no reason, there were no suspicious sights, scents, or sounds in the area so I kind of forgot. Damn, Tsume said in a shocked tone drawing out the A and damn for a while. A and as you might have already guessed, I don't like writing in stuttering or drawn out vowels. But we'll mention the fact that someone does it. The rest of the council was shocked as well, after all. Kuromaru was an extremely unique Inuzuka hound in the fact that he could use human speech rather than simply understand it. If Naruto's pups truly are Kuromaru's offspring there is a chance they have or will develop his ability to speak, don't you think? Hiruzen asked curiously. Hearing this they all looked at Naruto and his hounds, who all seemed stunned to know that their father was the one standing in front of them. But Naruto kept his senses about him and noticed the looks they were given so he replied, I'm sorry if this disappoints you but they've never shown any signs of having the ability to speak, which was true, they simply didn't have to know about his added thought, at least not out loud. That's fine, I did not develop the ability to speak until after I was fully matured, so there is still a chance they could develop this ability later, Kuromaru said. He honestly didn't know what to think about this development, he had never planned on having pups, ever. He was just too, unusual of a hound to think of taking a mate and having pups with her. Not only that but he didn't know what kind of affect the things that made him the way he is would have on any pups. And now he not only had pups, but they had been experimented on, so who knows what they'll grow up to become with not only his genes but those of a rather unusual human as well. Putting that aside for now, we have other things to discuss as well, Shibi said in his usual stoic voice, while he admitted he was somewhat curious about the pups, he was far more interested in their partner. The boy was not only descended from two of the village's strongest shinobi, he also had multiple bloodlines. Shibi wanted to know the boy's usefulness to the village in general, and also wanted to see what the boy was going to do about his origin since he knows. Yes, yes, of course, Hiruzen said, then added, Well then, since I'm sure this is what we're all the most curious about, why don't each of you give a list of your skill sets and what you believe their levels would be? I'll go first, Asahi said, then cleared his throat and continued, Well first and foremost would be my specialization, Kenjutsu. Before my capture I'd say I was high on the level, but now, without the proper practice or opponents to practice against I'd say I'm more likely high jonin low on bu level. For ninjutsu I'd be low to mid jonin level. For taijutsu I'd say I'm mid jonin level. Genjutsu I'd have to say high chunin level. Few ninjutsu I can make storage scrolls and explosive notes and don't plan on learning any more than that. That's it for me. I guess I'll go next, Yuri said. My specialty would be ninjutsu where I have to say I'm low jonin level without using my bloodline and mid to high jonin level with my bloodline. I am only just starting to learn bojutsu and have no skills in any other weapons than a standard kunai and shuriken. Taijutsu is probably my weakest point where I'm either high chunin low jonin level. Genjutsu I'm low jonin level, but I honestly don't use it very often unless in collaboration with my bloodline, so it might actually be mid to high chunin level without the use of my bloodline. Few injutsu I have no interest in and only learn to make the most basic storage scrolls and don't plan on going any further with. I guess I'm last then, huh? Naruto said. For ninjutsu it would be easier for me to categorize by element and bloodline, so this'll take a while. I'd have to say I was most likely a natural futon type as that element comes easiest to me. I know 5B and A class win jutsus, 1S class, and 10D to C rank, 
and have mastered up to waterfall splitting and elemental manipulation. For Sutna I'd have to say I probably would have had a strong secondary affinity to it as well, I know 3B to A rank Jutsu, no S ranks, and 8D to C rank. I have completed the second stage of elemental manipulation for this and am starting on the third with some difficulty. He stopped for a minute to catch his breath, for Kat and I have only 1A and B rank each and 4D to C rank Jutsus, and have also only barely managed to master the first stage of elemental manipulation. For Dota and I know 5B to A rank Jutsus and 4D to C rank, I have almost mastered the second stage of elemental manipulation, but I'm having a small amount of trouble with it. Rayton is by far my worst element which makes sense if my theory about originally being a wind type is true. I only know 1B rank and 3D to C rank jutsu for this element, and I'm struggling with the first stage of elemental manipulation. He once again stopped for a minute, this time to give his audience a couple minutes to process his main elemental abilities and knowledge, then continued, my best bloodlines would have to be my Hyotan, Makuten, and my Shikatsumyaku. Yui Obasan says that I'm so good at controlling ice and freezing water that I might as well be a natural born Yuki. While I'm not ready yet for the most advanced levels of this bloodline's Jutsus, I am well on my way. With my Makuten I have almost as much of an affinity for using it as my Hyotan, but unfortunately don't truly know how good I am with it as I was only allowed to learn the Moku Bunshine and work with a decent sized garden to give me an understanding of how to control and feel plants of various types and sizes due to the destructive nature of most of the techniques, along with other general plant knowledge. He made yet another pause to catch his breath, for Shikatsumyaku. I have good control over my bone density and manipulation, but still have some trouble with my ability to pull them out of my body properly, other than my bone blades I get from my wrists. As for my hounds the only thing I know how to do with them is the Jujin Bunshine, and that's only because I read about it in one of my books on various Bunshine. He paused for a minute and thought, actually, if you count my knowledge of Bunshines into my elemental jutsu list you can add one more D to C ranked jutsu to each element as I know each elemental Bunshine including those of my sub-elements. Pausing to wait for them to nod to that fact, he continued after they did, my mastery over Jintan is also very good, I can last for 15 minutes using it without causing strain on my body and the powers of perception my momagan gives me helps me a lot. My Yotan I have only mixed success with, I can make the lava with no problem or damage to myself. But other than my Yotan Bunshine and Yotan, Lava Globs, I have almost no talent with it. And finally with my Rantan I have no talent or skill whatsoever for it, most likely because of the Rantan element that makes up a part of it, the only move I have any success in is Rantan, Laser Circus, and even then it's far weaker than it should be. A and yes, the majority of Jutsus will be in English, with the exception of ones that sound crappy in English like Bunshine techniques and Jutsus like Chidori and Rasengan. As for my other talents I'd say in Kenjutsu I'm low to mid chunin. For daggers, which are my more preferred weapons, I'm high chunin level. With other weapons I know how to use them well enough to not hurt myself or others unless I mean to and can even use some of them proficiently enough to get into a fight with them and be comfortable about it, but not as much as the two I mentioned. I am at most high non level with them. I am also able to use chakra flow in them with my futon and doden elements as long as the weapon can handle it. He once again paused for breath, I'm able to break any genjutsu I want due to my momagan, but I'm probably only high non, maybe low chunin in casting them, despite my chakra control being good. I have a minor talent for area jutsu, but nothing beyond the ability to heal bruises and cuts and help set bones or numb pain. In few and jutsu I'm level 8 so if you go by normal standards I'm on my way to mastery with them, but if you go by Uzumaka standards, I'm still at apprentice level. He finished, leaving many of them shocked at the skill level this 9 year old child had. A and there you go all you people who worried about an overpowered Naruto, a full summary of all his abilities and overall level. I don't plan on increasing his knowledge or abilities in Yotan or Rantan and only add one or two higher level Jutsus to the Katan and Raten element as he will have little talent or power with them beyond the ability to use them. That is a very good skill set, especially for one so young, but I'm curious as when I read some of the head doctor's notes I noticed that he mentioned you came in contact with your tenant, do you have any control over its powers? Kiyoshi asked. Naruto scanned the man's emotions, and from them he determined, with a little help from Kurama, that he was not doing this out of a desire to control Naruto for his power but because he felt threatened by Naruto's level of power. He determined how he was going to answer the question from there. I don't think I'm going to be using his power anytime soon, Naruto stated, which was completely true after all, they'd just most likely interpret it differently. What about the fact you've talked to it, Tsume asked curiously, she'd been too lazy to read through the whole thing and was therefore surprised by this news. Well if you count traded insults and curse words as a conversation, Naruto said slowly. This was, once again, true, though a more stretched truth. 
they did regularly trade insults and use curse words. But it was in a playful, almost brotherly way and out of frustration when things go wrong than out of any form of malice. Once again if they interpret it wrong, which they most likely would, it wasn't really his fault. They all nodded in understanding at that, after all it was pretty much what they were expecting him to say. It's not like they were wrong about it being nothing more than a being of extreme power and malice, right? A and lol, yup, right, lol. Naruto breathed an inner sigh of relief, he really didn't want anyone knowing of his and Kurama's relationship. After all they wouldn't believe the fact that he was actually good, well, not bad anyway, and would probably lock him up assuming he was being controlled by the fox, or at least be highly suspicious of them. So he was very relieved that they'd interpreted things the way he wanted them to. He knew he'd have to tell at least Hiruzen eventually, especially when he can start training and using Kurama's chakra, but eventually was not any time soon. The next question I'm sure you all can't seem to straight out ask him and worry that you'd revel something you shouldn't, I'll answer for you. Since you know he knows who his parents were, you're wondering what he's going to be doing about it, receiving nods from all the members of the council, he answered, other than receiving his inheritance, which he will only be using his mother's half of the fortune for now. He will not be doing anything about his origins. He has already agreed to only go by Uzumaki for now and wait to announce his Namikaze blood and exactly who his parents were until he's strong enough to take care of himself. Getting nods of understanding from the clan heads he asked the room, any other questions? When can you start training kid? Tsume asked Naruto. Not for a couple weeks at least Tsume sensei, I want things to settle down first, Naruto replied, getting a nod of understanding from the woman. Seeing that there were no more questions Hiruzen said. It seems like we are finished here, the meeting is over, know that I will be announcing Naruto's return to the village at noon in a couple of hours, noticing the worry some of the clan heads had over that fact he elaborated, I do this so that it can be done in a simple manner rather than what would happen if those fools on the civilian council learned of his return before the village as a whole does they would blow the whole thing out of proportion. Getting nods of understanding from everyone present he repeated, good meeting dismissed. Remember that all that you've heard here today except Naruto's return and Yui and Asahi's identities is an S-class secret, though. Getting nods of understanding from everyone they all filed out to head home, Inu and Tora appearing only to shunshine away with their charges right afterwards. Hiruzen sat in the now quiet and empty, minus his Anbu guards, council room for a couple of minutes, ponderously puffing on his pipe as he thought about what could possibly happen a couple of hours from now. Finally letting out a particularly large puff of smoke out with a sigh. Hiruzen finally got up and walked out of the room as well, all the while hoping his village would be accepting an understanding of the young boy who had already been through too much in his young life, but knowing they might not. Village Square, front of Hokage Tower, time for announcement. Hiruzen stood on the roof of the Hokage Tower looking down on the citizens and shinobi of the village of Konoha, doing last-minute reviews of his speech and subtly checking to make sure the Anbu he assigned for crowd control were in position before walking into view of his people and raising his hand in a silent command slash request for silence. Silence which was a few minutes coming as everyone was anxiously trying to figure out why there was a city-wide announcement going on, excluding anyone 15 or younger, as long as they weren't Jonin or Anbu anyway. When the crowd had silenced to Ruzin cleared his throat and subtly activated the voice projection seals he had set up all around the square so that even the people in the furthest back sections of the square could hear him. With the seal activated he knew that it was time to start his announcement. People of Konoha I called you here today to announce the return of a civilian we long thought lost or dead to us. Hiruzen began, once again raising his hand to silence the disconcerted rumblings of the crowd. I am glad to say that our village Jinchuriki and Hiro, Naruto Uzumaki, has been found and saved from his captors after nine long years of him being missing. He has gone through much trauma at the hands of his captors, but remains surprisingly stable despite that, and will soon be able to join the academy with his age group after a couple of follow-up tests, Hiruzen continued, bracing himself for the unknown reactions of his people. Silence, dead silence echoed through the entire square as people took the time necessary to comprehend what was just told to them. And then there were cries of anger and outrage from a thankfully small majority of the crowd. About a fourth of the civilians, perhaps slightly more, were actually showing honest anger toward Naruto's return, about an eighth of that was showing any hostility by calling for his blood. The rest of the civilians were looking either uncaring, as they had had time to lay down their grief and therefore their hostility, and the rest looked, displeased but not angry or hostile. Like they would act towards a dog they're not entirely sure is fully tamed or not and need time to see how they should treat it or not. The shinobi, of course, were mainly neutral. Having been forced to learn at least the basics of sealing in special required classes for everyone of shinobi rank after their, not so good reactions to the first time this had been announced, 
they knew the difference between a kunai and the scroll that was sealed in. Some were ecstatic as they had taken their lessons one step further and knew of the political and military power having a gene Churiki would give them, even if it's a young one. Hiruzen was internally both sighing in relief over how good a majority of the villagers were reacting while also frowning worriedly about the group reacting badly. Subtly hand signing a message to one of his Anbu guard with the order to tell all Anbu on crowd control to memorize the angry and hostile one's faces and give him a full profile on each of them later. He let the crowd have time to go through their emotions to give his Anbu a chance to follow his orders. After five minutes of allowing the crowd freedom to talk and react amongst themselves Hiruzen noticed his Anbu signal that the faces have had a picture taken of them. Seeing this he once again raised his hand to gain the crowd's attention and when he did he said, Remember that my law about telling anyone of the younger generation of young Naruto's status is a crime punishable by immediate execution with the only exceptions to this rule being the Hokage, currently myself, and young Naruto himself. Do not make me need to enforce that law. Hiruzen's statement was greeted with silence, as they did in fact remember that law, seeing as how he still enforced it despite Naruto's disappearance all those years ago. That is all I had to say, so you are all free to go, Hiruzen said, and then watched as the crowd dispersed, many muttering to one another about what they just heard while others simply silently returned to their duties and obligations. No one noticed the pair of bright blue eyes watching the entire thing from a hidden corner of a building before dispelling in a small puff of smoke. Naruto's house, after the clones dispel. Naruto, once again at the house's meditation garden, only to really meditate this time, suddenly tensed as the memory of the clone he'd sent to spy on the announcement dispelled, after all he promised he wouldn't leave the house or yard, he never said anything about his clones, which he had been sending out waves of to spy on certain influential people to lean their threat level since this morning then relaxed his body while he went over all the info in his mind. It seemed like the old Hokage had been telling the truth about his shinobi, and from what he could tell he only had a fourth of the village to worry about, and only an eighth of that to consider possible hostiles, which was much better than what he expected. So what are you going to do Kit? Karam asked his host. Wait, watch, keep my guard up, make a couple dozen more clones to go out and spy on more additions to the list, but mostly wait, I wanna seem like the victim I am after all. Naruto mentally replied to his tenant. The best plan you can take, I suppose, a little boring, but understandable. Kurama replied. Yes, yes it is, hey Kurama did I react as bad as those guys when we first met? I can't entirely remember, Naruto hesitantly asked. You weren't happy, but you weren't hostile either. Then again by the time you fell into your mindscape you were as close to death as a person can be while still alive, so you were more focused on my offer for partnership for mutual survival than anything else right then. Kurama replied after a couple minutes silence. True, damn that Orochimaru team and is giving me the momagan so damn late in my life compared to the rest, I mean yeah it's useful, but not worth dying over, Naruto replied. True kit, and the very reason why I was willing to ally myself with you in order to survive the crazy bastard. I'm glad I did it for more reasons than that now, though, you're a good friend to have after all, even if you're still a kit, Kurama replied. I'm glad too Kurama. But enough of this mushy stuff it's time for me to go cook lunch, Naruto said while getting up and heading for the house. Raided Laboratory, Midnight, Orochimaru, and Kabuto. A pale-faced man with gold, silted eyes seethed in rage at the sight of his lab, his silver-haired bespectacled assistant wisely staying silent and out of the way. It was empty with nothing but blood splatters to signify what happened to the place. But that wasn't what had him seething. Almost everything in this lab was inconsequential in its loss, or even in its retrieval. No. What had him seething was the empty cell door he was standing in front of, free of any blood stains that would state the deaths of its occupants, number 23, his next vessel, and his hounds were gone. He didn't have any concrete evidence, yet, but was almost certain it was Konoha that took him, meaning he couldn't retrieve him until later without great risks to himself and his agents. He'd have to wait, so he'd have to find and take a different vessel, he was seriously pissed, and that meant bad things for his old sensei and village, very bad things. Chapter 5 Adjusting. It's been two weeks since the Hokage's announcement to the village and things are finally starting to calm down with the less rational, cough stupid cough, members of the civilian population, partially because of the fact that ones who almost broke the Hokage's law were shown the errors of their ways, showing that he and the ninja are serious about protecting the boy, and partially because the small group that was actually actively trying to be hostile to him gave up on finding where he lived. During those two weeks both Kakashi and Tenzo, as they finally learned Tora's real name is, regularly visited them in their regular shinobi apparel. They did this not only to get to know Naruto and his family better, but also to start teaching Naruto as they promised they would. Kakashi even ended up bringing his friends Gaimite and Hayate Gekko to visit. 
Guy because he knew the man would better help Naruto with his daijutsu, and Hayate because he expressed an interest in having a duel with Asahi when he mentioned his skills in Kenjutsu. Too bad Asuma wasn't here to help, with him being one of the only people in the entire Leaf Village with a wind affinity and the three of them having almost no knowledge on manipulation and fujutsus they pretty much had to leave Naruto to his own devices when it comes to learning any of that. And once again I'm not going to explain these people as appearance wise they're canon. Look it up and shave off a few years if you don't know. It's also too bad Naruto didn't take as well to them as he did to Kakashi and Tenzo. While he dutifully listened to any instructions or advice they gave him he rarely spoke to them except in reply to what they say to him, and even then the replies are as short and curt, though still polite, as possible. He found Guy's exuberant, high-paced, and eccentric way of acting slightly intimidating, and Hayate was a hard-to-read person. But since his new sensory abilities told him they held no dark emotions towards him or his family he trusted them enough to help him improve his skills and give them a chance to earn more trust than that. Sume and Kuramaru also came to visit. Knowing the pups were too young to start actively working on clan jutsu yet they focused on physical conditioning to prepare them for not only the chakra usage but also for the initial dizziness and nausea that comes from using the gutsuga, fang passing fang, and teaching the pups dynamic marking. They also taught them clan traditions, beliefs and values, seeing as how it was the pups and, as their bonded partner, Naruto's right to know them. Along with teaching Naruto how to enhance his senses so that they're much stronger than a normal human's, though as a side effect of being Kurama's Jinchuriki he had already had better senses than anyone other than any Nuzuko or Kakashi. She even made the four of them, Naruto and his hounds, honorary Inuzuka by giving Naruto a tattoo of the fang marks on their faces on his lower left arm. He found he liked the two, though he didn't fully trust them both yet, he could tell it was only a matter of time. He also found that he was extremely awkward around her two children Hana and Kiba when she brought them over though. Hana less than Kiba since she was older and more mature and he was therefore able to handle her easier. But Kiba's brash, arrogant, and childish personality grated on Naruto's nerves and he found himself hoping and even praying that not all children his age were like this or the academy was going to be hell. He did like Kiba's papa Kamaru and Hana's three Hamaru brothers a lot though. What came as a surprise to everyone? Though once they thought about it the ones who knew her realized they shouldn't have been, was that Onko Midarashi actually volunteered to help the Gaki as well. He found it easier to like, though not trust, her when he learned she had also been bitten by the snake, as they often phrased it. With Onko came Kurana Yuhi, Onko's best friend and another friend of Kakashi's, and Yuga Uzuki, Hayate's disciple and lover. Kurana came because she wanted to watch over her friend and also to see the container of the beast who killed her father and judge him herself. Yugao came because she heard from Anko where Hayate had been disappearing to. Yugao came to like spearing with Asahi and giving tips to Naruto rather easily, though Naruto treated her the same way he did Guy and Hayate. Kurunai, on the other hand, had mixed feelings, all she saw when she looked at Naruto was a child who seemed to have had a hard life, and she found she was even coming to like the kid, but that didn't stop her from hating the thing he contained. By Kakashi and Anko's request she started helping him with Genjutsu but she could tell he was wary of her. Little did she know that he was wary because while he could sense that she held nothing against him or his family, he could also sense her hatred for Kurama, and he wanted to see exactly how that hatred would lead her to treating him before he gave her any trust at all. The pups naturally took their cue on how to treat each person from Naruto. Little did anyone but them, and Kurama, know but one of the side effects of being exposed to so much of Kurama's and Naruto's chakra in the womb was a telepathic link between them. They regularly spoke to each other mentally even sometimes directly entering Naruto's mindscape to train with or talk to each other easier, though they didn't do that very often due to the mental strain it causes them. This is also one of the reasons why the pup's mental growth and development was so quick, because they could literally download anything they needed to know or understand directly from one another's brains as long as one of the others knew or understood what they needed to know or understand, which would come in very handy when they began hunting and tracking lessons with Tsume or even in a fight when they got that far in their training and the pups were old enough to handle it. Of course not everything he was learning was practical, they were also reviewing all of his academic knowledge and such to make sure he's ready for the academy when the next semester starts in a week. They quickly realized he was more than ready to pass the academy's academic section as well as the practical, but that wasn't really the reason he was going anyway. Of course his age mates have already been going to the academy for a number of years so him joining in now will probably be somewhat challenging for him. At least Kiba already considers him a friend, which, despite his annoyance with Kiba's personality, he was fine with, after he showed him who's top dog anyway. Of course he was actually more worried about the teacher's reactions to him than his age mates. He was used to having no friends, he wasn't used to the risk of teachers trying to sabotage him, 
as his teachers at the lab knew exactly what would happen to them if they even tried. Not to mention the fact that there was most likely not going to be anything they're going to be teaching that he doesn't know already to sabotage anyway. Orochimaru does not suffer fools or idiots, at all. Well, he supposed all he could do was wait and see and rely on his sensory abilities to tell him of their intentions for him. One week later, Academy. Naruto stood outside the door to the room at the Academy the sheet of paper he was tightly clutching in his hand told him he was assigned to. He's just now realized that thinking about being here and actually being here were two very different things. Thinking about it he could dispassionately point out all the things that could go wrong for him here. Here, now, standing outside the door to the place that would most likely have one off, if not the largest impacts on his new life he found he was more nervous than he'd ever been before. The pups whined, sensing his emotions and picking up at least the gist of the thoughts that spawned them. You see. For their telepathic link to fully work they actually had to be actively broadcasting their thoughts to each other, a problem they had to rectify if they ever wanted to actually use their ability in battle. But the pup swine at least managed to break Naruto out of the worst of his nervousness, allowing him to finally knock on the door he'd been staring at for the last five or six minutes. There was a short pause, and then a man, most likely his new tuning instructor, opened the door. The man examined him from head to toe, and Naruto did the same, as well as examining the man's emotions. What he felt wasn't as bad as it could have been. He felt apprehension, and a small amount of resentment, most likely from having to be the one to teach him, but otherwise he was rather neutral towards him. That's one half down, now he had to either hope that he was the main instructor rather than the assistant or that the other teacher had feelings at least similar to his. The man finally finished his inspection and asked, Are you Naruto Uzumaki? At Naruto's nod he said, Good, I thought for a minute you'd be late for the first day back at school, and your first day ever. My name is Iruka Umino, my assistant Mizuki is in the classroom, but I'm sure you don't really need a formal introduction with him anyway. Not unless you think so Umino-sensei, Naruto told him. Please I'm not really one for formalities, there's no need to use my last name, he said, visibly showing his embarrassment at Naruto's formal address to him, along with the resentment and a small amount of the apprehension he felt fade. If that's what you'd like Iruka-sensei, was all Naruto said in reply hiding the small amount of amusement he felt at Erika's reaction. With that Iruka walked back into the classroom, making a small gesture to indicate Naruto should follow him in. He walked to center of the area at the front of the auditorium-like classroom and tried to get the attention of the class. Normally he'd have a difficult time of it, but his students had noticed Naruto walk in with him, and their curiosity was enough for them to actually listen to him this time. Making sure he really did have the class's full attention, including an awake Shikamaru, he said all right class. As you can see we have a new student joining us this semester. Alright Naruto, go ahead and introduce yourself with your name, likes, dislikes, hobbies, and dreams for the future. Naruto only paid half his attention to what Hiruka was saying, the rest of his focus was on getting a feel for his classmates and Mizuki's emotions. He practically didn't have to look to feel Mizuki's emotions, the hatred the man held for him practically rolled off of him in waves, and he internally grimaced and made a mental note to never end up alone with him if he can help it. On the other hand, most of his classmates only held curiosity for him at this point in time, though he was somewhat surprised and genuinely touched by the welcoming emotions he felt from Kiba and Akamaru. Though he wasn't distracted enough not to hear what Iruka said about his introduction. And before anyone asks why they didn't smell snakes on Mizuki, one Kiba and Akamaru would have been canon if he really smelled like them, and two, do you really think Mizuki was important enough to Orochimaru for him or one of his top subordinates to actually meet the ass in person? Carefully burying any sense of nervousness down so deep he knew it wouldn't show he spoke, Hello, everyone. My name is Naruto Uzumaki, and these are my Ninken Kimi, Jun, and Ryu. He points to each respectively as he says their names, then continues with, I like my family, my Ninken, reading, learning, gardening, insects that help protect and nurture plants' health, medicine. He felt interest from the girl who was obviously a Hyuga at that bit, and a number of other things. I dislike feeling trapped or confined, snakes, people or things that threaten those I care about, insects that kill plants, though I don't mind the ones that only eat them, as well as fleas, for obvious reasons, people who are cruel to and or kill animals or plants for no reason, and those who judge others based off of rumors or appearance rather than getting to know them first. He felt a spike of guilt from Iruka at that one. He also felt the boy who seemed to be an Aburame feel a mixed set of emotions from interest to annoyance, most likely from his comments about insects. He paused for a second to consider what else to say, then continued with my hobbies are the same as my likes, though I suppose I should add training both with or without my Ninken, though preferably with, playing various board games like Go, Chess, and Shogi, puzzles, 
and cooking to that list as well. He could have sworn he practically felt the boy who seemed to be an Akimichi start to drool at that last bit, and his curiosity intensify as well, and a small, somehow lazy, flare of interested challenge from the boy who was most likely Inara. As for dreams for the future, well other than becoming a successful shinobi and protecting those important to me I can't say I've really decided on one yet. It was true too, after all, just a month ago he had no dream other than somehow escaping his prison with his family intact. One which he thought could never be fulfilled, and he hadn't even considered the fact that he now could have a real dream or ambition of his own to fulfill until it was brought to his attention just now. Continuing to sense his classmates emotions, he sensed a majority of them having their curiosity satisfied and their interest in him drop at the end of his intro. Most of the civilians, a girl who was most likely a Yamanaka, and a boy who, judging by the crest he wore, was the last loyal Uchiha of Konoha had almost likely decided he wasn't worth more of their time or interest. The fact that he'd said almost everything in a calm, almost detached manner most likely also played a factor in their loss of interest. It couldn't be helped though. That's how he started talking to anyone who wasn't family a long time ago in an attempt to distance himself from his captors. However, four students, who he'd already identified as the clan heirs to the Aburame, Hyuga, Akimichi, and Nara clans that he was told would be in his class, all showed a decided interest in him for the reasons he'd already managed to deduce, and of course he was already sort of friends with Kiba, and got along well with Akamaru. He honestly wasn't sure how to feel about that. He was already having trouble figuring out how to be friends with Kiba, though luckily for him it seems like none of the others seemed to have his personality, or even if what he and Kiba had was really a friendship. How was he supposed to add four more people to that list? It looks like he'd be seeking out more advice from Yui, Hayate or Yu Gao is the most normal people he knew about stuff like this. For now all he could do was hide his nervousness and go with the flow and take cues from how they interacted with him until he could figure out exactly how to act around them. Alright, since we still have 5 or so minutes till class starts I'll allow students that raise their hands to ask Naruto questions until class starts, though remember Naruto has a right not to answer your questions if he doesn't want to, Iruka said. It seems like he managed to spark a small amount of curiosity from the man as well. A pink-haired girl at the front of the class raised her hand first. Yes Sakura, go ahead, Iruka said. You said those three are your Ninken, but I thought only Inuzuka had Ninken, and you don't have their clan markings, though you have something similar to them, Sakura stated slash asked. Taking a second to dedicate her name to memory, Naruto answered, yes that is true. But due to certain circumstances I'm not comfortable talking about I became an honorary member of the clan, which is what this tattoo of their clan marking means, and all honorary members are basically clan members without the name, which means they receive Ninken as well. Naruto answered while showing said tattoo. It was true too, seeing as how he had Tsume give him a detailed explanation of exactly what being an honorary member meant before he accepted her offer. It just wasn't the whole truth for him, seeing that answer satisfied her question. This time it was the Akimichi who raised his hand, yes Choji, go ahead, Iruka said. With permission granted Choji looked at Naruto with an intensely serious expression and asked, how good of a cook are you, getting sweat drops from almost everyone in the class. Naruto, once again memorizing the name, unsurely answered, I don't know, I'm the main cook in my family, since one of them burns water and the other can only do simple dishes, but I've only cooked for my family, and I think they'd still say it tasted good even if it wasn't. If you're really that curious though, I could give you a small sample of my lunch once it's time. He got a satisfied nod the boy in response. The next person to raise his hand, to the surprise of everyone but Naruto, was the Nara. Iruka gave the same response he did everyone else using Shikamaru's name. This is troublesome, but how about a game at lunch, Shikamaru asked. Naruto simply shrugged and replied, sure, I carry a number of different boards with me anyway, we'll have to pick one of the shorter ones though considering time restraints. He got an agreeing nod in response. The boy then promptly placed his head on his desk to go to sleep, not caring about the rest of the questions or answers, and getting sweat drops from most in response. Naruto's response also prompted Iruka to ask, how when you weren't even carrying a backpack with you? Naruto looked at him and asked, have you lectured on storage seals yet? He got an understanding nod in response. The next person to raise their hand was the Hyuga, though she seemed unbelievably embarrassed and uncomfortable even doing that much. Yes Hinata. Feel free to ask your question and I have to say yours will be the last, Iruka said. Giving a small, barely heard Eep in response Hinata managed to stutter out. By medicine do you mean like a mednin or herbal? An as I've already said there's no way in hell I'll actually write stuff like stuttering out, I'll simply mention they do something like that only. Naruto tilted his head in thought for a second before once again shrugging and saying a simple, both, in response. 
The obviously timid girl simply gave a shy nod in response while flushed from the embarrassment she felt for having so much attention directed at her. All right then Naruto, please take a seat anywhere not already taken and we'll start our first day of the semester, Iruka said with a small smile as a majority of the class took out their text and notebooks. Naruto looked around to decide which of the four empty seats he would take. The first was an aisle seat that put him next to Kiba, but it also put him as the center of class, and he didn't think he could take Kiba's personality and the crowded feeling it might give him so that was out, he could always apologize to Kiba and explain most of it later if it bugged him. The next seat was in between two civilian kids, so that was a bust, he didn't want their parents freaking out about it if the kids mentioned him when they got home and their parents were some of the less, apathetic civilians. So that left the two at the back right side row that were around Shino, it seems like he either liked it that way or that no one wanted to sit next to him because he was an Aburame. It looked like the second one was the more likely of the two if the fact that the boy's emotion seemed to show no signs of him not wanting someone to sit near him had anything to say about it. Looks like he was picking one of those seats then. Walking up to the boy with his pups and oh he asked, Hi, mind if I and my companion sit here? I would also appreciate hearing your first name Aburame-san. The only outward emotion the boy showed was a slight raising of one of his eyebrows. Inwardly he felt the boy feel a small amount of surprise and an increased spike of interest in him, Naruto, as well. He finally replied with, No Uzumaki-san, I have no problem with you sitting near me. Why you ask? Because these seats are not mine to deny you in the first place. I also do not mind giving you my name. Why you ask? Because you asked so politely it would be rude of me to refuse. My name is Shino Aburame, it is nice to meet you. Anga, I don't know why, but writing Shino's manner of speech is a lot harder than it seems. Please, since I know I'm going to be writing this character at least reasonably often. Someone tell me if I'm doing him correctly. Naruto sat in the seat to the right of Shino, since the boy was sitting in the middle seat, with Kimi and Jun hopping onto his lap before settling and Ryu doing the same as Akamaru and resting on Naruto's head. Naruto then said, Thank you Shino, it's nice to meet you, too. I suppose you're right about the chairs not being yours to keep from me, but it is still common courtesy to ask. Shino might or might not have replied to that if it weren't for the fact that Iruka began his lecture right then. It seems like the first subject that would be covered would be history, that he'd already learned years ago. Something told him it wasn't his classmates' personalities or his teachers' reactions that he should have been worried about. But the sheer boredom he'd have to fight off hearing lectures about stuff he was already beyond at the age of five for Kami's sake. Time skip, lunchtime, academy grounds. It seemed to him that as soon as he sat down in the shade of a tree with a swing hanging down from one of its branches he was surrounded by a veritable swarm of children. In actuality it was merely five kids and a hound. Kiba with Akamaru, Shikamaru, Hinata, Choji and even Shino all moved to sit near him as soon as he sat down, though Shino sat slightly more separated from them than the rest. Seeing the expectant, almost eager, looks of both Choji and Shikamaru he couldn't help but let loose a small smile as he reached down to the miscellaneous seal on his sash to unseal his bento, box lunch, his pup's meals and bowls, and a checkerboard, with pieces, from it much to the surprise and even slight awe of the others. I thought storage seals are for scrolls, Choji asked. A typical store-bought storage seal will be put on a scroll called a storage scroll. Anyone who can make storage seals themselves can put them pretty much anywhere they want. Though a permanent storage seal on skin that won't simply fade away after one use or wash is both harder to do and painful for the person receiving it, since it has to be literally burned on through chakra or tattooed on, which is why I use my sash. Naruto replied, while normally he wouldn't be so loose-lipped about info on his skills, this info was so basic anyone who studied even the basics of making, not using, seals would know, so he didn't mind telling them. Well, that's cool and all, but what I want to know is why you didn't sit next to me in class earlier when we already know each other, I kept that seat empty just for you you know, Kiba asked in a slightly irritated tone even as he and everyone began opening their bendos and splitting their chopsticks. Taking a minute to give Choji one of each item in is obviously larger than all but Choji's bento, much to the boy's delight, and set up his pup's meal to give to them. Naruto then replied with, I'm sorry Kiba-san, but if you were listening to my intro I said I dislike feeling like I'm trapped or confined, and being in the middle of a classroom, surrounded by kids I don't know. He trailed off suggestively and saw understanding dawn in not only Kiba's eyes but the others as well. Are you not worried about this affecting your performance as a shinobi? Why you ask? Because as a shinobi there is a high chance of you ending up in tight or small places or surrounded by people, Shino stated more than asked. Well, when I say I dislike it, I really mean I simply dislike it. I don't go into panic attacks or anything like that, at the worst I'll feel an uncomfortable emotion a lot like paranoia in that kind of a situation. 
Naruto replied after a moment of thought. After all, if he had a panic attack or something every time he was in a confined place he would have been having one pretty much every day of his life down in the lab. His question answered, Shino gave a simple nod and started eating his bento, being careful to do it in a way that made it so that no one could see his mouth. That seemed to be a cue for everyone to start eating, as they did just that. However, as soon as Choji took a bite of one of Naruto's dishes his eyes took on a slightly dazed look with the smallest amount of drool trickling out of his mouth. Choji, a slightly worried Shikamaru asked. Good, is all Choji said in reply, holding out the O in good for a short period of time before finishing the word. This reaction and reply got Kiba to laugh out loud, he nodded to giggle quietly, Shikamaru to mutter out a quiet troublesome, Shino to raise an eyebrow in an amused fashion, Naruto's still present small smile to grow a bit, the pups including Akamaru, to bark their amusement, and Choji to blush a bit in embarrassment when he snapped out of it. Well Akimichi-san, I suppose you have your answer then, Naruto said with carefully concealed amusement, well, except for the small smile anyway. Choji gave a nod in reply, blush fading from his cheeks, before saying, just Choji is fine, and I'd like it if I could call you Naruto too, please, this comment got nods of agreement from Hinata and Shikamaru. That's fine with me Choji-san, Hinata-san. Shikamaru-san, Naruto replied. The fact that Naruto still used the san suffix caused them to sigh a bit, but judging from the fact that even the usually stubborn Kiba didn't protest at Naruto's use of it earlier they decided that that was the best they were going to get. After that a companionable silence overtook the group as they ate, only broken by the occasion click from the checker pieces as Naruto and Shikamaru took their turn and the occasional shout from a fellow academy student when someone passes by close enough for the group to hear them. Most of them had just finished eating when they heard a muttered troublesome from Shikamaru and turned to see that Naruto had won. While this got no real reaction from most of them, it caused Choji to stare in shock as Shikamaru had never lost a strategy game to anyone in or around his age group before. So this was a pretty shocking thing to him. An when Shikamaru is older and more experienced I could see him losing to no one but his dad, but he's still a kid right now so I believe other members of the clan that are older than him would be able to beat him at least. Ah, uh, I can't believe I lost, what a drag, I think I'm just going to lie down and stare at the clouds for the rest of lunch, maybe sleep. I want a rematch with Shoji later though you troublesome blonde, Shikamaru muttered out while doing the previously mentioned actions. Alright then Shikamaru-san, if that's what you want. Naruto said while wondering what he'd done to be labeled troublesome, before reviewing his memory of everything Shikamaru has said so far and realizing everything except sleeping and cloud watching was troublesome to him. Felling a tap on his shoulder, Naruto turned to see it was Shino who had done it, who then nodded his head at the board in obvious invite. Nodding in return, Naruto picked up the board and moved so that he was now facing Shino with it, and just like that they began to play. This time though, it wasn't in silence. Choji was the first to break the silence by asking, so where and who did you learn to cook like that from? Well, the where is kind of hard, as my family were living in a pretty isolated area in fire country that's not on any maps. As for who, no one, other than the occasional pointer here and there I taught myself, Naruto replied absent-mindedly, keeping most of his focus on the board in front of him. What made you decide to move to Konoha? Kiba asked curiously, he honestly hadn't thought about it until now. Well, my adopted mother wanted to move to a village because she wanted me to be able to make some friends my own age and she was getting tired of homeschooling me. We decided on Konoha because her I won't admit he's my boyfriend when he's definitely my boyfriend boyfriend had always wanted to be a shinobi and it was Fire Country's shinobi village. Naruto once again absent-mindedly replied, it was his turn, adopted mother, Hinata stuttered out. I'm afraid my birth parents died protecting me from a rather nasty missing nin they had the unfortunate luck of running afoul of the day I was born so I never knew them, Naruto replied sadly. It wasn't the whole truth, the Uchiha who controlled Kurama was definitely a missing nin from his own admission, but the one who killed them with a claw through their gut while protecting Naruto from said claw was Kurama himself. Kurama had already apologized for it, but Naruto couldn't really blame him, he can relate somewhat after being imprisoned his whole life, and he certainly wouldn't want to be in prison again after just gaining his freedom either. Ah, I'm sorry for bringing up such a sad subject, Hinata barely managed to get out her stuttering having increased due to the flustered emotions she was feeling. It's no problem, while I'm sad I never got the chance to know them. Yui Okasan has been doing the best she possibly could to raise me, and Asahi Oji-san helped too. I'm satisfied with the family I have, Naruto replied. He didn't get why that made Hinata so flustered or the others to feel a weird mixture of sadness, pity, and guilt. He was, admittedly, somewhat sad he never had the opportunity to meet or get to know his parents, but he couldn't really miss what he never had right? 
He found he didn't like the feelings he was getting from his friends, so he decided to change the subject. So, Hinata, is the reason you asked me what kind of medicine I have an interest in because you have an interest of your own in the subject? Naruto asked the shy girl. Realizing they were making Naruto uncomfortable, Hinata accepted the change in conversation by stuttering out, Yes I do, Naruto-san. That plus an interest in gardening makes it so that I'm actually able to make my own herbal medicines. But you only do medicines, that seems like a waste. I use my own gardens to make anything from medicines, poisons, and antidotes to a special kind of chemical that repels certain types of insects, Naruto replied absent-mindedly, having returned a majority of his attention back to the near-finished game. Hinata seemed to become lost in thought to that. Shino raised an eyebrow in curiosity to that before asking, you only repel them, that is a surprise. Why you may ask? Because most people would kill bugs they don't like. Why kill them for doing what they were born to do? It's not they know the plants they're killing are important to someone. They're just living their lives doing what they were born to do, and I won't kill them for something as simple as that when an equally simple solution of scaring them away from my plants works just as well, Naruto replied with some force behind his words. He valued life far too much to take any of it unnecessarily. Orochimaru had already caused him to stain his hands with the blood of insane experiments and prisoners he sicked on him. Naruto, to test his abilities to see the killing of anything is any more than a last resort. Slightly taken back by the force behind Naruto's statement, Shino simply nodded in understanding and made his last, and losing, move against Naruto. As he expected, Naruto used the only move he left available for Shino to use and took all of Shino's remaining pieces, therefore winning. This was a good thing however, as shortly after he took the last of Shino's pieces from the board, the bell rung warning that it was time to head back to class or be late. This prompted both Shikamaru, who was more interested in watching clouds while listening to the answers the strawberry blonde that was quickly becoming an enigma than in sleep right now, and Kiba, who simply didn't want to return to classes, to groan slightly. However, groans or not, everyone packed up, got up, and headed back for the rest of their school day to continue. All the while thinking various thoughts about the mysterious strawberry blonde that had suddenly and unexpectedly caught their interest and worked his way into their thoughts. Chapter 6, Moving Forward After school, Shikamaru's house, Shikamaru's POV. I was in a contemplative mood by the time I reached my home, opened the door and muttered out a quiet, I'm home. Ah, Shikamaru, you're home, good, come and take the trash out won't you, my mother, Yoshinonara yelled out to me from the kitchen. Knowing better than to argue or complain, it was far too troublesome. I muttered out a quiet troublesome before heading to the kitchen my mother was in to grab the trash bag. On the way I asked her, where's Tosan at? Your father is out tending the deer right now, or he'd better be, that lazy husband of mine, Yoshino told me, muttering out the last part in a tone that made me inch away from her and I the frying pan she was using to cook warily. Okay, I'm going to go join him after I take the trash out, I said in my typical lazy way walking out of the kitchen trash bag in hand even as I was speaking. As long as you don't you don't forget to do your homework. I'm not letting you start out this semester doing something like that after all, Yoshino warned threateningly. Got it, I confirmed before quietly muttering, troublesome Kasan. Unfortunately not quietly enough as I soon received a frying pan to the back of my head for my comment. Deciding to cut my loses before things got any worse, I bolted out the door. Then walked over and threw the trash in the dumpster. Heading out to the part of the field we typically tend to our deer and I soon spotted my father checking out a recently born fawn to make sure it was healthy. I approached him without worry as the Nara deer were typically almost as lazy as their male tenders and therefore wouldn't run unless they smelled a predator. How is it? I lazily asked my father in curiosity. I'd never admit it since it would get my troublesome mother on my case, but I actually really love taking care of the newborn deer. They're not all that troublesome and they're always highly affectionate and inquisitive. She's fine, another troublesome female, going to grow up to be a nice strong doe, Shikaku replied, equally as lazy as his son. Hmm, was my only reply, my mind having already gone back to replaying everything that had happened at school today. Shikaku, probably realizing that I was distracted by something, asked me, everything alright, son? I could tell that my father already realized what my real reason for being here is, so I decided to get right to the point. There's a new kid who joined our class today. He's, interestingly troublesome. Temporary end to Shikamaru POV. Shikaku lazily raised an eyebrow. He already knew who his son was talking about, of course, but he had to admit he was curious about what his son thought about him for him to have already become interesting. Restart Shikamaru POV. Recognizing the raised brow for what it was, I first recounted everything that had happened that day, from Naruto's intro that had sparked my interest in the first place, to what had happened during lunch, after lunch had been normal 
and the group couldn't do anything after school since almost everyone had something they needed to do today. I willingly admitted to the fact that I'd never considered spending time with the other people that Naruto had gathered at lunch that day, with the exception of Choji of course. After that I went on to describe what I thought about everyone from our meeting so far, since I could already tell that what happened at lunch today was going to continue to happen, and not just because Naruto makes a good strategic opponent. Shino was, smart almost as smart as I was, if not slightly more so in some categories. He was also quite impolite, yet I detected an undercurrent of energy that he seemed to be in tight control of, possibly something to do with his bugs. He was also very stoic, preferring to show his emotions in small, quiet ways rather than out loud. He was the least troublesome member of this group Naruto had somehow formed, knowingly or not. Kiba was, troublesome. He was loud, brash, and cocky but not in an arrogant way. Though it seemed like he was heading that way last semester I'm guessing Naruto had some involvement in nipping that problem in the butt over the school break. He and Naruto seemed to get along, I really do wonder what happened in the most likely short time since he and his family moved to Konoha that could have already made him an honorary member of the Inuzuka though. His partner, Akamaru, seemed to have the brains of the pair, being much more calm and level-headed than his companion. Yet, at the same time I could almost feel the loyalty and kindness Kiba held for those he cared about. I could tell you'd have a friend for life if you were in the respect and friendship of the young Inuzuka, as long as you didn't do anything treacherous anyway. Hinata was, shy to the point of ridiculousness, which I could already tell was going to lead to some trouble sometimes. She was kind and sweet to the point I almost thought she was using some sort of mask to come off as helpless. How anyone could be as kind and sweet as her and actually mean it was confusing to me. Then again, she was a girl, they were all troublesome in some way or another. Though she was far less troublesome than any other girl I've had the bad luck to know, like Hino. And finally Naruto, a puzzle I could already tell would take a very long time to solve, if I ever fully could. He was as polite as Shino, yet in a more forced way, as though he was made to grow up that way rather than ending up that way naturally like many of your aims did. He was kind, yet at the same time cold and detached, almost as though the kindness was being forcefully repressed along with the full strength of his other emotions. It was obvious he wanted to laugh at Shoji's reaction to his food, yet all he allowed himself was a slightly larger smile than the one he already had. His three Ninkans seemed nice and obedient, but that could be just because they slept through most of lunch after eating and were probably trained same as Akamaru not to cause trouble in the classroom. They're also very young, much younger than Akamaru. There was also the matter of his past. I could tell that he wasn't exactly lying about it, unless you were one of the ones who counted a mission as lying. However, I could also tell just by looking in his eyes that what he mentioned about the death of his parents shortly after his birth was one of the least painful memories he had. And I could tell he had many, his eyes reminded me of that one trauma patient I ran into at Eno's father's clinic, yet how did someone as young as us end up with eyes similar to a war vet who's seen and done too much as trauma? All in all Naruto was an enigma wrapped up in puzzles and mysteries galore, one that I wanted to solve, how troublesome. And Shikamaru of POV. Shikaku hummed to himself and thought. He honestly hadn't expected his son to become that interested in Naruto. It wasn't a bad thing, especially since Shikamaru's loss to someone his age rather than someone older than him would help encourage him to work harder in his tactics training at the very least. What really surprised him was the fact that Naruto had somehow attracted almost all of the clan heirs to him like moths to a flame simply by being himself. It seemed like Minato's boy was going to be the leader of his generation much like Minato was to theirs. The only troublesome ones would be Inoiki's daughter and the Uchiha. But that was a can of worms he wasn't touching, let alone opening. Realizing he had been lost to his thoughts long enough to attract the attention of his son Shikaku simply said, Well, son, it seems like you've made some very good friends today. I can tell just like you said that you're most likely going to have some troublesome times ahead because of them, but you won't ever be able to have or make better friends than the ones you have now. They'll be with you through thick and thin, no matter what, and I'm sure, troublesome as it is, that you'll do the same thing for them. Shikamaru simply sighed and smirked before responding to his father by saying, Yeah, Tosan, I guess you're right, how troublesome. After Academy, Kiba's POV. Akamaru and I made a mad dash for our house in the clan compound, both of us determined to win the race we challenged each other to. I realized I was slightly behind my four-legged partner and pushed myself harder for the win. I just barely slammed my hand down on the door to the house, our end line, before Akamaru slammed his own front paws down right after mine. Whoop, ah ha ha, I win this time buddy, better luck next time, I shouted out with a laugh, not minding the light-hearted growl my partner let out at realizing he'd lost. Really Kiba, I don't know how many times I'm going to have to tell you that you shouldn't bang on the door like that, it's damaged enough as is by the Ninkan pounding on it when they're locked out and want in, 
Really I can't wait till those special orders I made with Naruto come in so we can fix that problem, a familiar voice said from behind me. I felt myself freeze at the fact my mom, Tsume Inuzuka, was standing right behind me, last time she caught me doing this to the door she made me clean over half the kennels all on my own. Thinking quickly I said, well Katron, I was just so excited to get home in time to help take care of the new litter that was born earlier today like you asked me before I left for the academy that Akamaru and I ran all the way here from the academy. Isn't that right bud? Ahahahaha ah, Hatilda. Oh is that so? Well then I guess we better get to work, and since you were so eager for this Kiba you can clean up after them while you tell me about your first day back at academy, mom said to me with a smirk. Holding back the groan I wanted to let out at the thought of cleaning up after the newborns myself. I grumpily followed after my mom to the special section of the kennels reserved for pregnant or nursing females. I really had been eager to see and check on the newborns, I hadn't lied about that. I might not want to be a vet like my sister Hana, but a stern talking to I got from Naruto the one time I complained about learning the basics of taking care of our Ninkan hit me far harder than anything my mom or sister said to me about it. I realized exactly how important that knowledge was not only for me, but for Akamaru. Too. I still remember it like it was yesterday rather than a few weeks ago. Flashback. Naruto's house. A few days after the announcement. Still keep a POV. I was hanging at my new friend Naruto's house, though it was more like a small mansion in my opinion, after my mom just got through with another boring lecture on proper care and treatment of our Ninkan. Naruto, the first day we met, had proven to me in a very harsh way exactly who the Dom between us was, and since then I declared him as not just a new clan member. But a friend and rival as well. Man, how boring was that lecture? Am I right Naruto? I complained to my usually silent new friend. To my surprise he gave a look harsher than the one he showed me when I told him I was going to be the Dom. Between the two of us, and then he sternly said, if you really believe that lecture was simply boring Kiba, then you should hand Akamaru back to Tsume Sensei right now. I was furious, Dom. He might have proven himself to be, but that didn't give him any right to tell me something like that. What right do you have to say that you jerk? Akamaru is my partner, there's no way I'd ever give him up, I shouted at him. And yet you don't care about him enough to learn what you need to take proper care of him? He shouted back at me, continuing before I had a chance to say anything in my defense. What if you go on a mission after you become a shinobi and he gets sick or hurt? Without the knowledge to properly take care of him or learning from your mother right now he could die because of that. Or even what if, because you don't know what is and is not safe to give him to eat you give something poisonous to him just because you like the taste of it and had wanted to share it with him like chocolate, or someone else does it instead. Do you want your companion to die because you were too bored to learn these things, well, do you? I was shocked speechless, I honestly hadn't thought of any of that before. Yeah, sure, my mom and sis had told me time and again what they were teaching was important, but they'd never bothered explaining why. All I could do after hearing all that was not and promise that from then on I'd pay close attention to the lessons they gave us, and ask Naruto to give me a review to make sure I hadn't already missed something important. End flashback. Still keep a POV. Ever since then I'd kept my promise to Naruto and found that, while I don't like it nearly as much as my sister does, I actually like taking care of the family Ninkan, as long as I didn't have to clean up after them at least. Noticing my mom giving me an impatient look I realized she wanted me to start telling her about my first day back at school, and started doing just that. After I was done mom was silent with a thoughtful look on her face even as she started doing basic checkups on the pups and their mother while I started cleaning up their mess. After a couple more minutes of silent work she finally said to slash asked me, well, I guess we both already knew he was an interesting pup, but what do you think of the others? After a couple minutes of thought I started with Shino. He was quiet, even quieter than Naruto was, yet I could usually tell what he was saying or feeling through body language, which was very important to learn in our clan so we could silently communicate with our partners and each other. He was also smart, the few times he did speak he used big words I either couldn't understand or could barely understand. He had a strange sort of scent to him, some combo of earth and plants and something I'm not entirely sure about that must be his insects. I don't really care about the bugs inside him, as long as he didn't use them on me outside a spar, but I really wish he wasn't so quiet. He blended into the background to the point I almost forgot he was there until he challenged Naruto to a checkers match. Hinata was cute, but really shy. If she could get over the obvious confidence problems she is I could see her becoming not just a great kunoichi, but great mate potential someday. I plan on doing my best to help her out with that, cause I'm already starting to like her. She smells like an entire garden of flowers and something sharp like medicine but not quite, must be the ointment she and Naruto talked about. Shikamaru was, unbelievably lazy, I could tell he must be really smart since he gave Naruto more of a challenge in checkers than Shino, 
but he doesn't seem to really want to use it. He's also constantly calling everything but board games and cloud watching troublesome. I don't think we'll get along very well, since I would hate being so lazy all the time, but if we took turns choosing what to do we could probably be friends. He smells like grass, deer, and the forest, I have to admit I like it, if you'd replace the deer scent with dog he could pass off as most Inuzuka's base scents. A Anna base scent is basically a scent a person's carrying around from things around them, like food and nature. A true scent is a person's natural scent they will carry no matter what for the entirety of their lives. It may change some as a person grows older and their health and diet changes, but it will basically stay the same. It can be covered up with really strong scented stuff or stuff that hurts a tracker's nose, but can never be removed or changed. This stuff is proven in tracking animals and tests, as in real, I don't think Kiba would know them well enough to identify their natural scent yet, so that's why I'm not having him say it. Choji is nice, if a little too obsessed with food. Don't get me wrong, I love a good meal as well as any guy, but Choji takes that a step further, and it shows in his body's build, but the one time I almost called him fat my instinct screamed at me to stop, and then I saw what happened to that kid in our taijutsu class when he did just that last year, and boy am I glad I listened. He seems to be really good friends with Shikamaru, most likely cause he seems like a really easygoing guy who's fine with both going with the flow and being a follower rather than a leader. He smells like the chips he's always eating other kinds of food like barbecue, and grass, probably from spending so much time with Shikamaru cloud watching. All in all I like them, and could see myself being teammates with all but Shikamaru. If I ended up in a team with Shikamaru it would drive me nuts with all his troublesome slash s and his laziness most likely dragging our team down. And Kiba POV. Tsume hummed in thought, it seemed the future clan heads of this generation all had some interesting personalities, she just hoped poor Inoiki would be able to set his daughter straight before it was too late cause other than the Uchiha she was the most troubling of the bunch, oh well, not her problem, as long as her son didn't end up on a team with them anyway, which he won't, because their grades are far apart yet close enough to each other's to prevent that. After Academy Shino's POV, A and this was so hard to write sob, I made my way through my clan's compound on the way to my home. Outwardly I'm sure I appeared as clam and composed as ever, but on the inside I was deeply contemplative. The sounds of our many hives spread throughout the entire compound both soothed me as it always has and at the same time drove me even deeper into my contemplative mood. I was so deeply entrenched in my thoughts, in fact, that I barely noticed the fact that I'd entered my home and walked towards my father Shibi's office, knowing he'd want me to give him a summary of my first day back at school. Walking into my father's office I paused briefly before him, trying to straighten out my thoughts before beginning. My father, most likely in response to my hesitation, raised his eyebrows almost imperceptibly in question. Having gathered my thoughts enough to give a proper summary, I decided the best way to explain myself was through explaining what caused it in the first place. So I did so, using as few words as possible while still getting all details in. Brief end to Shino's POV, AN as if you didn't already see this coming by now. Shibi was slightly surprised, though he didn't let it show. His son, who had had the typical Aburame difficulty with making friends, suddenly has four prospects at the same time, none of which seem to mind what he hosts at all. Most friends they managed to make were still at least slightly leery at the thought of the symbiotic relationship they had with their insects. Yet they didn't seem to mind that fact at all, the only time Shino had gotten a reaction out of any of them was when one of the more curious of his hive had landed on Kiba he hadn't liked it, yet even then rather than killing it he'd simply asked, told, Shino to remove it and not let it happen again. Truly interesting. Now all that was left was seeing whether Shino understood how rare such an occurrence was and whether he was going to appreciate or not. After all, he was still young, and those who are young, no matter how intelligent they may be, often didn't understand the value of something until it is too late. Resume Shino POV. Well Shino, my father began in his typical calm and controlled voice, what do you think of them and what are your plans from now on? Deciding to answer the longer question first, I chose to start with Hinata. She was shy and quiet but undeniably kind, even to my insects when a couple of my hive landed on her. Kiba was loud and annoying, his tones and pitches being enough to disturb my hive at times. But I could tell he was kind through the way he treated Akamaru. He was also very loyal from the way I'd seen him more than once stick up for others he cared about throughout the years. Akamaru seemed to be an intelligent and loyal hound that loved Kiba greatly. Shikamaru was intelligent and would make a great strategic opponent if you could motivate him for a match which is typical for a male Nara. Choji was nearly as kind as Hinata, and seemingly obsessed with food and eating, which makes sense considering his clan's jutsus. Naruto was confusing. He was strong if you went by his massive chakra reserves and smart enough to hide it by being average so far in class. 
he was also intelligent because he was able to beat Anara, albeit one the same age as them, in an intellectual game, one I know from rumors had been undefeated by those around his age group until then. He has somehow already become an honorary Inuzuka despite only recently moving into Konoha. And he had charisma enough to attract the attention of almost all the clan heirs of Konoha without even trying, possibly without even being aware of it. His three Ninkan I haven't learned enough about to form any judgment about. As for what I'm planning to do, learn more about them and, if possible, deepen the bonds I formed with them today. Why? Because I realize just how rare and valuable comrades and friends like them are for an Aburame. I finished with. The approving nod I received from my father was all the response I needed. After Academy, Choji POV. I jogged home, eager to get there for my After Academy snack, but not eager enough for a full-blown run all the way there. I was also eager to tell my parents all about the new friends I made today. It had been so hard for me to make friends when I was younger since most of the kids disliked me because they saw me as fat and stupid that after I'd finally gotten a friend in Shika that I sort of gave up on finding more. Now I'm pretty sure I have five of them. 9 if you counted Naruto and Kiba's Ninkan. I walked through the door into our house calmly, any other way would be impolite, and headed straight for the kitchen since my parents were always there at this time of day unless dad had to attend a council meeting. Just as I thought I saw both of my parents sitting at the kitchen table eating their own snacks, obviously waiting for me to get home and tell them about my day. I really loved my parents for stuff like this. My father, Choza, is a strong ninja and clan head. My mother, while never being a ninja, was strong in her own right. Enough to give dad a run for his money in a fight, partly because he was terrified of her when she was mad, I don't blame him, though. Yet at the same time they were both incredibly kind and caring as well. Dad was the first to notice me walk in, he gave me a smile and nod, which drew mom's attention to me, before saying slash asking me, well son, welcome home. How was your first day back at school? Hi dad, mom, I'm home. My first day back was great, I made four new friends today, I started calmly but finished excitedly and happily. Oh, Choji, that's wonderful, mom exclaimed happily, why don't you tell us all about your day and about them? With a small nod I began telling them all about my day, then moved on to telling them about my new friends. Kiba was fun to be around, with his loud and energetic personality he was pretty much the complete opposite of Shika, yet I liked him all the same. He was a great guy to be around, if a little too blunt and brash for my tastes. Still, I could see us becoming great friends. His Ninkan, Akamaru was a great hound, almost exactly like his partner, only smarter. Hinata was kind-hearted, though I'd already realized that long ago after Shika pointed out she was holding back in her fights because she hates hurting people. There are times where I can't help but wonder whether she's suited for the shinobi lifestyle because of her attitude though. While I hated thought of hurting my friends, I also realized and understood the fact that I'd eventually have to hurt and even kill people at some point in my career. I don't think she could handle that as she is now so I'll do my best as her friend to help her to that point. Shino was calm and quiet, and also very polite. I honestly haven't learned enough about him to really know anything yet since I'm not as good at reading people as Shika is, but I'm sure I'll get better at reading him the more time we spend together. Naruto was, kinda sad to be honest. He's polite, smart, kind-hearted, and an all-around great guy. Yet even I can tell he's been hurt deeply by something at least once in his past, if not more times. I hope our friendship will help him heal from whatever the damage may be, and that he'll eventually be able to trust us enough to tell us his past. His Ninkan slept through most of lunch and were just like Hakamaru in class so I honestly don't know what to think of them yet. And Choji POV, Choza smiled proudly down at his son. There were times when he honestly believed his son was a little too kind-hearted, then he goes and says something like this and he once again realizes his thoughts are wrong. His son is fine just the way he is. Choji's mom smiled as well. Overjoyed not only at the thought of Choji having more friends than just Shikamaru, but also at the example of how wonderfully kind and thoughtful her little boy had become. She gave him a hug and kiss and congratulations and went to make him a celebratory dinner, as his tale had taken most of the rest of the day to tell. After Academy, he not as POV. I calmly made my way home, after all, it would be undignified if the Hyuga heiress skipped home in happiness like I wanted to do. I had made friends today. Friends who didn't judge me for my family who waited patiently for me to finish rather than mocking my stuttering, who looked at me and saw me, and actually accepted me anyway. I made my way through the ornamental gate to the main house building, hoping against hope my father, Hiroshi, didn't call on me. Father was always so disappointed in me. He thought I was less worthy of the title of heiress than my little sister Hinabi because she was already better in our family's daijutsu style, gentle fist, than I am. I try my best, but my body simply doesn't want to be so rigid. 
Ever since he realized that, my father has been nothing but cold words and disappointment towards me. Unfortunately, it seems like my silent pleas went unheard as when I was halfway to my room I heard my father's stoic yet somehow cold voice call me. Hinata, come to my office and tell me about your first day of school, he said. Yes father, I murmured back, too nervous to stutter. I headed into his office, sat in front of his desk, doing my best to avoid his piercing stare in the process, and started telling him about my day. After I finished my tale my father stared at me for what seemed like hours before finally saying, good work. Making friends with most of the clan heirs now will make working with them in the future much easier. Also, that boy must be strong if Hokage-sam already allows him to enter the academy despite being a recent emigre, even if he decides to hide it during the academy. It seems like you finally did something befitting of your title as heiress, now tell me what you think of each individual. Overjoyed at the praise my father gave me, I was able to let out a confident yes before starting with Kiba. He was brash and loud, yet had a surprisingly kind side under that. His confidence helps inspire me to be more confident myself. Akamaru was an adorably sweet puppy I honestly wanted to pick up and never let go. The two of them were unbelievably loyal to one another as well. Shino was stoic and polite, and very smart. But he was so quiet and withdrawn it's hard to get any more of a read on him than that. Shikamaru was so lazy it was almost funny, with his troublesome this and troublesome that. At the same time he was probably the smartest of the group, him or Naruto. He's an extremely loyal and good friend if you go by his interactions with Choji, though. I've always seen Choji as a kind-hearted individual, and getting to know him better hasn't changed that opinion. He's even more food-obsessed than I thought, but considering the way his clan jutsus are supposed to work it makes sense. Naruto was charismatic. If it weren't for him none of us would have gotten together, or even considered it, yet first day he's here and we've been attracted to him like flies to honey, just hopefully without the consequences. He's hiding a lot of things most especially pain, and I hope that with time he'll come to trust us enough to share with us. His hounds I couldn't learn anything about as they were quiet or asleep the whole time. My father nodded to my comments and observations before finally dismissing me to my room. I gratefully left, happy because of my father's praise, but dreading messing up the reason behind said praise. And he not as POV. Hiyashi sat back with a sigh of sorrow soon after he not left. His twin brother, Hizashi had more than once warned him that if he continued to treat Hinata harshly in training he'd end up treating her harshly period, and that that would break her already fragile psyche and confidence caused by the near kidnapping they'd only just managed to stop before it happened by pure coincidence and her mother's death due to complications from her second pregnancy. He shuddered to think what might have become of her psyche if a branch member hadn't have caught the kidnapper stealing her out of her room because he woke up to get a drink. The captured would-be criminal who turned out to be an ambassador from Kuma that was acting on his own jurisdiction to kidnap her for glory, was harshly punished and then executed by Kuma themselves for nearly compromising such an important treaty. Hinata had been scared, but a couple of months of good therapy fixed the worst problems. It was mostly her mother's death and Hiyashi's own reaction to it that caused all the psychological problems she now had. He had been so grief-stricken at the loss of his wife he'd temporarily gone insane with it training his daughter into the ground daily in the insane belief that if he made her strong he would never lose her. It took a solid ass kicking from his brother, who, sadly, was always and will always be better at the gentle fist than him, nearly five years after the fact, just a short while ago, when he finally got tired of Hiyashi not listening to his vocal warnings, to finally snap him out of it, and by then the damage had already long since been done and reinforced. Handing her training over to Hizashi and his prodigious son Neji since then seems to have helped both her confidence and skill in the gentle fist, but damaged her already incredibly shaky trust in him even more, and he honestly couldn't figure out how to fix it. Heaving out one last long sigh, Hiyashi prayed to whatever deity may be listening and feeling generous that her friends could do what he seemed to be struggling to do. After Academy, Naruto POV. I took my time heading home. Asahi had just left on his first out of village mission, managing to rank as an impressive Dokubutsu Jonin rank due to the fact he proved he could control his temper when needed. He wouldn't be back for a week at the earliest. Yui had made friends with a number of former Kunoichi or inactive Kunoichi housewives the last time she went grocery shopping and now had tea with them on almost daily basis at this time. My sensei were either also on missions, Kurinai, Hayate, and Yugao or had decided to let me have the day off to see how hard and time-consuming my homework would be. The rest, which was nil, I'd decided that since class wasn't going to teach me anything new that I might as well do the last lecture's homework in the next class, so I have none. My hounds happily explored or frolicked through the rather beautiful park we were currently cutting through, making me smile at how happy and carefree we could finally be when we wanted to. Kimmy's personality is slightly spoiled as the only girl, runt, and baby of the litter, but is also very sweet and loyal. 
Jun is also very loyal and obedient but can be very mischievous at times. Ryu is loyal, but more proud and shows it in more subtle ways, he's the oldest of the 3 by 4 and 12 minutes respectively and considers the other two's safety as responsibility, he can be highly stubborn, and outside battle and training situations can be very rebellious at times. But despite their quirks and problems I love them enormously, they were my family by blood and choice, though they were far more like annoying younger siblings than children to me despite the fact I raised them. Suddenly I heard Jun ask me in my mind, they'd long since helped me learn to fluently understand and speak dog speak, but we wanted to practice multitasking while mind speaking as often as possible to get used to it. So, you now have potential pack mates of your own age, what do you think of them? I hummed in thought. Sensing all three hounds and Kurama's curiosity of my opinion of them humming and crackling through my sensory ability. I decided to start with Shino. He's kind and reserved like me, but far less forced. He's got an extremely good tactical mind, but he thinks by the book too much and is therefore predictable, if that reflects his fighting style, which it often does. I was going to have to help him with that, or he'd die in his first real life or death fight once his opponent gets his methods down. He doesn't say much but that simply means that what he does have to say will usually be intelligent and important. Something tells me once we get him to trust us more he'll loosen up and talk more though, and then I'm sure him, Shikamaru, and I will have some very nice intellectual conversations, if we can keep Shikamaru awake anyway. On to Shikamaru, since I already mentioned him anyway. It might not have looked like it to those who don't know the game well, but I only barely beat the guy, he was scary intelligent. If all Naras are like that I can fully understand why they're so lazy. Not only have they already seen, planned, and thought out everything at least a hundred steps ahead of a person, but I think if they showed said intelligence to people without the laziness and such to blunt it, they'd probably be so feared they'd be one of the most hunted down clans in existence, both as enemies to kill, and as people to force into an alliance. I look forward to regularly testing my intellectual abilities against him. Hinata seemed to have passed traumas she has yet to have gotten over. She was so shy and reserved throughout the entire lunch time and every time she did say or do something she acted like she expected to be put down and scolded every single time. I'll try to help and break her out of this habit, but I believe in this case Kiba's brashness and take none attitude will be her saving grace. Choji is kind and even tempered, though I was pulled aside and warned to never call him fat. That's fine, everyone has buttons, they just need to train not to react to them in a way that will get them killed in the future. Other than that and being a lover of good food, I honestly wasn't able to get a good read on him, oh well, that can be fixed with time. All in all I believe all of them, including Kiba and Akamaru, will make amazing friends and pack mates I'll eventually be able to trust with most of my secrets, some things are better left permanently lost to the sands of time after all. And Naruto POV, Naruto's house. The rest of the day was rather average. He went home, gardened, read a bit, trained on his own and with his hounds, basically kept himself occupied until Yui returned. He then spent the rest of the day chatting with her about all sorts of things, cooked dinner, read some more, and soon went to sleep with his hounds. Return to Naruto POV. I was having my worst nightmare again. Trapped in the body of my four-year-old self on one of the worst days of my short lifespan, forced to relive it despite every plea my mind ineffectively came up with to wake up wake up wake up. I was, as usual, being led down the corridor from my cell, I would never call it my room towards the lab where I expected another round of routine blood tests and drug tests, some painful and miserable, others having seemingly no effect at all. What my younger self didn't realize but my older horrified self already knew was that there would be nothing average about this day. The first sign that caused my younger self to slightly panic and grow worried was the snake's presence in the room, he almost never showed up in person anymore. The next sign was leading my younger self towards one of the tables in the room rather than my usual chair. The next one that caused me to actually start panicking until they administered a mild sedative was when they tightly strapped me down to said table. Why he didn't fully knock me out rather than administering a sedative was a question I'll never be able to answer, but I truly hated him for it. It seemed to me that as soon as he administered whatever was in the needle he was carrying I began to feel the effects. First, it was a strong burning sensation from the spot he shot me at that partially pierced through the sedative and soon moved onto the rest of my body. After that was a throbbing in my head that was most likely a pain that didn't manage to pierce through the sedative. Next the burning sensation increased in my eyes to the point I was barely able to hold in my pain screams, I didn't want to give him the pleasure. That's when the truly horrifying things began. Everything began to flicker, and sometimes within those flickers I saw things. People's skeletal structures, flicker, people glowing a strange blue color I mistook as their souls, flicker, walls and furniture are semi-transparent, flicker. Everyone's skin seems to be melting off, 
flicker flicker flicker. Horror after horror was visible all the while my blood, body and eyes burned while my head throbbed painfully, having long since burned though the relatively weak sedative. It went on like that for hours, me having long since given into my screaming and then having screamed my throat raw. I finally mercifully passed out after I don't know how long, only to wake up in what seemed to be an old and just beginning to break down sewer system, or possibly boiler room. I woke up in my bed chest heaving and body slick with sweat, with a scream I'd long since taught myself to suppress stuck in my throat. I always woke up before the part where I met Karama for the first time, sometimes a little earlier, sometimes a little later but always before. I realize now that most everything I saw that day were delusions brought about by the changes my brain and eyes had to go through for the momigan, and the momigan's abilities itself, but to my young and inexperienced self it all seemed real and, still, terrifying to me. My hounds cuddled up to me even as their and Karama's voices echoed with reassurances in my head, the hounds knowing I wouldn't want them to wake up Huey for this. Eventually their common soothing reassurances clammed and steadied me, enough to read at least, as I knew I would not be sleeping the rest of the night. The next day came far faster than I thought it would, the clock on my end table telling me it was time to get up and start my day if I hadn't already done so. I gently got out of bed so as to not wake up my still sleeping hounds and let them catch up on the sleep they lost because of me last night. By the time I went through my morning routine and was about to finish breakfast everyone was already awake and waiting for their food. I had a shadow clone set up the hounds food while I put the food I just finished cooking on the table. Breakfast was silent today as I didn't feel like talking and the others picked up on and respected that. When I and my hounds left the gate of our compound to head to school we found a well-known figure waiting for us so I stated, well if it isn't Jiraiya of the Sanin, one of the strongest shinobi of the village and according to my father's journal my godfather. The man I'd identified as Jiraiya looked shocked for a second before releasing a small sigh and admitting, I'd hoped you hadn't reached that part of either of their journals yet so I could tell you myself. I also hope you're not too mad about me not meeting you right away cause trust me when I say I both wanted and meant to. I tilted my head to the side inquisitively before asking him, then why didn't you? He gave a rueful smile before saying, well first there's the fact that Haruzen sensei wanted to at least hold out until after your mental evaluation and the council meeting was out of the way. Then you were so busy getting the house back into shape that day and meditating so I didn't want to disturb you. Though you could ask either of those Onbo sensei of yours and they will say I came here that day. And finally while you were waiting here after the public announcement for heads to cool sensei had me using my popularity as a sanin and status as your dad's former sensei to find any dissidents in the ranks that might be hiding bad intents towards you. Thankfully there were only a few but even a few can kill you if they're skilled or lucky enough. I hope you can forgive me for not being there to support you or see you off for your first day at the academy. I gave a small smile feeling his regret and sadness and the hounds and Kurama's approval for him before saying, well I'm glad you're willing to tell the truth rather than make excuses and I really don't mind. I actually asked Hokage-sama about you after reading about you and he said that you never gave up or stopped looking for me when others did, and that you had your reasons as to why I hadn't met you yet, so thank you for that. Jiraiya gave a large goofy but happy smile at that before saying in a hopeful tone, I'm really glad to hear that Naruto. I know it's not quite as good as doing it on the first day but would you like me to walk you to the academy while we get to know each other? I simply smiled and nodded, feeling like this was going to be the start of a wonderful family relationship, as long as he doesn't try to involve me in any of those perverted plans my dad warned me about. Chapter 7, Two Steps Forward, No Steps Back, Hopefully. One week later, Hokage's office. Inoiki stood in front of the Hokage with a serious expression on his face, other than those two and the Anbu guard no one else was present in the room. What he was about to tell his Hokage was extremely important and could, possibly, have a strong effect on someone's life. Well, Inoiki, you stated the reason for this appointment was extremely important, so please begin, Hiruzen stated calmly. Hi, Hokage-sama, Inoiki stated respectfully before getting down to business. I wanted to make this appointment about something that has been bugging me about Naruto's mental evaluation. While I'm confident there is no tampering and that he is not a sleeper agent. I'm concerned about the seeming lack of trauma and scaring caused by the horrors he's had to go through in his life. Hiruzen raised a brow in question, after all, lack of things like that was usually a good thing. Inoiki continued, someone who's gone through what he's gone through, especially at such a young age, should have much more mental trauma and problems than the few small ones I found. 
The only answer that could possibly be correct for this is that he's repressed these problems and emotions so deeply into his psyche that I would cause him harm to pull it out. While this may seem fine at first as it gives him a chance to live life without things like that constantly hanging over his head it could cause major psychological issues in the future if not addressed now. He could end up continuously building up on those problems by repressing any problems he has in the future because it has worked for him before until the dam holding those emotions and memories literally bursts and breaks his entire mind. Or a number of triggers could cause the dam to release pressure and make him snap in any number of unknown ways that could cause harm to himself or others. This problem is most likely exacerbated by the fact that he'll be having to deal with the corruptive influence of the QB and its chakra. Hiruzen leaned back in his chair, deeply contemplative, staring at Inoiki while letting his mind go through all the information given and all the problems it could case before finally stating slash asking, you wouldn't have brought this problem to me if you hadn't already come up with a viable solution, so what do you propose? Weekly sessions with me or, if I'm unavailable, one of two other Yamanaka I've chosen but not yet informed. The first things we'd work on would be getting him used to expressing his emotions in controlled ways rather than repressing them. Then we'd get him to start working on special types of meditation meant to help someone control and access their mindscape better so that Naruto can enter his mind, though the fact that he mentioned talking to the QB means he might already be able to find the physical representation of the dam in his mind, and start working on slowly and carefully emptying it so that we no longer have to worry about it. I also think at the same time this training will also help if he ever ends up using the Kyuubi's chakra or running into Orochimaru again so that he's better at controlling his emotions and will have already accepted or even overcome any sort of mental problems Orochimaru might try to use against him, Inoiki said. Hiruzen closed his eyes and carefully though over Inoiki's proposition from a number of angles so as to not miss any kind of political or mental impact something like this might have if it became known to the general public. Finally after 10 minutes of contemplation he opened his eyes and called out, Taka. Ananbu with a hawk mask dropped down from his hiding place and asked, Hi, Hokage-sama? Please go to Naruto's home and inform him I'd like to see him in my office, he may bring Asahi and Yui if he wishes, he ordered. The Anbu shun shined off to do as ordered. Does that mean you approve Hokage-sama? Inoiki asked. Hiruzen nodded in response and replied, Yes and we may as well start as soon as possible. When Naruto and family arrived a few minutes later and was retold everything they had discussed he understood their reasons and accepted the new training. Two months later, Academy. Naruto and his friends were sitting at their spot under the tree eating lunch and happily chatting about various subjects like training, gardening, games, and food. The training with Inoiki had seriously helped Naruto open up. He was still rather stoic and reserved most of the time but no longer tried to hide and suppress his emotions, much, when he felt them. He also found himself proud of the academy as while it had very little to teach him personally it did an excellent job teaching the other students what they needed to know. The first week of the academy had been different from the rest as it was spent reviewing to both help and check the retention of returning students while making sure transfers like Naruto were at the right level for the class. After that was entirely different. For the first hour of academy we warmed up, stretched, and did demanding, for the limits of our age, physical exercises and or ran obstacle courses. After that we practiced shuriken, kunai, and senbo and throwing for another hour to cool down. Then we either practiced or spartan taijutsu for two hours. After that we enter the academy and learn about chakra control and either ninjutsu or genjutsu, mostly how to recognize and break out of one, but also some on how to cast them as well for an hour. We would then take a half hour lunch break. After that was biology, anatomy, and a very basic lecture on seduction and assassination, just to get students used to the idea of it. For an hour or a short half hour each lecture on mathematics and politics switching between each option every day. Then there was a two hour lecture on either history of all the elemental nations and their shinobi specialties and tactics as well as stuff about the bijou, stealth, advanced tactics, and trap making, tracking, capture and interrogation, poisons, field medicine, and treatment, geography and surviving in the wild with nothing or with supplies, or a split between basic few and jutsu, which included stuff about Jin Shuriki and medical jutsu for an hour each depending on the day. All in all an eight and a half hour class day every day except Sunday. Naruto heard that the civilians had tried to have the academy changed to make the academy easier, for their children, to graduate, but got rejected, thank god, he'd also heard from an academy student a year above him named Tenten he'd made acquaintances with that next year they'd have finished with history and instead made the anatomy, biology, act lessons daily for the hour and put the mathematics and politics lectures as hour each lectures in place of history. She also mentioned that every year till graduation, at 12 or 13 depending on birthdays, 
the physical part would become more demanding despite not becoming longer. All in all while boring for him it was satisfying to know that no matter what team he got when he graduated he wouldn't have incompetent teammates that would get everyone killed for some reason or another because of bad training. Or at least most of them wouldn't. All of the girls in the class except Hinata were complete fangirls of the Uchiha and because of that all of them with the exception of Ino, who couldn't afford to make her clan look bad did the bare minimum or close to it of the physical requirements needed to pass. They were all in the bottom of the class and the only reason they weren't all tied for dead last was because of their varying academic levels and the fact that a couple actually tried slightly in the physicals to make up for academics. Speaking of fangirls, for some reason or another Eno approached them. They fell silent and stared at the Sasuke fangirl, waiting for her to make her reasons for being there clear. For a short while all that sounded was the chirping of birds and the other kids' noises while Eno looked over each person individually before letting loose a small snort. I honestly don't get how all of you are in the middle of the class or at the bottom of the top. I mean we have a lazy ass who thinks everything is troublesome and sleeps through everything he can, a fat ass that only cares and thinks about food, a shy little wallflower too cowardly to spar, a dumbass that thinks he and his dog is all that, a creepy silent guy obsessed with bugs, and another silent guy that's probably mental. A group of people like you should be at the bottom of the class. Not my friends, Eno said in contempt. And you're an annoying fangirl of Sasuke that only does well in class to look good and doesn't care about being a kunoichi at all. Kiba snapped back in anger before adding, and there's a difference between fear and kindness that a Yamanaka like you should be able to see so you should be grateful he not is too kind to whoop your ass like you deserve Eno. Eno flushed red with rage at the insults to not only Sasuke but her motivation as a kunoichi and her skills as a Yamanaka. She opened her mouth to yell what would most likely be scathing insults but was interrupted by Naruto before she could. You shouldn't get so mad when you're the one who started this little insult feast Yamanaka-san. The scathing way he said San clearly showing how much respect he truly has for the girl before asking, what did you mean by most likely mental? Ino calmed down from her near tirade at the distraction before the question actually registered in her brain and she started sneering before saying, of course you must be metal seeing as how you're seeking special counseling with my own father every week and have been for months. Naruto's friends were shocked, he'd never mentioned this to them before. Naruto on the other hand now had a dark look in his eyes, something Ino easily noticed and pounced upon by saying, see what I mean, bring it up and your true colors automatically show, wonder how messed up you must be to need counseling from the best counselor in Konoha weekly you freak. At that Naruto's eyes went from dark to cold enough to make ice shiver. The emotions he was unconsciously radiating causing the humans to freeze and the dogs to growl at the human who caused their pack mate to feel said emotions. Naruto stared at her for a few minutes before saying in a cold voice that could make glaciers jealous, Yamanaka, no one missed the lack of honorific, though honestly enough with how frozen they felt they didn't think they'd be missing a single thing he said. You do realize that you just released confidential client information and broken patient therapist confidentiality laws so I can now demand recompense from you correct? And before you say your status as a minor protects you please remember that academy students a shinobi in training while safe from the most harsh of laws, are still considered adults in the eyes of the law otherwise and are tried as such after their second year at the academy which we're in our third. Eno went dead white as the others silently went over their politics lessons only to realize he was right, the only things they were tried as minors for after their second year at the academy was murder and rape, meant as a means to protect civilians from unruly academy students that might want to try out new jutsus and lessons on them, like using the hench no jutsu to get away with stealing. Eno opened her mouth to say something however Naruto wasn't done yet and added, also as a clan head, despite the fact I have a guardian acting for me until I reach 16 or Jonin. To a near extinct clan the Hokage and Shinobi Council has gone to great lengths to convince to settle here in Konoha I also have a right to demand recompense from your clan as well since it was their slight in not training you well enough and in letting you know this confidential information in the first place. Ino somehow went even paler and Naruto could literally feel the fear coming off her in waves. He knew that she realized that if he did this he'd not only be putting a bad light on her clan and her especially but also that since the Yamanaka tended to specialize in helping Shinobi and Kunoichi and counseling that they'd never be trusted to hold said confidentiality with them and not only would they have pissed off ninjas on their hands but also a significant drop in important clan funds due to loss of clientele and political power due to lack of trust. The others were silent, all of them were clan heirs, even Kiba, who should have simply been the son of the clan head became heir when Hana gave up the title in order to remain a vet. They knew that what Ino did and the situation she'd gotten herself into because of it was dead serious. They could not interfere with such serious matters without very good reason, only act as witnesses. Choji and Shikamaru, as former friends of hers before she became a fangirl felt a small twinge of sympathy for her, 
but realized she'd done this to herself and deserved whatever she got because of it. Naruto kept his now dead serious gaze trained on her, studying both her body language and emotions before releasing a small, barely existent sigh and asking, have you told anyone else, don't lie as trust me when I say I'll know and I won't be pleased. Ino frantically shook her head no before, too scared to think straight, telling him, I'd plan to after this but no not yet. Quite frankly she was damn glad she hadn't or she knew this situation would be much worse. Naruto could tell she wasn't lying about any of it through his sensory abilities, not that he thought she would with how terrified she was, but better safe than sorry. After confirming the truth of her words he gave a firm nod and decided to do something he's been wanting to since first discovering the fangirl problem but hadn't found a way to do yet and better with one than none at all. Alright Eno I believe there's a way we can get through this without going beyond this group, Eno sagged in relief before stiffening again when Naruto continued, however, you must swear on your honor as a clan heiress that you will not only listen to but think about what I'm going to say, do you understand? He got another frantic nod of confirmation from the girl before continuing. First and foremost if I ever hear of you breaking confidentiality of any kind again I will be reporting both cases, we are Shinobi and Kunoichi in training and by now we should at least be able to know how and when to keep secrets of importance. Next, I want you to formally apologize to each of my friends individually for your disparaging comments, they were not only unnecessary and cruel, but also petty. They are where they are because they put effort into being where they are while those friends of yours only do the bare minimum to stay in the academy so they can continue to try and get in the Uchiha's pants. Ino opened up her mouth most likely in protest to his comments about her friends but a stern look from him caused to shut said mouth with a click. Seeing her significantly cowed once more he continued, I told you that you must think about what I say as well and you and I both know even someone with half a brain would see the truth in my statement. They'd also see you would be doing the same damn thing if it wasn't for the fact that you have your clan's honor and reputation to consider. This time rather than trying to protest Hino simply slumped in defeat while the others stared at Naruto for cursing for the first time ever in front of them, they knew he was frustrated with the fangirl situation but they didn't realize how much until now. Naruto took a breath before sighing and continuing, I admit I am seeking counseling with your father. I went through some traumatic things in my life before my family adopted me and I therefore adopted them into my clan in Inoiki, being the one to do the standardized mind scan for new entrees and clans to make sure we harbored no ill will towards Konoha, offered to give me counseling to help me with my traumas before they became future larger problems because I'd never had any counseling before most likely as an attempt to start an alliance between our clans since we have things that could benefit the Yamanaka clan just like they do for the Uzumakis. At least I can say I took advice when given and listened to it unlike you every time your parents scold you for your infatuation with the Uchiha, or should I say the Uchiha's looks and prestige since he shows the personality of a brick wall. I never knew a clan as in-depth with their own emotions and minds could be so petty until I saw you panting after the Uchiha like a bitch in heat before we even hit puberty just because he's hot, dark, and mysterious sneering the last part to show how he felt about that fact. Realizing he was letting his emotions control him rather than the other way around Naruto started some simple breathing exercises to not only calm down but also let Ino process everything he'd just said. He'd followed her emotions through his little tirade and had felt shock at his admittance to being counseled, guilt at the reason why, shock again and then deep worry when she realized her father was most likely trying for an alliance with his clan and that she might mess that up and then settled on a mixture of shame and indignation at the last parts. The part about an alliance was true too, Inoiki had gone to Naruto's house once and after seeing the extremely rare and even considered extinct plants there he had first asked how, a combination of special seals and a green thumb most Uzumakis seemed to have, and had then promptly offered an alliance both politically and trade-wise between their clans. The Yamanaka didn't run a flower shop just for some extra money, while counseling and D&I were the most well-known traits of the Yamanaka clan, they were also one of two foremost creators and caretakers of medicinal plants working side by side with the Nara clan to make the best medicines and remedies in all of fire country. They were also the sole producers of plant-related poisons and antitoxins in Konoha, Onko and a specialized group of breeders not of a clan being the ones for animal-related. The man hadn't even budged when Naruto told him he was keeping the extinct ones solely in the clan, especially the poisonous ones. He'd left his full trust in Yui, as acting clan head to hash out all the details with the clan head after telling her what not to offer to him. After giving both them and their listeners a few minutes he continued, I understand the fact that we are young and still learning about things like non-family and friend-related love but that doesn't excuse your demeaning of yourself with your actions both towards the Uchiha and towards your fellow classmates and eventual comrades. If you continue this mentality that all a Kunoichi has to do is look pretty and act the damsel in distress you will get yourself and any Kunoichi with you raped and killed with the shinobi either dead or forced to watch before being tortured for information. A dead, horrified silence greeted his words, 
He knew they were harsh but he also knew they were true and better they realized through words than through consequences, this was the life they were signing up for after all. He continued without regret, as for your actions towards your fellow classmates while I can personally say I trust none of those here to do something like this I warn you now not everyone will be as tolerant and forgiving of your attitude towards others. There will always be the occasional rotten one who is willing to make accidents happen on missions, or ambushes where they conveniently couldn't get to you in time. They will be punished, if they're caught but that won't bring you back now will it? There's a saying I honestly can't remember where I got it from that fits this situation perfectly be careful what you think, for your thoughts become your words. Be careful what you say, for your words become your actions. Be careful what you do, for your actions become your habits. Be careful what becomes habitual, for your habits become your life. Right now it is words, then it will be habit, then it will be you, and then you'll be dead. And I honestly can't remember what to reference that quote from, but please don't copyright me for it. If you know please tell and I'll give credit where it's due. If the silence before was dead then the silence this time was suffocating as now everyone, even Naruto's two Anbu guards, was contemplating his words. Then the bell signifying the end to lunch rang making everyone but Naruto jump slightly. He stood up, dusted himself off, and walked off with one last parting comment, remember your vayamanaka san for I certainly will. Ino formally apologized to each person for her words after class that day. October 10th, Naruto's house. 10th B day. Naruto was up in his room listening with a mixture of amusement, happiness, and exasperation as all his friends, some of their parents, Iruka sensei, whom he'd formed a surprisingly close bond with due to the many times he stayed after class, at first to ask questions about lessons that led to interesting discussions, then to simply discuss things, and then finally to talking about anything and everything and going out to lunch together at times, and his family, which now included all of his other sensei, even Kurunai as honorary older siblings, bumbled about setting up the house for the most awesome and heartfelt birthday party ever, their words, not mine. They'd initially thought to throw a surprise party for him but by then he'd told all of them of his emotion sensing ability, he'd long since trained in it enough to become able to sense all emotions instinctually in a 6 foot radius, he could stretch that by a lot but that would drive him mad to do it all the time, and therefore removed the negative from the front, so they promptly threw that out the window and told him to sit and wait so they can at least surprise him this way which he did without complaint. He couldn't help but lean back in his seat and remember all that had happened in his life since coming here to Konoha. Meeting so many new people, the council's reactions to him, the general populace's reactions to him, his first day at the academy, making his now dear friends, meeting his godfather, his sessions with Inoiki that led to a clan alliance with the Yamanaka and, through them, the Nara and Akimichi that led to a serious increase in knowledge in medicine, poisons, tactics, and, unsurprisingly, a major trade in various recipes and tricks in cooking. The scolding of Ino, which unfortunately didn't affect any of the other fangirls but helped Ino if not get over her crush then at least focus on herself first, though they'd likely never be more than comrades due to that confrontation, getting close enough to his friends to tell them some of his more secret skills and abilities, like bloodlines though he's considering telling them more soon. Getting closer to his various sensei and godfather, when he was in town. Improving in his emotional training enough that Inoiki says that they'll be starting Mindscape work soon. He'd even completed a special order for Tsume and the rest of the Inuzuka clan a couple months ago. When he was held captive by the snake he'd managed to capture a man named Samazukiki Emin, a man extremely skilled in mechanics that he used in making elaborate traps, architecture and even self-propelling puppets and dolls. He'd had the man mentor a number of his soldiers, Naruto, and even a couple of times himself and his skills. Only Naruto and two others, one of which he knows is dead from the raid on the lab and the other he doesn't know the fate of, showed any real talent in Kiki Emin, realizing he'd be killed the second he lost his use, spent every minute of free time he had writing a journal, more like a large book, with every single skill, technique and the blueprints of every idea he's ever had or built and secretly gave it to Naruto to hold and study. He was killed just two months later. Naruto had overheard Tsume complain about the dogs constantly damaging the doors by banging on them whenever they were locked out and her lack of desire to either leave the doors open at all times or have a human-sized dog door installed in each, too much of a security risk. So he had offered to build special mechanized doors that would open the bottom panel of a door only when a certain part of the door or frame was pushed set with seals to only react to set chakra signatures and make enough for the entire clan while deciding to make some for his own house as he knew his hounds would someday outgrow the dog door, and she happily accepted. Installing the doors and setting the seals to each person was actually harder and more time consuming than making them was. Thank God for Cage Bunshine. And finally his progress, or lack thereof, in all other training. 
while he was constantly and steadily improving his knowledge and skills in most things, he seemed to have hit the limits of his physical capabilities in taijutsu, kenjutsu, and general physical abilities until he hits puberty and is therefore stuck doing the same drills repeatedly to stay at that peak. And while he understood why it didn't make things any less frustrating, as for Genjutsu it was nearly as frustrating in the fact that while he had improved the ones he knew and learned some new ones he still needed the momigan to use them despite his very slowly but steadily increasing chakra control. He hated the fact that he had to use a crutch to use this area of shinobi skills but understood the fact that his highly dense chakra may very well leave him using it always and that it would be stupid of him to give up on a good tool because of his own pride. Ninjutsu he'd managed to complete one more level each with elemental training and learn at least one Nujutsu for each of his elements and bloodlines, though most were D ranks. His hounds had finally become old enough for all of him to learn Shikyaku no Jutsu, Four Legs Jutsu, and them to learn Jujin Bunshine, Beast Human Clone. We also learned the Gatsuga, Fang Passing Fang, and begin Soldier Pill training. When an Inuzuka hound is exposed to the effects of a soldier pill their fur changes colors and his were no exception. Their changes were actually rather simple and the same for each, the parts of their fur that was black and white inverted. What they hadn't expected, however, was for the soldier pill to unlock the momigan in them, though it only seemed to happen while under the effects of a soldier pill. Alright Naruto, hurry up and come down, he heard the excited voice of Kiba shout. Not wanting to waste their time and efforts Naruto headed out of his room and down the stairs at a reasonable pace towards the living they said they'd set up at, and froze at the entrance. They really outdid themselves, he couldn't help but think, and it was true too. Banners in reds, blues, greens, and oranges were draped everywhere, some saying happy b-day others blank. Presents from everyone were stacked up knee-high for an adult on the coffee table, a beautiful two-tier blue and orange icing cake, obviously Akimichi made, sat on the other table in the room with ten red candles and happy tent Naruto. Written out in black. But what was most shocking to him were the many smiling faces directed at him after having just shouted out happy birthday to him. Since he'd promised not to direct his sensory abilities towards them he hadn't realized they'd been secretly sneaking in the parents that hadn't been there before, his godfather Jiraiya, and the Hokage into their home. He was honestly so touched so many people cared about him he couldn't help but shed a few happy tears and let loose a beaming smile. With a smile still on his face he walked fully into the room and spent the rest of the celebrating his first real birthday celebrating with those precious to him. Five and a half months later, near end of summer break, Naruto's house. Naruto and his friends were spending their summer vacation in numerous ways from playing, swimming, talking, cloud watching, and simply enjoying their childhood to training. Today was one of those days that they decided to train and Naruto once again volunteered as rather impressive training grounds for it. However, with school fast approaching two of the group were less than enthusiastic about it, those two being Kiba and Shikamaru. Kiba was being vocal about it and Shika doing a form of silent protest by simply not doing anything. But why are we wasting our last couple days of freedom from that boring prison called the Academy? Kiba whined once again. Naruto frowned at his hyper friend before saying, because we need the training, and you really shouldn't insult the Academy like that because everything they're teaching is important. How? Kiba asked, disbelieving. Naruto could tell even the others had their doubts about some of the academy material, so he decided to explain. Let's use an analogy to make things simple, okay? Getting nods in return he continued with another question, you guys know at least the basics of how to build a bridge? Placing and building your foundation, choosing and buying the materials, making, mixing, and preparing your cement, and then putting them all together to build the bridge, right? He got confused nods in return before continuing. If you build a bad foundation it doesn't matter how good your bridge is it will collapse and possibly kill people. If you pick the wrong material, for example wood and salt water that will quickly corrode it, your bridge will once again fail and most likely kill people. If you mix or prepare your cement wrong the bridge will, once again, fail and most likely kill people. And finally, even if you build an amazing, sturdy, long-lasting bridge but you don't build it the way you were paid by your contractor to build it he or she will be angry and demand you build it properly without paying you any more than they already paid because it's your mistake and now you have to pay out of your own pocket to build a new one the others were silent shikamaru and shino were seeing where this was going but the others were simply confused realizing this he once again continued the foundation of the bridge is the equivalent of the math science history physical exercises and other basic stuff you find boring kiba and just like a bridge without a solid foundation you will fail and get not only yourself but others killed, it's just like how you need to learn how to take care of your hound despite it being boring to you. The materials are the knowledge about different elemental ninjutsu, genjutsu, 
taijutsu and other physical things. Without knowing when to use a move or how you will end up making mistakes like trying to use a weak fire jutsu against a strong water jutsu that could get you and others killed. Without knowing how to mix and use your cement or chakra properly again you will, once again, get others killed. And finally as ninja we will be contracted out for money and we better damn well do what those contracts tell us to do as close to the letter as possible or we lose both clients and money, which is also politics. The others all now had O looks on their faces, now understanding at least somewhat better why the academy taught what it did. With that all of them, even Shikamaru, though unenthusiastically, went back to training with just a little more fire than before while also silently promising themselves to pay at least slightly better attention in class. Another six months later, basic review of events. The next six months have passed almost uneventfully. A couple of the bigoted, blind villagers who'd somehow had the location of his house leaked to them, he suspected the elders, had the brilliant idea of forming a small mob and burning the house down. Obviously Kakashi and Yamato, in their onbu personas, quickly intercepted and imprisoned them. They were trialed and punished on charges of attempted arson on a clan head's home and the second they heard the clan head bit not even the politicos that dislike or hate him would touch their case. Asahi was making a number of friends in the ranks but was definitely closest to Naruto's other honorary siblings. He and Yui had finally stopped beating around the bush and had now been happily dating for nearly four months now. When he wasn't off on missions they'd usually be seen together with or without friends. Yui herself had also grown close to not only Naruto's new honorary siblings but also Iruka and the clan heirs he'd befriended. The group she'd been going to for tea had now made it an official and regularly growing in size club. Naruto and Iruka had grown closer still since his B-Day party and they now regularly spent time with each other simply talking about anything that came to their minds. He was considering making him an honorary sibling to him as well but knowing Erika's thoughts on favoritism thought he should hold off until he graduates. The middle six, as the academy started calling them for consistently keeping the same rank for at least a year and a half and the fact that they were always together, became even more inseparable to the point Naruto was thinking about telling them the last three secrets he was keeping from them, his father's identity, him containing Kurama, and maybe his actual relation with him rather than the lie he told the council and just how and why he has so many bloodlines and abilities. Though he suspected Shino and Shikamaru had already guessed the first two, Kimi, Jun, and Ryu had grown much bigger and had nearly caught up to Akamaru in size. He also learned that Kimi had the Hyoton, Futon, and Sudan elements, Jun had Shikatsu Myaku and Doden, and Ryu had Jintan, Futon, and Raiden elements. They were now working on using them alongside the Momagan and the usually Nuzukaninkan abilities. Naruto's own training had hit a kind of roadblock, being unable to increase his chakra reserves or physical abilities anymore until puberty had set in for a while without risking permanent damage to his body. He was sticking with practicing and improving what he already knew and also trying to master a number of his jutsu without hand signs and if possible without vocalizing them. The only things he could truly improve though were his chakra control, which is a constant uphill battle. Things that didn't take chakra and physical work like poisons, medicine, and animal care, he'd become interested enough to at least want to learn more vet skills, if not practice them, and his book learning. Everyone else had actually grown quite a bit, Hinata and Shino even seemed to have recently hit puberty, and it looked like Shoji and Kiba weren't too far behind. It made sense since most of them were now 11 and that was a pretty typical age for it. They had improved in leaps and bounds not only skill and, to a limited extent for Kiba, it's just not his cup of tea intelligence-wise, but also personality-wise. Kiba had learned the value of when to be quiet through stealth training, and pranks. He was also able to control his emotions better than any other Inuzuka with the exception of his sister due to the daily meditation Naruto made each of his friends go through for just this reason. All of them asked their parents to let them learn and work with their chakra natures after hearing Naruto both knew and trained in his and had done so for a while. Because of this he and Akamaru were beginning to become a dangerous combo due to the fact that they both added their cat and chakra natures to their teeth and claws to make them more lethal. The only elemental manipulation Kiba knew beyond that, and some of the Inuzuka clan's Yang release jutsus, were a couple E, D, and C rank cat and jutsus, and one E, D, and C rank each futon jutsu due to it being Kiba's other, though almost equally as powerful, element, that he didn't share with Akamaru which is why he's less interested in it for now. Other than that he just wasn't the type for intellectual stuff, it went too much against the Inazuka's nature to fight and act through instinct, so while he now had a more well-rounded education to keep his foundation good he didn't plan on going any further, which was fine, everyone is good at some things and bad at others. Shikamaru was still rather lazy but he'd improved somewhat as well. Mostly in taijutsu as he now had decent stamina and a good taijutsu style that focused on dodging and hitting when possible that suited his mind, skills, and stamina, 
while better it was still the second worst after Shino's. Other than that he had learned two clan jutsus other than shadow imitation called the shadow bind, which was a more complex version of imitation, and shadow neck binding, one, jutsus. He also learned he had the elements Doden and Katon with Doden being the stronger of the two, and of course the Ian release Jutsus related to the Nara. He'd learned one E and D rank for each and was satisfied with that for now. Choji had also learned a new Jutsu other than the partial multi-size and multi-size Jutsus called the Human Bullet Tank Jutsu. He'd also learned he had Doden and Sudan natures and had learned 3 E rank and 2 D and C rank Jutsu for each as well as the Akimichi Yang release Jutsu. He hadn't improved too much in Tai Jutsu because he had already been tied with Kiba for the second best there, Naruto first, but had gotten slightly faster. The regular meditation sessions had also helped keep him from snapping when someone insulted his weight, as badly, but he was otherwise the same personality-wise. Shino had also improved his stamina some but due to the way the Aburame housed their bugs he would never be good at Tai Jutsu and had therefore picked up learning how to wield a Kusargama, Chain Scythe to help him both keep his opponents away and in close combat if that doesn't work. He was becoming quite skilled with it and was currently learning how to channel both his Katan and Doden natures through it rather than learning more than one E-rank technique each since his Kikaiku meant he could use much more yet due to the chakra cost, and the Aburame clan Yang released Jutsu. He'd also learned the Mushi Bunshin no Jutsu, Insect Clone Jutsu, since that's all he could learn other than the Kikaiku no Jutsu, Parasitic Insects Jutsu. All Aburame have from birth for now until his hive and reserves become much larger. Hinata had improved and changed the most personality-wise. While still very shy, especially with new people, she no longer stuttered and had the confidence to talk back when necessary. The greatest improvement, however, was in the fact that constant convincing from all her friends, her uncle, and her cousin had finally made her realize her inability to spar properly with others was actually hurting them by making them overestimate themselves and that the no pain, no gain. Belief was true as long as it was carefully controlled and regulated. The only reason she wasn't top Kunoichi in class now was because she didn't want to change her current ranking in order to remain underestimated. She'd also learned the reason the Jukin was so hard for her was because the rigid and fierce stances were meant for one with a Doden and Katan affinity while she had her mother's Raten and Katan instead. She had the fierceness but not the rigidity and was now working with her uncle and cousin to mix the fast reflexes and fluidity of movement from both Raten and Sutton into her style. Since it was considered wrong for a Huga to learn anything else that's it though. All in all he would be proud and happy to be in a team with any of them and they most likely would since those in the middle were usually randomly paired together to make balanced teams. Years later, graduation day. Little had changed over the years. Everyone had hit puberty and grown both physically and mentally over the years. Most of them were wearing new outfits, regular pre put and clothes, with Naruto being the only exception. They had learned some new things and grown stronger but that's about it for things involving them and their families directly. They had just gone through a graduation and had, as usual, held back to get the rankings they needed for each of them to be put on a team together. The only important thing Naruto had done was the fact that he fully finished his sessions with Inoiki just two months earlier. It turns out that the physical manifestation of the dam in his mind was a dead and rotting tree hidden in the forest of his mind. Over years of careful work and training he'd managed to completely release any and all trapped emotions and memories from the tree, and while he wasn't happy to have all of them, he understood they were just as much a part of him as the rest. Kurama, after realizing he'd actually managed to not only release but also accept said emotions, admitted that if he hadn't done so those emotions would have eventually manifested as a negative, or nega for short, version of him that would feed off of Kurama's own in order to grow stronger to take control of his body and mind if he hadn't have done what he did, and that in doing what he'd done he'd actually completed an important step in fully controlling his chakra. When asked why he hadn't been warned before Kurama admitted that he honestly hadn't believed Naruto would be able to do what he did yet and didn't want him lose himself to it by trying too early. He then very reluctantly apologized for both not telling him and for underestimating his mental maturity and strength. He also warned that there was a chance Naruto would form anyway if he wasn't careful about his emotions, though, which was concerning. Shino had become more open and willing to share his emotions with them as long as they were alone. They were the only ones to truly change something big over the years. As for other people around them changing, the saying the more things change the more they stay the same definitely applies for most. Ino had taken the time to truly evaluate both her own emotions and Sasuke himself and had promptly dropped any and all infatuation for him. It had been more than early enough to change her tune and become a proper Kunoichi worthy of her title as top. Even if Hinata hadn't have held back it would have been anyone's guess on who would have won it. Her only regret now is destroying her friendship with Sakura which she had been trying to fix, keyword trying. Sakura had ended up dead last due to her pathetic physical abilities, chakra reserves, 
and her refusal to answer anything related to seduction on the written exam, trouble with tactics and trap making, and dislike of wilderness survival. The only reason she was barely able to pass was her skills in medical jutsu, poisons, and medicine, as well as her chakra control making the required basic 3 plus 1 in jutsu and genjutsu of choice each easy for her. Mizuki had been revealed as a traitor to the leaf working as a spy to Orochimaru just a couple days ago after finally getting sloppy in his acting by trying to kill Naruto for an interpreted slight. The thought that someone working for the snake had been so close still sent shivers down Naruto's spine, he'd simply thought the man hated him until he'd been interrogated. Everyone else was still the same with the exception of Asahi and Yui who were now happily engaged and soon to be married in a week's time. Sasuke was smirking and bragging to everyone how he knew he'd be rookie of the year from the start, until Shino, of all people, kindly reminded him his title was always grouped with the dead last and Kunoichi of the year which caused Sasuke to pale at the realization he'd be on a team with his most obsessed, and therefore terrifying, fangirl and another girl who made her dislike of him since he insulted her skills as a kunoichi well known. They had all received their hit aid and were told to return the day after tomorrow for team assignments and were dismissed after a reminder to get their registration photo taken tomorrow. The middle six all started heading towards Naruto's home as he told them he had important things to tell them he'd been meaning to tell for a little over a year but had always chickened out on before doing. Enough was enough though and he'd given them permission to force it out of him if he didn't tell them today. After reaching the house and settling in the living room Naruto looked at all of them and took a deep, shaky, breath. With the supportive feelings his friends and hounds pouring into him through his sensory abilities and Kurama's voice muttering in his head to get it over with Brett he managed to gather enough courage and tell them everything he was willing to share. His first nine years of life as Orochimaru's guinea pig with the exception of a few things, the way his hounds and adopted parents came into his life and a list of each bloodline he had with a basic summary of them, even if he'd already told and showed some of them to them, were the first things he shared. By the time he was done there wasn't a single dry eye in the room, even Shino was crying for the suffering he and his family went through. But what really gratified Naruto, more than their lack of negative emotions towards him for essentially being a lab rat, was he felt no pity from them. Sadness, sympathy, and a burning anger and disgust toward Orochimaru was all he got from them and it was an amazingly gratifying feeling to know he picked the right friends to bond with and trust as pack mates. The next thing he told them was the truth about the QB and being its Jinchuriki. He told them everything from the truth about the attack to the truth about QB or Kurama, as they both asked them to call him, actually being rather decent as long as he wasn't treated as a mindless beast or worse, a weapon. The others were stunned, no one, not even Shino and Shikamaru, who had managed to figure out he was a Jinchuriki, saw that one coming. Naruto also told them that while he'd long ago come to trust the Hokage with the full truth everyone else still thought they didn't get along and asked them to keep it that way. Before he told them the final thing he warned them that it was an S-rank secret that could get them killed if they revealed it and asked if any of them wanted to leave. None of them did so he told them the identities of his birth parents. Only Shino and Shikamaru weren't shocked. He was the son of two very well-known and dangerous ninja, and no one guessed despite the similarities. The fact was actually more shocking than their identities. Naruto was happy to know that his friends both accepted him and said they would treat him no differently despite what they now knew. He was also grateful they were only slightly mad at him for keeping it from them for so long but understood why it was so hard for him to tell. Next day, Hokage Tower. Hiruzen was a proud and happy man today. Another batch of Nujinan were turning in their registration forms and photos today and he saw a lot of raw talent. It was too bad most of them would go to the reserves or get shuffled into special forces like the cryptologists and non-field medics. They could only afford to let so many jonins divert from high-ranking missions to become sensei though, so it was only understandable that it would happen and those who had stuck around had been given a warning about the chance of that happening to them a month before the final exams. That all made him proud, but what also made him happy was the young boy, no, man who was standing in front of his desk waiting for a stamp of approval for his registration. One Naruto Uzumaki, the young boy who he'd found in one of Orochimaru's labs had become an excellent young man that met and exceeded all of Hiruzen's expectations as the son of legends, a Jinchuriki, and as a talented and intelligent young man in and of himself. He noticed that Naruto was starting to get uncomfortable and thus decided to look over his registration. Everything checked out but he couldn't help but once again pause in order to admire the four photos attached to the registration. Naruto looked almost exactly the same with only three differences, he was now 5 2 inches, only one inch shorter than the tallest in class, Shino, he was now wearing a hit I ate with a short black band around his neck, and he was looking at the camera with a small, but true smile. His hounds were average size for any Nuzuka's hound around graduation time. 
They'd grown rapidly for the first couple of years but seemed to have slowed to almost match a full-blooded Inuzuka hound's development, with Kimmy slightly smaller than the males. What he was admiring, though, was their new accessories. Ryu now sported an all-black bandana on his head with holes to let the ears through, the only color on it being the Konoha symbol in deep green in the center of the front with the Uzumaki symbol in deep red right next to it on the left. Hiruzen was saddened by the fact that they couldn't yet put the Namikaze symbol of a yin-yang with a sunburst on the other side. Kimi was wearing a deep red scarf around her neck with the ends on her back. The Konoha symbol was in green on the front center and the Uzumaki was on one of the ends in white. Jun had a deep green vest on with the Konoha and Uzumaki symbol both on the back and in black and deep red respectively. Finally, all three were wearing goggles over their eyes most likely to both protect them from debris and to at least partially hide the momigan. Hiruzen gave the forms his stamp of approval and let Naruto dismiss himself after telling him he was proud of how far he'd come in the last, nearly, four years. Same day, unknown location. Silted Amber's eyes were drawn up from documents by the sound of the only door in the room being knocked on. A hissing voice told whomever it was on the other side of the door to come in. In walked a tall silver-haired teenager with a ponytail and round-rimmed glasses. He adjusted said glasses once before speaking in a no-nonsense reporting tone, Our little spy has slipped up and been imprisoned, however he managed to send us all the information he gathered on both our targets and knows nothing of importance so he's fulfilled his purpose anyway. Suna has finally been worn down enough by the actions of their daimyo for their cage to have agreed to meet with you. All in all things are moving as expected with few truly problematic speed bumps along the way. If this continues we will ready by the up-and-coming Chunin exams. The amber eyes gleamed with glee and malevolence before the hissing voice once again spoke to only to say one word, excellent. Next day, Naruto's house. Naruto was just about done preparing for team assignments with only one last thing to do. Wear his clan swords so he can walk around with them with pride for the first time. While he hadn't fully mastered either clan's kenjutsu style fully he believed he was good enough to do the blade's honor and that was enough. The first blade he picked up and looked over was the Uzumaki clan sword. It was a beautiful long sword, the blade was made of chakra metal with a ripple design within it, the garden hilt were deep black and made of polished ebony, instead of a pommel it had a single, soundless, silver bell attached by a ninja wire. The sheath slash scabbard was also made of ebony but rather than being black it was a deep crimson color with pictures of spirits from folklore like Kitsune. Tanuki, Nekamata, and more carved into it in the Uzumaki clan symbol in white on both sides in the center of the locket. Along the entire blade and sheath slash scabbard were seals meant to make the blade and sheath slash scabbard as close to indestructible as possible. Its name was Inari no Ikari, Inari's Wrath, which Kurama admitted had made him laugh the first time he heard it. The hilt had special storage seals built within it made to allow someone to extend the length of the bell's chakra conductive ninja wire to up to 100 in length and hold it to the length where they wanted it until they extend slash shrink it again, and use said wire for a number of things such as turning the blade into a long-ranged weapon similar to a kusargama without the curve, the bell having seals on it to make it act like a weighted end. It's also designed to allow the sheath and sword to connect in order to make a spear for mid-range melee. Finally it has seals on both its grip and sheath that it first recognizes only one living Uzumaki at a time as its wielder. It then makes it so that anyone without Uzumaki blood that touches it without the wielder's permission is attacked with all the base elements of the current wielder, which was all five right now. Those with Uzumaki blood that touch it without permission are simply repelled by a strong force where a force field then forms and protects the sword from being touched again until the current wielder willingly channels chakra into the shield though it actually creates the force field for either instance of it being touched without permission, but even with permission it only allows itself to be touched and carried, not wielded. The Namikaze blade was a scimitar. This blade was also made of chakra steel, which made sense, it is the best and most precious metal for weapons, without the ripples. Also, instead of a normal edge a scimitar usually had it was slightly serrated in places in order to rend and tear as well as cut and at the tip was a hooked end meant to catch and gouge the garden hilt were made out of rainbow obsidian while the pommel was non-existent the sheath slash scabbard of the sword was made of black obsidian and had different depictions of each of the five elements carved into it it just like the other had seals all over it meant to make the sword as indestructible as possible its name was jensen no noroi elemental curse the hook on the end of the blade had seals on it that allowed it to grow to large sizes or shrink to non-existence depending on the user's will. The sheath slash scabbard was able to be launched like a rocket in the direction it's aimed at using seals on the top of the guard, and just like the Uzumaki sword it would only let its wielder use it. However, instead of attacking anyone else that tries to wield it the sword makes itself heavier than the weight the person is able to carry and refuses to leave its sheath slash scabbard until its wielder touches it. It also won't let anyone else carry it 
even with permission. With Inari on his back and Jinso in his sash Naruto and the hounds dashed off to the academy, eager to learn who would be on his team. Short while later, Academy. Iruka had just finished a short speech about how proud he was of them and a reminder of the dangers they faced in their chosen profession and was just about to start listing teams. Team 1 is, Team 4 is still in circulation, Team 6 is, Team 7 is Sasuke Uchiha, Ino Yamanaka, and Sakura Haruno under Kakashi Hitake. Iruka had to pause to clear the ringing in his ears from the shriek of joy Sakura let loose at this news and only barely picked up the groans of despair the other two released for their own reasons before continuing. Team 8 is Choji Akimichi, Shikamaru Nara, and Shino Aburame under Kurana Yuhi. The mention 3 nodded in appreciation of both teammates and the fact that they knew their sensei already. Iruka continued, Team 9 is still in circulation, and finally, Team 10 is Naruto Uzumaki, Kiba Inuzuka, and Hinata Hyuga under Asumas Arotobe. The 3, while happy to be on the same team, were at the same time curious to meet the man they'd heard about but not yet met because he only recently returned from his job as one of the Guardian 12 for the Daimyo. The reason he'd most likely picked Naruto and Kiba is because he was the only one in Konoha whom could properly teach them to wield futon. As for the purposes of the three teams Team 7 was obviously an interrogation and support team with a Nuchiha that could, once he activated his Sharingan, both cast Genjutsu for distractions and escape, and Taijutsu and Ninjutsu skills to allow him to act as the frontline hitter. Sakura as the medic and support, and Ino as a midrange hitter and interrogator. Team 8 was a combined heavy hitter, capture, and tracking team with Shikamaru as the strategist and mid to long range support with his clan Jutsus and elemental affinities, Shino as the tactician, there is a difference, long range support with clan Jutsus and weapon that can allow him to switch to close when necessary and medic with his skills in field medicine, and Choji as the frontline heavy hitter that can switch to all ranges thanks to his Daijutsu skills, clan Jutsus, and elemental affinities. Team 10 was a frontline protection and escort team with all three highly skilled in Taijutsu and both Naruto and Kiba capable of switching between all three ranges and support thanks to clan Jutsu and elemental affinities with Hinata as the medic, being nearly as good as Sakura in medical Jutsu and good with field medicine as well. You all have an hour to eat lunch and get to know your team if you don't already, be back in class before then so your team sensei can pick you up. Iruka was telling them before the classroom door opened and a smoking man walked in. He looked around for a second before saying, I know that it's usual for a team to get to know each other over lunch and then meet their sensei after but I'd rather we all have lunch together and get to know each other over that. So team 10 with me. The three people and four hounds followed Asuma to a restaurant Choji, and therefore they, frequented called Yaki and Iku Q, sat at a booth and ordered. Naruto and Kiba ordering for their hounds as well. Asuma sat back in the booth and looked over each person individually before saying, while we wait for out food why don't we introduce ourselves with our name, likes, dislikes, hobbies, elemental affinities if you know them, and dreams for the future. Since I know you guys know each other already I'll go first. My name is Asuma Sarutobi, I like smoking, my friends, and alcohol, I dislike people who complain about me smoking, traitors, and rapists. My hobbies are trying out new types of tobacco, spending time with friends, and training. My elemental affinities are katan and futon. My dreams are to make you a great demon to get married someday. Your turn. They looked at each other for a minute before Naruto went first, same as last time only he adds his friends and siblings to likes and a list of his affinities. Hinata went next, my name is Hinata Hyudga, my likes are flower pressing, my family, and my friends, my dislikes are bullies, the caged bird seal and traitors. My elemental affinities are Raiden and Katan. My hobbies are gardening, flower pressing, spending time with friends and family, and training. My dreams are to become an excellent clan head to my clan, remove the caged bird seal, and to get married and have many kids. Kiba finished, my name is Kiba Inuzuka, and this is Akamaru Wolf. I like running, my pack, friends, my clan, including Naruto, and Akamaru. I dislike animal abusers, traitors, cats and the pitches fangirls can reach. My affinities are Katan, Akamaru's too, and Futon. My hobbies are training, spending time with my pack and clan, and taking care of Akamaru. My dream is to become the best clan head ever and maybe someday get married. Asuma nodded to all their introductions before saying slash asking, are you all aware of the final Genon test? Getting nods in response he continued, good, then eat up, get a good night's sleep and meet me at training ground 10 at 7 o'clock tomorrow. They continued their meal with small talk before splitting up and getting ready for the next day. 1. I said that I'd only write jutsu in English if it didn't sound stupid, 
Obviously I find more stupid than not but for those that I do write in English I will bold them so you know what they are. That's the end guys if you enjoyed then make sure to leave a comment this is Chaos Shinobi signing off.